Expository Thoughts on the Gospel of Luke, a Commentary, Updated Edition, Written by J. C. Ryle, Narrated by Scython Williams. Preface This volume is a continuation of the Expository Thoughts on the Gospels, of which two volumes have been already published. The general design of the work has been so fully explained in the preface to the volume on Matthew that it seems needless to say anything further on the subject. I will only remark that I have steadily adhered to the threefold object which I proposed to myself when I first began. I have endeavoured to produce something which may meet the needs of heads of families in conducting family prayers, of district visitors in reading to the sick and unlearned, and of private students of the Bible who have neither large libraries nor much leisure. These three classes I have constantly kept in view. Their needs have been continually before my eyes. Whatever would be unsuitable to them I have diligently tried to avoid. I now send forth this volume with an earnest prayer that God may be pleased to use it for His own glory and the benefit of many souls. My chief desire in all my writings is to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ, and make Him beautiful and glorious in the eyes of men, and to promote the increase of repentance, faith, and holiness upon earth. If this shall be the result of this volume, the labor that it has cost me will be more than repaid. I have a strong conviction that we need more reverent, deep-searching study of the Scripture in the present day. Most Christians see nothing beyond the surface of the Bible when they read it. We need a more clear knowledge of Christ as a living person, a living priest, a living physician, a living friend, a living advocate at the right hand of God, and a living Saviour soon to come again. Most Christians know little of Christianity but its skeleton of doctrines. I desire never to forget these two things. If I can do anything to make Christ and the Bible more honorable in these latter days, I shall be truly thankful and content. Chapter 1 Luke 1 1 to 4 Luke's Introduction Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who, from the beginning, were eyewitnesses and servants of the Word, it seemed fitting for me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, to write it out for you in consecutive order, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the exact truth about the things you have been taught. The Gospel of Luke, which we now begin, contains many precious things which are not recorded in the other three Gospels. Such, for instance, are the histories of Zacharias and Elizabeth, the angel's announcement to Mary, and, to speak generally, the whole contents of the first two chapters. Such again are the narratives of the conversion of Zacchaeus and of the penitent thief, the walk to Emmaus, and the famous parables of the Pharisee and the tax collector the rich man and Lazarus, and the prodigal son. These are portions of Scripture for which every well-instructed Christian feels peculiarly thankful, and for these we are indebted to the Gospel of Luke. The short preface which we have now listened to is a peculiar feature of Luke's Gospel, but we shall find on examination that it is full of most useful instruction. In the first place, Luke gives us a short but valuable sketch of the nature of a gospel. He calls it an account of the things accomplished among us. It is a narrative of facts about Jesus Christ. Christianity is a religion built upon facts. Let us never lose sight of this. It came unto mankind at first in this shape. The first preachers did not go up and down the world proclaiming an elaborate artificial system of profound doctrines and deep philosophical principles. They made it their first business to tell men great plain facts. They went about telling a sin-laden world that the Son of God had come down to earth and lived for us and died for us 
and has risen again. The Gospel, at its first publication, was far more simple than many make it now. It was neither more nor less than the history of Christ. Let us aim at greater simplicity in our own personal religion. Let Christ and His person be the sun of our system, and let the main desire of our souls be to live a life of faith in Him and daily know Him better. This was Paul's Christianity. For to me to live is Christ. Philippians 1 21. In the second place, Luke draws a beautiful picture of the true position of the apostles in the early church. He calls them eye witnesses and servants of the word. There is an instructive humility in this expression. There is an utter absence of that man exalting tone which has so often crept into the church. Luke gives the apostles no flattering titles. He does not afford the slightest excuse to those who speak of them with idolatrous veneration because of their office and nearness to our Lord. He describes them as eye witnesses. They told men what they had seen with their own eyes and heard with their own ears. 1 John 1 1. He describes them as servants of the word. They were ministers of the word of the gospel. They were men who counted it their highest privilege to carry about, as messengers, the tidings of God's love to a sinful world and to tell the story of the cross. Well would it have been for the church and the world if Christian ministers had never laid claim to higher dignity and honor than the apostles claimed for themselves. It is a mournful fact that ordained men have constantly exalted themselves and their office to a most unscriptural position. It is a no less mournful fact that people have constantly encouraged this evil by a lazy acceptance of the demands of priestcraft and by contenting themselves with a mere vicarious religion. There have been faults on both sides. Let us remember this and be on our guard. In the third place, Luke describes his own qualifications for the work of writing a gospel. He says that he had investigated everything carefully from the beginning. It would be a mere waste of time to inquire from what source Luke obtained the information which he has given us in his gospel. We have no good reason for supposing that he saw our Lord work miracles or heard him teach. To say that he obtained his information from Mary or any of the apostles is mere conjecture and speculation. It is enough for us to know that Luke wrote by inspiration of God. Unquestionably, he did not neglect the ordinary means of getting knowledge. But the Holy Spirit guided him, no less than all other writers of the Bible, in his choice of matter. The Holy Spirit supplied him with thoughts, arrangement, sentences, and even words. And the result is that what Luke wrote is not to be read as the word of men, but the word of God. 1 Thessalonians 2.13 Let us carefully hold fast the great doctrine of the plenary inspiration of every word of the Bible. Let us never allow that any writer of the Old or New Testament could make even the slightest verbal mistake or error when writing as he was moved by the Holy Spirit. 2 Peter 1.21 Let it be a settled principle with us in reading the Bible that when we cannot understand a passage or reconcile it with some other passage, the fault is not in the book but in ourselves. The adoption of this principle will place our feet upon a rock. To give it up is to stand upon quicksand and to fill our minds with endless uncertainties and doubts. Finally, Luke informs us of one main object he had in view in writing his gospel. It was that Theophilus might know the exact truth about the things he had been taught. There is no encouragement here for those who place confidence in unwritten traditions and the voice of the church. Luke well knew the weakness of man's memory and the readiness with which a history alters its shape 
both by additions and alterations, when it depends only on word of mouth and report. What, therefore, does he do? He takes care to write. There is no encouragement here for those who are opposed to the spread of religious knowledge and talk of ignorance as the mother of devotion. Luke does not wish his friend to remain in doubt on any matter of his faith. He tells him that he wants him to know the exact truth about the things you have been taught. Let us close the passage with thankfulness for the Bible. Let us bless God daily that we are not left dependent on man's traditions, nor need we be led astray by ministers' mistakes. We have a written volume which is able to give us the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. 2 Timothy 3.15 Let us begin Luke's Gospel with an earnest desire to know more ourselves of the truth as it is in Jesus, and with a hearty determination to do what lies in us to spread the knowledge of that truth throughout the world. Luke 1, 5-12 History of Zacharias and Elizabeth, and a vision of Zacharias in the temple. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zacharias, of the division of Abijah, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. They were both righteous in the sight of God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and requirements of the Lord. But they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both advanced in years. Now it happened that while he was performing his priestly service before God, in the appointed order of his division, according to the custom of the priestly office, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were in prayer outside at the hour of the incense offering. And an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right of the altar of incense. Zacharias was troubled when he saw the angel, and fear gripped him. The first event recorded in Luke's Gospel is the sudden appearance of an angel to a Jewish priest named Zacharias. The angel announces to him that a son is about to be born to him by a miraculous interposition, and that his son is to be the forerunner of the long-promised Messiah. The Word of God had plainly foretold that when Messiah came, someone would go before him to prepare his way. Malachi 3, 1 The wisdom of God provided that when this forerunner appeared, he would be born into the family of a priest. We can form very little idea, at this period of the world, of the immense importance of this angel's announcement. To the mind of a pious Jew, it must have been glad tidings of great joy. It was the first communication from God to Israel since the days of Malachi. It broke the long silence of four hundred years. It told the believing Israelite that the prophetic weeks of Daniel were at length fulfilled. Daniel 9.25, that God's choicest promise was at length going to be accomplished, and that the seed was about to appear in whom all the nations of the earth would be blessed. Genesis 22.18. We must place ourselves in imagination, in the position of Zacharias, in order to give the verses before us their due weight. Let us mark for one thing in this passage the noble testimony which is born to the character of Zacharias and Elizabeth. We are told that they were both righteous in the sight of God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and requirements of the Lord. It matters little whether we interpret this righteousness as that which is imputed to all believers for their justification, or that which is wrought inwardly in believers by the operation of the Holy Spirit for their sanctification. The two sorts of righteousness are never disjoined. There are none justified who are not sanctified, and there are none sanctified who are not justified. Suffice it for us to know that Zacharias and Elizabeth had grace when grace was very rare, 
and they kept all the burdensome observances of the ceremonial law with devout conscientiousness when few Israelites cared for them except in name and form. The main thing that concerns us all is the example which this holy pair holds up to Christians. Let us all strive to serve God faithfully and live fully up to our light even as they did. Let us not forget the plain words of Scripture. The one who practices righteousness is righteous. Happy are those Christian families in which it can be reported that both husband and wife are righteous and exercise themselves to have a conscious void of offense toward God and toward men. Acts 24, 16 Let us mark for another thing in this passage the heavy trial which God was pleased to lay on Zacharias and Elizabeth. We are told that they had no child. The full force of these words can hardly be understood by a modern Christian. To an ancient Jew, they would convey the idea of a very weighty affliction. To be childless was one of the bitterest of sorrows. 1 Samuel 1.10 The grace of God exempts no one from trouble. As righteous as this holy priest and his wife were, they had a crook in their lot. Let us remember this if we serve Christ, and let us not count trials as strange things. Let us rather believe that a hand of perfect wisdom is measuring out all our portion, and that when God chastises us, it is to make us share His holiness. Hebrews 12.10 If afflictions drive us nearer to Christ, the Bible, and prayer, then they are positive blessings. We may not think so now, but we shall think so when we wake up in the eternal world. Let us mark for another thing in this passage the means by which God announced the coming birth of John the Baptist. We are told that an angel of the Lord appeared to Zacharias. The ministry of angels is undoubtedly a deep subject. Nowhere in the Bible do we find such frequent mention of them as in the period of our Lord's earthly ministry. At no time do we read of so many appearances of angels as about the time of our Lord's incarnation and entrance into the world. The meaning of this circumstance is sufficiently clear. It was meant to teach the church that the Messiah was no angel, but rather the Lord of angels, as well as of men. Angels announced his coming. Angels proclaimed his birth. Angels rejoiced at his appearing. And by so doing, they made it plain that he who came to die for sinners was not one of themselves, but one far above them, the King of kings and Lord of lords. One thing, at all events, about angels we must never forget they take a deep interest in the work of Christ and the salvation which Christ has provided. They sang high praise when the Son of God came down to make peace by His own blood between God and man. They rejoice when sinners repent and are born again to our Father in heaven. They delight to minister to those who shall be heirs of salvation. Let us strive to be like them while we are upon earth, to be of their mind and to share their joys. This is the way to be in tune for heaven. It is written of those who enter in there that they shall be like angels. Mark 12.25 Let us mark, lastly, in this passage, the effect which the appearance of an angel produced on the mind of Zacharias. We are told that he was troubled and that fear fell upon him. The experience of this righteous man here tallies exactly with that of other saints under similar circumstances. Moses at the burning bush, Daniel at the Tigris River, the women at the tomb, and John on the island of Patmos all showed similar fear to that of Zacharias. Like him, when they saw visions of things belonging to another world, they trembled and were afraid. How are we to account for this fear? To that question, there is only one answer. 
It arises from our inward sense of weakness, guilt, and corruption. The vision of an inhabitant of heaven reminds us forcibly of our own imperfection and of our natural unfitness to stand before God. If angels are so great and terrible, then what must the Lord of angels be? Let us bless God that we have a mighty mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Believing on Him, we may draw near to God with boldness and look forward to the day of judgment without fear. When the mighty angels shall go forth to gather God's elect together, the elect will have no cause to be afraid. To them the angels are fellow servants and friends. Revelation 22, 9. Let us tremble when we think of the terror of the wicked at the day of judgment. If even the righteous are troubled by a sudden vision of friendly angels, then what will the ungodly do when the angels come forth to gather them like tares for the burning? The fears of the saints are groundless and endure but for a little season. The fears of a lost, when once aroused, will prove well grounded and will endure forevermore. Luke 1 13 17. The announcement of John the Baptist's birth and description of his ministry. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your petition has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will give him the name John. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and he will drink no wine or liquor, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. It is he will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and power of Elijah, to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children, and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous, so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. We have in these verses the words of the angel who appeared to Zacharias. They are words full of deep spiritual instruction. We learn here, for one thing, that prayers are not necessarily rejected because the answer is long delayed. Zacharias, no doubt, had often prayed for the blessing of children, and, to all appearances, had prayed in vain. At his advanced time of life he had probably long ceased to mention the subject before God, and had given up all hope of being a father. Yet the very first words of the angel show plainly that the bygone prayers of Zacharias had not been forgotten. Your petition has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. We shall do well to remember this fact whenever we kneel down to pray. We must beware of hastily concluding that our supplications are useless, and especially in the matter of intercessory prayer on behalf of others. It is not for us to prescribe either the time or the manner in which our requests are to be answered. He who knows best the time for people to be born knows also the time for them to be born again. Let us rather devote ourselves to prayer, be of sober spirit for the purpose of prayer, and at all times pray and not lose heart. Delay of answer, says an old preacher, must not discourage our faith. It may be that God has long granted before we shall know of His grant. We learn in the second place that no children cause such true joy as those who have the grace of God. It was a child about to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to whose father it was said, You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. Grace is the principal portion that we should desire for our children. It is a thousand times better for them than beauty, riches, honor, rank, or high connections. Until they have grace, we never know what they may do. They may make us weary of our life and bring down our gray hairs with sorrow to the grave. When they are converted, and not until then, they are provided for, both for time and eternity. A wise son makes a father glad. 
Proverbs 10, 1. Whatever we seek for our sons and daughters, let us first seek that they may have a place in the covenant and a name in the book of life. We learn in the third place the nature of true greatness. The angel describes it when he tells Zacharias that his son will be great in the sight of the Lord. The measure of greatness which is common among men is utterly false and deceptive. Princes and potentates, conquerors and leaders of armies, statesmen and philosophers, artists and authors. These are the kinds of men whom the world calls great. Such greatness is not recognized among the angels of God. Those who do great things for God, they are reckoned great. Those who do little for God, they are reckoned little. They measure and value every man according to the position in which he is likely to stand at the last day and through eternity. Let us not be ashamed to make God's angels our example in this matter. Let us seek for ourselves and our children that true greatness which will be owned and recognized in the eternal world. It is a greatness which is within the reach of all, the poor as well as the rich, the servant as well as the master. It doesn't depend on power or patronage, nor on money or friends. It is the free gift of God to all who seek it at the Lord Jesus Christ's hands. It is the portion of all who hear Christ's voice and follow Him, who fight Christ's battle and do Christ's work in the world. Such may receive little honor in this life, but their reward shall be great at the last day. We learn in the fourth place that children are never too young to receive the grace of God. Zacharias is informed that his son will be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb. There is no greater mistake than to suppose that infants, by reason of their tender age, are incapable of being operated upon by the Holy Spirit. The manner of his work upon a little child's heart is undoubtedly mysterious and incomprehensible. But so also are all his works upon the sons of men. Let us beware of limiting God's power and compassion. He is a merciful God. With Him nothing is impossible. Let us remember these things, especially in the training of young children. We should always deal with them as responsible to God. We should never allow ourselves to suppose that they are too young to have any religion. Of course, we must be reasonable in our expectations. We mustn't look for evidences of grace unsuitable to their age and capacities. But we must never forget that the heart which is not too young to sin is also not too young to be filled with the grace of God. We learn in the last place from these verses the character of a really great and successful minister of God. The picture is set before us in a striking manner by the angel's description of John the Baptist. He is one who will turn hearts, turn them from ignorance to knowledge, from carelessness to thoughtfulness, from sin to God. He is one who will go before the Lord. He will delight in nothing so much as being the messenger and herald of Jesus Christ. He is one who will make ready a people prepared for the Lord. He will strive to gather out of the world a company of believers who will be ready to meet the Lord in the day of His appearing. For such ministers, let us pray night and day. They are the true pillars of a church, the true salt of the earth, the true light of the world. Happy is that church, and happy is that nation which has many such men. Without such men, learning, titles, financial endowments, and splendid buildings will keep no church alive. Souls will not be saved, good will not be done, and Christ will not be glorified, except by men full of the Holy Spirit. Luke 1, 18-25 Unbelief of Zacharias and Consequent Punishment
Zacharias said to the angel, How will I know this for certain? For I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. The angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you shall be silent and unable to speak until the day when these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their proper time. The people were waiting for Zacharias, and were wondering at his delay in the temple. But when he came out, he was unable to speak to them. And they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple, and he kept making signs to them, and remained mute. When the days of his priestly service were ended, he went back home. After these days, Elizabeth his wife became pregnant, and she kept herself in seclusion for five months, saying, This is the way the Lord has dealt with me in the days when he looked with favor upon me to take away my disgrace among men. We see in this passage the power of unbelief in a holy man. As righteous and holy as Zacharias was, the announcement of the angel appeared unbelievable to him. He couldn't think it possible that an old man like himself could have a son. How will I know this for certain, he says, for I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. A well-instructed Jew, like Zacharias, ought not to have raised such a question. No doubt he was well acquainted with the Old Testament Scriptures. He ought to have remembered the astonishing births of Isaac and Samson and Samuel in old times. He ought to have remembered that what God has done once He can do again, and that with Him nothing is impossible. But he forgot all this. He thought of nothing but the arguments of mere human reasoning. In the same way, it often happens in religious matters, that where human reasoning begins, faith ends. Let us learn in wisdom from the fault of Zacharias. It is a fault to which God's people in every age have been sadly liable. The histories of Abraham and Isaac and Moses and Hezekiah and Jehoshaphat will all show us that a true believer may sometimes be overtaken by unbelief. Unbelief is one of the first corruptions which came into man's heart in the day of the fall when Eve believed the devil rather than God. Unbelief is one of the most deep-rooted sins by which a saint is plagued and from which he is never entirely freed until he dies. Let us pray daily, Lord, increase my faith. Let us not doubt that when God says a thing, that thing shall be fulfilled. We see furthermore in these verses the privilege and portion of God's angels. They carry messages to God's people. They enjoy God's immediate presence. The heavenly messenger who appears to Zacharias rebukes his unbelief by telling him who he is. I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. The name Gabriel would doubtless fill the mind of Zacharias with humiliation and self abasement. He would remember it was that same Gabriel who, four hundred and ninety years before, had brought to Daniel the prophecy of the seventy weeks and told him how the Messiah would be cut off. Daniel 9 26. Zacharias would doubtless contrast his own sad unbelief when peaceably ministering as a priest in God's temple with the faith of holy Daniel when dwelling as a captive in Babylon while the temple at Jerusalem was in ruins. Zacharias learned a lesson that day which he never forgot. The account which Gabriel gives of his own office should raise in our minds great searchings of heart. This mighty angel, far greater in power and intelligence than we are, counts it his highest honor to stand in God's presence and do his will. Let our aims and desires be in the same direction. Let us strive so to live that we may one day stand with boldness before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple. The way to this high and holy position is open before us. 
Christ has consecrated it for us by the offering of his own body and blood. May we endeavor to walk in it during the short time of this present life so that we may stand in our lot with God's elect angels in the endless ages of eternity. We see finally in this passage how exceedingly sinful is the sin of unbelief in the sight of God. The doubts and questionings of Zacharias brought down upon him a heavy chastisement. You shall be silent, says the angel, and unable to speak, because you did not believe my words. It was a chastisement especially suitable to the offense. The tongue that was not ready to speak the language of believing praise was struck speechless. It was a chastisement of long continuance. For nine long months at least, Zacharias was condemned to silence and was daily reminded that by unbelief he had offended God. Few sins appear to be so peculiarly provoking to God as the sin of unbelief. None certainly have called down such heavy judgments on men. It is a practical denial of God's almighty power to doubt whether he can do a thing when he undertakes to do it. It is giving the lie to God to doubt whether he means to do a thing when he has plainly promised that it shall be done. The forty years' wanderings of Israel in the wilderness should never be forgotten by professing Christians. The words of Paul are very solemn. They were not able to enter because of unbelief. Hebrews 3, 19 Let us watch and pray daily against this soul-ruining sin of unbelief. Concessions to it rob believers of their inward peace, weaken their hands in the day of battle, bring clouds over their hopes, and make their chariot wheels drive heavily. According to the degree of our faith will be our enjoyment of Christ's salvation, our patience in the day of trial, and our victory over the world. Unbelief, in short, is the true cause of a thousand spiritual diseases, and once allowed to nestle in our hearts, it will eat as a canker. If you will not believe, you surely shall not last. Isaiah 7 9. In all that respects, the pardon of our sins and the acceptance of our souls, the duties of our peculiar station, and the trials of our daily life, Let it be a settled maxim in our religion to trust every word of God implicitly and to beware of unbelief. Luke 1, 26-33 The angel's announcement to Mary that she would be the mother of our Lord. Now in the sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth. To a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph, of the descendants of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And coming in, he said to her, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was very perplexed at this statement, and kept pondering what kind of salutation this was. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, You will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great, and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. We have in these verses the announcement of the most marvelous event that ever happened in this world the incarnation and birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is a passage which we should always read with mingled wonder, love, and praise. We should notice, in the first place, the lowly and unassuming manner in which the Savior of mankind came among us. The angel who announced his coming was sent to an obscure town of Galilee called Nazareth. The woman who was honored to be our Lord's mother was evidently in a humble position of life. Both in her station and her dwelling place, 
there was an utter absence of what the world calls greatness. We need not hesitate to conclude that there was a wise providence in all this arrangement. The Almighty Council, which orders all things in heaven and earth, could just as easily have appointed Jerusalem to be the place of Mary's residence as Nazareth, or could as easily have chosen the daughter of some rich scribe to be our Lord's mother as a poor woman. But it seemed good that it should not be so. The first coming of Messiah was to be a coming in poverty and humiliation. That humiliation was to begin even from the time of his conception and birth. Let us beware of despising poverty in others and of being ashamed of it if God lays it upon us. The condition of life which Jesus voluntarily chose ought always to be regarded with holy reverence. The common tendency of the day to bow down before rich men and make an idol of money ought to be carefully resisted and discouraged. The example of our Lord is a sufficient answer to a thousand groveling maxims about wealth which pass current among men. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. 2 Corinthians 8 9. Let us admire the amazing condescension of the Son of God. The heir of all things not only took our nature upon himself, but also took it in the most humbling form in which it could have been assumed. It would have been condescension to come to earth as a king and reign. It was a miracle of mercy surpassing our comprehension to come on earth as a poor man, to be despised and suffer and die. Let his love constrain us to live not to ourselves but to Him. Let His example daily bring home to our conscience the precept of Scripture, Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Romans 12, 16. We should notice, in the second place, the high privilege of Mary. The language which the angel Gabriel addresses to her is very remarkable. He calls her favored one. He tells her, The Lord is with you. It is a well-known fact that the Roman Catholic Church pays an honor to Mary hardly inferior to that which it pays to her blessed Son. She is formally declared by the Roman Catholic Church to have been conceived without sin. She is held up to Roman Catholics as an object of worship, and prayed to as a mediator between God and man, no less powerful than Christ Himself. For all this, be it remembered, there is not the slightest warrant in Scripture. There is no warrant in the verses before us now. There is no warrant in any other part of God's Word. But while we say this, we must, in fairness, acknowledge that no woman was ever so highly honored as the mother of our Lord. It is evident that one woman only, out of the countless millions of the human race, could be the means whereby God would be revealed in the flesh, and Mary had the mighty privilege of being that one. By one woman sin and death were brought into the world at the beginning. By the childbearing of one woman life and immortality were brought to light when Christ was born. No wonder that this one woman was called favored one. One thing in connection with this subject should never be forgotten by Christians. There is a relationship to Christ within reach of us all, a relationship far nearer than that of flesh and blood, a relationship which belongs to all who repent and believe. Whoever does the will of God, says Jesus, he is my brother and sister and mother. Blessed is the womb that bore you, was the saying of a woman one day. But what was the reply? On the contrary, blessed are those who hear the word of God and observe it. Luke 11, 27-28 We should notice, finally, in these verses, the glorious account of our Lord Jesus Christ which the angel gives to Mary. 
Every part of the account is full of deep meaning and deserves close attention. Jesus will be great, says Gabriel. Of his greatness we know something already. He has brought in a great salvation. He has shown himself to be a prophet greater than Moses. He is a great high priest, and he shall be greater still when he shall be owned as the eternal king. Jesus will be called the Son of the Most High, says Gabriel. He was so before he came into the world. Equal to the Father in all things, he was from all eternity the Son of God. But he was to be known and acknowledged as such by the church. The Messiah was to be recognized and worshipped as nothing less than the true God. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, says Gabriel, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. The literal fulfillment of this part of the promise is yet to come. Israel is yet to be gathered. The Jews are yet to be restored to their own land and to look to him whom they once pierced as their king and their God. Though the accomplishment of this prediction tarries, we may confidently wait for it. It shall surely come one day and not tarry. Habakkuk 2 3. Finally, says Gabriel, his kingdom will have no end. Before his glorious kingdom, the empires of this world shall one day go down and pass away, like Nineveh and Babylon and Tyre and Carthage. They shall all come to nothing one day, and the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom. Before Jesus, every knee shall one day bow, and every tongue confess that he is Lord. His kingdom shall prove to be an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion shall never pass away. Daniel 7 14 27. The true Christian should often dwell on this glorious promise and take comfort in its contents. He has no cause to be ashamed of his master. As poor and despised as he may often be for the gospel's sake, he may feel assured that he is on the conquering side. The kingdoms of this world shall yet become the kingdoms of Christ. In a little while, he who shall come will come, and will not tarry. Hebrews 10.37. For that blessed day let us patiently wait, and watch, and pray. Now is the time for carrying the cross and for fellowship with Christ's sufferings. The day draws near when Christ shall take his great power and reign, and when all who have served him faithfully shall exchange a cross for a crown. Luke 1, 34-38 Mary's Question to the Angel and His Reply Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. And behold, even your relative Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age, and she who was called barren is now in her sixth month, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold the bond slave of the Lord, may it be done to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Let us mark in these verses the reverent and discreet manner in which the angel Gabriel speaks of the great mystery of Christ's incarnation. In reply to the question of Mary, How can this be? he uses these remarkable words The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. We shall do well to follow the example of the angel in all our reflections on this deep subject. Let us ever regard it with holy reverence and abstain from those improper and unprofitable speculations upon it in which some have unhappily indulged. It is enough for us to know that the Word became flesh, and that when the Son of God came into the world, He had a real body, so that He partook of our flesh and blood, and was born of a woman. Here we must stop. 
The manner in which all this was effected is wisely hidden from us. If we attempt to pry beyond this point, we shall only darken counsel by words without knowledge, and rush in where angels fear to tread. In a religion which really comes down from heaven, there must be mysteries. Of such mysteries in Christianity, the Incarnation is one. Let us mark in the second place the prominent place assigned to the Holy Spirit in the great mystery of the Incarnation. We find it written, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. An intelligent reader of the Bible will probably not fail to remember that the honor here given to the Spirit is in precise harmony with the teaching of Scripture in other places. In every step of the great work of man's redemption, we shall find special mention of the work of the Holy Spirit. Did Jesus die to make atonement for our sins? It is written that, through the eternal Spirit, He offered Himself without blemish to God. Hebrews 9.14 Did Jesus rise again for our justification? It is written that He was made alive in the Spirit. 1 Peter 3.18 Does Jesus supply his disciples with comfort between the time of his first and second comings? It is written that the Comforter, whom he promised to send, is the Spirit of Truth. John 14, 17. Let us take heed that we give the Holy Spirit the same place in our personal religion which we find him occupying in God's Word. Let us remember that all that believers have and are and enjoy under the gospel they owe to the inward teaching of the Holy Spirit. Let us mark in the third place the mighty principle which the angel Gabriel lays down to silence all objections about the Incarnation. For nothing will be impossible with God. A hearty reception of this great principle is of immense importance to our own inward peace. Questions and doubts will often arise in men's minds about many subjects in religion. They are the natural result of our fallen estate of soul. Our faith at best is very feeble. Our knowledge at its highest is clouded with much infirmity. And among many antidotes to a doubting, anxious, and questioning state of mind, few will be found more useful than that before us now, a thorough conviction of the almighty power of God. With Him who called the world into being and formed it out of nothing, everything is possible. Nothing is too hard for the Lord. There is no sin too black and too wicked to be pardoned. The blood of Christ cleanses from all sin. There is no heart too hard and wicked to be changed. The heart of stone can be made into a heart of flesh. There is no work too hard for a believer to do. We can do all things through Christ strengthening us. There is no trial too hard to be borne. The grace of God is sufficient for us. There is no promise too great to be fulfilled. Christ's words never pass away, and what He has promised He is able to perform. There is no difficulty too great for a believer to overcome. If God is for us, then who can be against us? The mountain shall become a plain. Let principles like these be continually before our minds. The angel's reply is an invaluable remedy. Faith never rests so calmly and peacefully as when it lays its head on the pillow of God's omnipotence. Let us mark, in the last place, the meek and ready acquiescence of Mary to God's revealed will concerning her. She says to the angel, Behold the bond-slave of the Lord, may it be done to me according to your word. There is far more of admirable grace in this answer than at first sight appears. A moment's reflection will show us that it was no light matter to become the mother of our Lord in this unheard of and mysterious way. It brought with it, no doubt, great honor at a distant time, but it brought with it for the present 
no small danger to Mary's reputation, and no small trial to her faith. All this danger and trial Mary was willing and ready to risk. She asks no further questions. She raises no further objections. She accepts the honor laid upon her with all its attendant perils and inconveniences. Behold, she says, the bondslave of the Lord. Let us seek, in our daily practical Christianity, to exercise the same blessed spirit of faith which we see here in Mary. Let us be willing to go anywhere, and do anything, and be anything, whatever may be the present and immediate inconvenience, so long as God's will is clear and the path of duty is plain. The words of good Bishop Hall on this passage are worth remembering. All disputations with God, after His will is known, arise from infidelity. There is not a more noble proof of faith than bring all the powers of our understanding and will captive to our Creator, and without any questionings to go blindfold wherever He will lead us. Luke 1, 39-45 Mary's Visit to Elizabeth Now at this time Mary arose and went in a hurry to the hill country, to a city of Judah, and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she cried out with a loud voice, and said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And how has it happened to me? that the mother of my Lord would come to me. For behold, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leaped in my womb for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what had been spoken to her by the Lord. We should observe in this passage the benefit of fellowship and communion between believers. We read of a visit paid by Mary to her cousin Elizabeth. We are told in a striking manner how the hearts of both of these holy women were cheered and their minds lifted up by this visit. Without this visit, Elizabeth might never have been so filled with the Holy Spirit as we are here told she was, and Mary might never have uttered that song of praise which is now known all over the Church of Christ. The words of an old preacher are deep and true. Happiness communicated doubles itself. Grief grows greater by concealing. Joy grows greater by expression. We should always regard fellowship with other believers as an eminent means of grace. It is a refreshing break in our journey along the narrow way to exchange experiences with our fellow travelers. It helps us and it helps them, and so it is a mutual gain. It is the nearest approach that we can make on earth to the joy of heaven. Iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Proverbs 27, 17. We need reminding of this. The subject does not receive sufficient attention, and the souls of believers suffer in consequence. There are many who fear the Lord and think upon His name, and yet forget to speak often one to another. Malachi 3, 16. First let us seek the face of God, then let us seek the face of God's friends. If we did this more, and were more careful about the company we keep, we would more often know what it is to feel filled with the Holy Spirit. We should observe in this passage the clear spiritual knowledge which appears in the language of Elizabeth. She uses an expression about Mary which shows that she herself was deeply taught of God. She calls her the mother of my Lord. Those words, my Lord, are so familiar to our ears that we miss the fullness of their meaning. At the time they were spoken, they implied far more than we are apt to suppose. They were nothing less than a distinct declaration that the child who was to be born of Mary was the long promised Messiah, the Lord, of whom David in spirit had prophesied. The Christ of God. Viewed in this light, 
the expression is a wonderful example of faith. It is a confession worthy to be placed by the side of that of Peter when he said to Jesus, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Let us remember the deep meaning of the words, The Lord, and beware of using them lightly and carelessly. Let us consider that they rightly apply to none but Him who was crucified for our sins on Calvary. Let the recollection of this fact invest the words with a holy reverence and make us careful how we let them fall from our lips. There are two texts connected with the expression which should often come to our minds. In one it is written, No one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. In the other it is written, Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. 1 Corinthians 12, 3, Philippians 2, 11. Finally, we should observe in these verses the high praise which Elizabeth bestows upon the grace of faith. Blessed, she says, is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what had been spoken to her by the Lord. We need not wonder that this holy woman should thus commend faith. No doubt she was well acquainted with the Old Testament scriptures. She knew the great things that faith had done in the past. The whole history of God's saints in every age is but a record of men and women who obtained a good report by faith. The simple story of all of those from Abel downwards is but a narrative of redeemed sinners who believed and so were blessed. By faith they embraced promises. By faith they lived. By faith they walked. By faith they endured hardships. By faith they looked to an unseen Saviour and good things yet to come. By faith they battled with the world, the flesh, and the devil. By faith they overcame and got safely home to heaven. Of this goodly company, Mary was proving herself one. No wonder that Elizabeth said, Blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what had been spoken to her by the Lord. Do we know anything of this precious faith? This, after all, is the question which concerns us. Do we know anything of the faith of God's elect, the faith which is the working of God? Titus 1, 2, Colossians 2, 12. Let us never rest until we know it by experience. Once knowing it, let us never cease to pray that our faith may grow exceedingly. Better a thousand times to be rich in faith than rich in gold. Gold will be worthless in the eternal world to which we are all traveling. Faith will be owned in that world before God the Father and the holy angels. When the great white throne is set and the books are opened, when the dead are called from their graves and receive their final sentence, the value of saving faith will then be fully known. Men will learn then, if they never learned before, how true are the words, Blessed are those who believed. Luke 1, 46-56 Mary's Song of Praise And Mary said, My soul exalts the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Saviour, for He has had regard for the humble state of His bond-slave. For behold, from this time on all generations will count me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is His name. And His mercy is upon generation after generation toward those who fear Him. He has done mighty deeds with His arm. He has scattered those who were proud in the thoughts of their heart. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, and has exalted those who were humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, and sent away the rich empty-handed. He has given help to Israel his servant, in remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his descendants forever. And Mary stayed with her about three months, and then returned to her home.
These verses contain Mary's famous hymn of praise in the prospect of becoming the Mother of Our Lord. Next to the Lord's Prayer, perhaps, few passages of Scripture are better known than this. Wherever the Church of England's Book of Common Prayer is used, this hymn forms part of the evening service. And we need not wonder that the compilers of that book gave it so prominent a place. No words can express more aptly the praise for redeeming mercy which ought to form part of the public worship of every branch of Christ's church. Let us mark, firstly, the full acquaintance with Scripture which this hymn exhibits. We are reminded, as we read it or listen to it, of many expressions in the book of Psalms. Above all, we are reminded of the song of Hannah in 1 Samuel 2. It is evident that Mary's memory was stored with Scripture. She was familiar, whether by hearing or by reading, with the Old Testament. And so, when out of the abundance of her heart her mouth spoke, she gave vent to her feelings in scriptural language. Moved by the Holy Spirit to break forth into praise, she chooses language which the Holy Spirit had already consecrated and used. Let us strive, every year we live, to become more deeply acquainted with Scripture. Let us study it, search it, dig into it, and meditate on it until it dwells in us richly. Colossians 3.16 In particular, let us labor to make ourselves familiar with those parts of the Bible which, like the book of Psalms, describe the experiences of the saints of old. We shall find it most helpful to us in all our approaches to God. It will supply us with the best and most suitable language both for the expression of our needs and thanksgivings. Such knowledge of the Bible can doubtless never be attained without regular daily study. But the time spent on such study is never misspent. It will bear fruit after many days. Let us mark, secondly, in this hymn of praise, Mary's deep humility. She who was chosen by God for the high honor of being Messiah's mother speaks of her own humble state and acknowledges her need of a Savior. She doesn't let fall a single word to show that she regarded herself as a sinless, immaculate person. On the contrary, she uses the language of one who has been taught by the grace of God to feel her own sins, and so far from being able to save others, requires a Savior for her own soul. We may safely affirm that none would be more forward to reprove the honor paid by the Roman Catholic Church to Mary than Mary herself. Let us copy this holy humility of our Lord's Mother. Like her, let us be lowly in our own eyes and think little of ourselves. Humility is the highest grace that can adorn the Christian character. It is a true saying of an old preacher that a man has just so much Christianity as he has humility. It is the grace which of all is most suitable to human nature. Above all, it is the grace which is within the reach of every converted person. All are not rich. All are not learned. All are not highly gifted. All are not preachers. But all children of God may be clothed with humility. Let us mark, thirdly, the lively thankfulness of Mary. It stands out prominently in all the early part of her hymn. Her soul exalts the Lord. Her spirit has rejoiced in God. All generations will call her blessed. The Mighty One has done great things for her. We can scarcely enter into the full extent of feelings which a holy Jewess would experience on finding herself in Mary's position. But we should try to recollect them as we read her repeated expressions of praise. We too shall do well to walk in Mary's steps in this matter and cultivate a thankful spirit. Gratefulness has ever been a mark of God's most distinguished saints in every age. David in the Old Testament, 
and Paul in the New Testament are remarkable for their thankfulness. We seldom read much of their writings without finding them blessing and praising God. Let us rise from our beds every morning with a deep conviction that we are debtors and that every day we have more mercies than we deserve. Let us look around us every week as we travel through the world and see whether we have not much to thank God for. If our hearts are in the right place, then we shall never find any difficulty in building an Ebenezer, a monument of thanksgiving. Well would it be if our prayers and supplications were more mingled with thanksgiving. 1 Samuel 7, 12, Philippians 4, 6. Let us mark fourthly the experiential acquaintance with God's former dealings with His people which Mary possessed. She speaks of God as one whose mercy is upon generation after generation toward those who fear Him, as one who has scattered those who were proud, and has brought down rulers from their thrones, and sends away the rich empty-handed, as one who exalts those who are humble, and fills the hungry with good things. She spoke, no doubt, in recollection of Old Testament history. She remembered how Israel's God had brought down Pharaoh and the Canaanites and the Philistines and Sennacherib and Haman and Belshazzar. She remembered how he had exalted Joseph and Moses and Samuel and David and Esther and Daniel, and never allowed his chosen people to be completely destroyed. And in all God's dealings with herself, in placing honor upon a poor woman of Nazareth, and in raising up Messiah in such a dry ground as the Jewish nation seemed to have become, she traced the handiwork of Israel's covenant God. The true Christian should always give close attention to Bible history and the lives of individual saints. Let us often go forth on the trail of the flock. Song of Solomon 1 8. Such study throws light on God's mode of dealing with his people. He is of one mind. What he has done for them and to them in times past, he is likely to do now and in time to come. Such study will teach us what to expect, to check unwarrantable expectations, and encourage us when cast down. Happy is that man whose mind is well stored with such scripture knowledge. It will make him patient and hopeful. Let us mark, lastly, the firm grasp which Mary had of Bible promises. She ends her hymn of praise by declaring that God has given help to Israel his servant in remembrance of his mercy, and that he has done as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his descendants forever. These words show clearly that she remembered the old promise made to Abraham In your seed all nations of the earth shall be blessed. And it is evident that in the approaching birth of her son she regarded this promise as about to be fulfilled. Let us learn from this holy woman's example to lay firm hold on Bible promises. It is of the deepest importance to our peace to do so. Promises are, in fact, the manna that we should daily eat and the water that we should daily drink as we travel through the wilderness of this world. We do not yet see all things put in subjection under us. We do not yet see Christ and heaven and the book of life and the mansions prepared for us. We walk by faith, and this faith leans on promises. But on those promises we may lean confidently. They will bear all the weight we can lay on them. We shall find one day, like Mary, that God keeps His word, and that what He has spoken, so He will always, in due time, perform. Luke 1 57 66 The Birth of John the Baptist. Now the time had come for Elizabeth to give birth, and she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and her relatives heard that the Lord had displayed His great mercy toward her and they were rejoicing with her. And it happened that on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child, 
and they were going to call him Zacharias after his father. But his mother answered and said, No, indeed, but he shall be called John. And they said to her, There is no one among your relatives who is called by that name. And they made signs to his father as to what he wanted him called. And he asked for a tablet and wrote as follows, His name is John. And they were all astonished. And at once his mouth was opened, and his tongue loosed, and he began to speak in praise of God. Fear came on all those living around them, and all these matters were being talked about in all the hill country of Judea. All who heard them kept them in mind, saying, What then will this child turn out to be? For the hand of the Lord was certainly with him. We have in this passage the history of a birth the birth of a burning and shining light in the church, the forerunner of Christ Himself, John the Baptist. The language in which the Holy Spirit describes the event is well worthy of remark. It is written that the Lord had displayed His great mercy toward Elizabeth. There was mercy in bringing her safely through her time of trial. There was mercy in making her the mother of a living child. Happy are those family circles whose births are viewed in this light as special instances of the mercy of the Lord. We see in the conduct of Elizabeth's neighbors and relatives a striking example of the kindness we owe to one another. It is written that they were rejoicing with her. How much more happiness there would be in this evil world if conduct like that of Elizabeth's neighbors and relatives were more common. Sympathy in one another's joys and sorrows costs little, and yet is a grace of most mighty power. Like the oil on the wheels of some large engine, sympathy may seem to be a trifling and unimportant thing, yet in reality it has an immense influence on the comfort and well-working of the whole fabric of society. A kind word of encouragement or consolation is seldom forgotten. The heart that is chilled by affliction is peculiarly susceptible, and sympathy to such a heart is often more precious than gold. The servant of Christ will do well to remember this grace of sympathy. It seems to be such a small thing, and amid the din of controversy and the battle about mighty doctrines, we are sadly apt to overlook it. Yet it is one of those ornaments of the Christian character which make it beautiful in the eyes of men. Let us not forget that it is enforced upon us by a special precept. Rejoice with those who rejoice, and weep with those who weep. Romans 12, 15 The practice of sympathy seems to bring down a special blessing. The Jews who came to comfort Mary and Martha at Bethany saw the greatest miracle that Jesus ever worked. Above all, it is commended to us by the most perfect example. Our Lord was ready both to go to a marriage feast and to weep at a grave. John 2, John 11. Let us be ever ready to go and do likewise. We see in the conduct of Zacharias in this passage a striking example of the benefit of affliction. He resists the wishes of his relatives to call his newborn son after his own name. He clings firmly to the name John which the angel Gabriel had commanded him to be called. He shows that his nine months' dumbness had not been inflicted on him in vain. He is no longer faithless, but believing. He now believes every word that Gabriel had spoken to him, and every word of his message shall be obeyed. We need not doubt that the past nine months had been a most profitable time for the soul of Zacharias. He had learned probably more about his own heart and about God than he ever knew before. His conduct shows it. Correction had proved to be needful instruction. He was ashamed of his unbelief. Like Job, he could say, I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Job 42, 5. Like Hezekiah, when the Lord left him, he had found out what was in his heart. Second Chronicles 32, 31. 
Let us take heed that affliction does us good just as it did to Zacharias. We cannot escape trouble in a sin laden world. Man is born for trouble as sparks fly upward. Job 5 7. But in the time of our trouble, let us make earnest prayer that we may hear the rod and him who has appointed it, that we may learn wisdom by the rod and not harden our hearts against God. Sanctified afflictions, says an old preacher, are spiritual promotions. The sorrow that humbles us and drives us nearer to God is a blessing and a downright gain. No case is more hopeless than that of the man who, in time of affliction, turns his back on God. There is a dreadful mark set against one of the kings of Judah. In the time of his distress, this same king Ahaz became yet more unfaithful to the Lord. 2 Chronicles 28.22 We see in the early history of John the Baptist the nature of the blessing that we should desire for all young children. We read that the hand of the Lord was certainly with him. We are not told distinctly what these words mean. We are left to gather their meaning from the promise that went before John, before his birth, and the life that John lived all his days. But we need not doubt that the hand of the Lord was with John, to sanctify and renew his heart, to teach and fit him for his office, to strengthen him for all his work as the forerunner of the Lamb of God, to encourage him in all his bold denunciation of men's sins, and to comfort him in his last hours when he was beheaded in prison. We know that he was filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. We need not doubt that from his earliest years the grace of the Holy Spirit appeared in his ways. In his boyhood, as well as in his manhood, the constraining power of a mighty principle from above appeared in him. That power was the hand of the Lord. This is the portion that we ought to seek for our children. It is the best portion and the happiest portion. It is the only portion that can never be lost, and that will endure beyond the grave. It is good to have over them the hand of teachers and instructors, but it is better still to have the hand of the Lord over them. We may be thankful if they obtain the patronage of the great and the rich, but we ought to care far more for their obtaining the favor of God. The hand of the Lord is a thousand times better than the hand of Herod. The one is weak, foolish, and uncertain, caressing today and beheading tomorrow. The other is almighty, all wise, and unchangeable. Where it holds, it holds forever. Let us bless God that the Lord never changes. What he was in John the Baptist's day, he is now. What he did for the son of Zacharias, he can do for our boys and girls. But he waits to be entreated. If we would have the hand of the Lord be with our children, we must diligently seek it. Luke 1 67 to 80. Zacharias's Song. And his father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited us and accomplished redemption for his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of David his servant, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy toward our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to Abraham our father, to grant us that we, being rescued from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness, before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give to his people the knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, with which the sunrise from on high will visit us, to shine upon those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. And the child continued to grow, 
and to become strong in spirit, and he lived in the deserts until the day of his public appearance to Israel. Another hymn of praise demands our attention in these verses. We have read or listened to the thanksgiving of Mary, the mother of our Lord. Let us now read or listen to the thanksgiving of Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist. We have heard what praises the first coming of Christ drew from the virgin of the house of David. Let us now hear what praise it draws from an aged priest. We should notice, firstly, the deep thankfulness of a Jewish believer's heart in the prospect of Messiah's appearing. Praise is the first word that falls from the mouth of Zacharias as soon as his speechlessness is removed and his tongue restored. He begins with the same expression with which Paul begins several of his epistles. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. At this period of the world, we can hardly understand the depth of this godly man's feelings. We must imagine ourselves in his position. We must imagine ourselves seeing the fulfillment of the oldest promise in the Old Testament the promise of a Savior, and beholding the accomplishment of this promise brought near to our own door. We must try to realize what a dim and imperfect view men had of the gospel before Christ actually appeared, and the shadows and types passed away. Then perhaps we may have some idea of the feelings of Zacharias when he cried out, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. It may be feared that Christians have very low and inadequate conceptions of their amazing privileges in living under the full light of the gospel. We have probably a very faint idea of the comparative dimness and darkness of the Jewish dispensation. We have a very feeble notion of what a church must have been before the incarnation of Christ. Let us open our eyes to the extent of our obligations. Let us learn from the example of Zacharias to be more thankful. We should notice, secondly, in this hymn of praise, how much emphasis Zacharias lays on God's fulfillment of his promises. He declares that God has visited and accomplished redemption for his people, speaking of it in the manner of the prophets as a thing already accomplished, because it is sure to take place. He goes on to proclaim the instrument of this redemption, a horn of salvation in the house of David. And then he adds that all this is done as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy toward our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to Abraham our father. It is clear that the souls of Old Testament believers fed much on God's promises. They were obliged to walk by faith far more than we are. They knew nothing of the great facts which we know about Christ's life and death and resurrection. They looked forward to redemption as a thing hoped for but not yet seen, and their only warrant for their hope was God's covenanted word. Their faith may well put us to shame. So far from disparaging Old Testament believers, as some are disposed to do, we ought to marvel that they were as holy as they were. Let us learn to rest on promises and embrace them just as Zacharias did. Let us not doubt that every word of God about His people concerning things future shall as surely be fulfilled as every word about them has been fulfilled concerning things past. Their safety is secured by promise. The world, the flesh, and the devil shall never prevail against any believer. Their acquittal at the last day is secured by promise. They shall not come into condemnation, but shall be presented spotless before the Father's throne. Their final glory is secured by divine promise. Their Saviour shall come again the second time, just as surely as He came the first time, to gather His saints together and to give them a crown of righteousness. Let us be persuaded of these promises. 
Let us embrace them and not let them go. They will never fail us. God's word is never broken. He is not a man that he should lie. We have a seal on every promise which Zacharias never saw. We have the seal of Christ's blood to assure us that what God has promised he will surely perform. We should notice, thirdly, in this hymn, what clear views of Christ's kingdom Zacharias possessed. He speaks of being rescued from the hands of enemies, as if he had in view a temporal kingdom and a temporal deliverer from Gentile power. But he doesn't stop here. He declares that the kingdom of Messiah is a kingdom in which his people are to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him. This kingdom, he proclaimed, was drawing near. Prophets had long foretold that it would one day be set up. In the birth of his son John the Baptist, and the near approach of Christ, Zacharias saw this kingdom close at hand. The foundation of this kingdom of Messiah was laid by the preaching of the gospel. From that time, the Lord Jesus has been continually gathering out subjects from an evil world. The full completion of the kingdom is an event yet to come. The saints of the Most High shall one day have entire dominion. The little stone of the gospel kingdom shall yet fill the whole earth. But whether in its incomplete or complete state, the subjects of the kingdom are always of one character. They serve God without fear. They serve God in holiness and righteousness. Let us give all diligence to belong to this kingdom. As small as it seems now, it will be great and glorious one day. The men and women who have served God in holiness and righteousness shall one day see all things put under them. Every enemy shall be subdued, and they shall reign forever in that new heaven and earth wherein the righteousness dwells. We should notice, finally, what clear views of doctrine Zacharias enjoyed. He ends his hymn of praise by addressing his infant son, John the Baptist. He foretells that he shall go on before the Lord and give the knowledge of salvation that he is about to bring in, a salvation which is all of grace and mercy, a salvation of which the leading privileges are forgiveness of sins, light that shines, and peace. Let us end the chapter by examining what we know of these three glorious privileges. Do we know anything of pardon? Have we turned from darkness to light? Have we tasted peace with God? These, after all, are the realities of Christianity. These are the things without which church membership and sacraments save no one's soul. Let us never rest until we are experientially acquainted with them. Mercy and grace have provided them. Mercy and grace will give them to all who call on Christ's name. Let us never rest until the Spirit witnesses with our spirit that our sins are forgiven, that we have passed from darkness to light, and that we are actually walking in the narrow way, the way of peace. Chapter 2 Luke 2, 1-7 The Birth of Christ at Bethlehem Now in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David, in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. While they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, 
And she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. We have in these verses the story of a birth, the birth of the incarnate Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Every birth of a living child is a marvelous event. It brings into being a soul that will never die. But never since the world began was a birth so marvelous as the birth of Christ. In itself it was a miracle. God was revealed in the flesh. The blessings it brought into the world were unspeakable. It opened to man the door of everlasting life. In listening to these verses, let us first notice the times when Christ was born. It was in the days when Augustus, the first Roman emperor, made a decree that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. The wisdom of God appears in this simple fact. The scepter was practically departing from Judah. Genesis 49:10. The Jews were coming under the dominion and taxation of a foreign power. Strangers were beginning to rule over them. They no longer had a really independent government of their own. The due time had come for the promised Messiah to appear. Augustus decrees a census of the world, and at once Christ is born. It was a time peculiarly suitable for the introduction of Christ's gospel. The whole civilized earth was at length governed by one master. There was nothing to prevent the preacher of a new faith from going from city to city and country to country. The princes and priests of the heathen world had been weighed in the balances and found lacking. Egypt and Assyria and Babylon and Persia and Greece and Rome had all successively proved that the world through its wisdom did not come to know God. 1 Corinthians 1.21 Notwithstanding their mighty conquerors and poets and historians and architects and philosophers, the kingdoms of the world were full of dark idolatry. It was indeed due time for God to interpose from heaven and send down an almighty Savior. It was due time for Christ to be born. Let us ever rest our souls on the thought that times are in God's hand. Psalm 31 15. He knows the best season for sending help to his church and new light to the world. Let us beware of giving way to over anxiety about the course of events around us, as if we knew better than the King of Kings what time relief should come. Cease, Philip, to try to govern the world, was a frequent saying of Luther to an anxious friend. It was a saying full of wisdom. Let us notice, secondly, the place where Christ was born. It was not at Nazareth of Galilee where his mother Mary lived. The prophet Micah had foretold that the event was to take place at Bethlehem. Micah 5 2. And so it came to pass. At Bethlehem Christ was born. The overruling providence of God appears in this simple fact. He orders all things in heaven and on earth. He turns the hearts of kings wherever he will. He overruled the time when Augustus decreed the census. He directed the enforcement of the decree in such a way that Mary had to be at Bethlehem when the time came for the baby to be born. Little did the haughty Roman emperor and his officer Quirinius think that they were only instruments in the hand of God and were only carrying out the eternal purposes of the King of Kings. Little did they think that they were helping to lay the foundation of a kingdom before which the empires of this world would all go down one day and Roman idolatry pass away. The words of Isaiah upon a like occasion should be remembered, yet it does not so intend nor does it plan so in its heart. Isaiah 10, 7. The heart of a believer should take comfort in the recollection of God's providential government of the world. A true Christian should never be greatly moved or disturbed by the conduct of the rulers of the earth. 
he should see with the eye of faith a divine hand overruling all that they do to the praise and glory of God. He should regard every king and potentate, an Augustus, a Quirinius, a Darius, a Cyrus, a Sennacherib, as a creature who, with all his power, can do nothing but what God allows, nor anything which is not carrying out God's will. And when the rulers of this world set themselves against the Lord, the believer should take comfort in the words of Solomon, There are higher officials over them. Ecclesiastes 5, 8. Let us notice, lastly, the manner in which Christ was born. He was not born under the roof of his mother's house, but in a strange place. When born, he was not laid in a carefully prepared cradle. He was laid in a manger, that is, a feeding trough for the cattle, because there was no room in the inn. We see here the grace and condescension of Christ. Had he come to save mankind with royal majesty, surrounded by his father's angels, it would have been an act of undeserved mercy. Had he chosen to dwell in a palace with power and great authority, then we should have had reason enough to wonder. But to become as poor as the very poorest of mankind, and as lowly as the very lowliest, this is a love which surpasses knowledge. It is unspeakable and unsearchable. Let us never forget that through his humiliation Jesus has purchased a title to glory for us. Through his life of suffering, as well as his death, he has obtained eternal redemption for us. All through his life he was poor for our sakes, from the hour of his birth to the hour of his death. And through his poverty we are made rich. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. 2 Corinthians 8 9. Let us beware of despising the poor because of their poverty. Their condition is one which the Son of God has sanctified and honored by taking it voluntarily on Himself. God is no respecter of people. He looks at the hearts of men and not at their incomes. Let us never be ashamed of the affliction of poverty if God thinks it fit to lay it upon us. To be godless and covetous is disgraceful, but it is no disgrace to be poor. A lowly dwelling place and coarse food and a hard bed are not pleasing to flesh and blood, but they are the portion which the Lord Jesus Himself willingly accepted from the day of His entrance into the world. Wealth ruins far more souls than poverty. When the love of money begins to creep over us, then let us think of the manger at Bethlehem and of Him who was laid in it. Such thoughts may deliver us from much harm. Luke 2, 8-20 The Shepherds and the Angels In the same region there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David there has been born for you a Saviour, who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. When the angels had gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, Let us go straight to Bethlehem then, and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has made known to us. So they came in a hurry, and found their way to Mary and Joseph, and the baby as he lay in the manger. When they had seen this, they made known the statement which had been told them about this child. 
and all who heard it wondered at the things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary treasured all these things, pondering them in her heart. The shepherds went back, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen, just as had been told them. We read in these verses how the birth of the Lord Jesus was first announced to mankind. The birth of a king's son is generally made an occasion of public reveling and rejoicing. But the announcement of the birth of the Prince of Peace was made privately, at midnight, and without anything of worldly pomp and ostentation. Let us mark who they were to whom the tidings first came that Christ was born. They were shepherds abiding in the fields near Bethlehem, keeping watch over their flocks by night. To shepherds, not to priests and rulers, to shepherds, not to scribes and Pharisees, an angel appeared, proclaiming, Today in the city of David there has been born for you a Saviour, who is Christ the Lord. The saying of James should come into our mind as we listen to these words, Did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which He promised to those who love Him? James 2, 5. The lack of money bars no one from spiritual privileges. The things of God's kingdom are often hidden from the great and noble and revealed to the poor. The busy labor of the hands need not prevent a man from being favored with special communion with God. Moses was keeping sheep, Gideon was threshing wheat, and Elisha was plowing when they were each honored by direct calls and revelations from God. Let us resist the suggestion of Satan that religion is not for the working man. The weak of the world are often called before the mighty. The last are often first, and the first last. Let us mark, secondly, the language used by the angel in announcing Christ's birth to the shepherds. He said, I bring you good news of great joy which will be for all the people. We need not wonder at these words. The spiritual darkness which had covered the earth for four thousand years was about to be rolled away. The way to pardon and peace with God was about to be thrown open to all mankind. The head of Satan was about to be crushed. Liberty was about to be proclaimed to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. The mighty truth was about to be proclaimed that God could be just and yet for Christ's sake justify the ungodly. Salvation was no longer to be seen through types and figures, but openly and face to face. The knowledge of God was no longer to be confined to the Jews, but was to be offered to the whole Gentile world. The days of heathenism were numbered. The first stone of God's kingdom was about to be set up. If this was not good news, then there never were tidings that deserved the name. Let us mark thirdly who they were that first praised God when Christ was born. They were angels and not men, angels who had never sinned and needed no Savior, angels who had not fallen and required no Redeemer and no atoning blood. The first hymn to the honor of God revealed in the flesh was sung by a multitude of the heavenly host. Let us note this fact. It is full of deep spiritual lessons. It shows us what good servants the angels are. All that their heavenly master does pleases and interests them. It shows us what clear knowledge they have. They know what misery sin has brought into creation. They know the blessedness of heaven and the privilege of an open door into it. Above all, it shows us the deep love and compassion which the angels feel towards poor, lost men. They rejoice in the glorious prospect of many souls being saved and many brands plucked from the burning. Let us strive to be more like minded with the angels. 
Our spiritual ignorance and deadness appear most painfully in our inability to enter into the joy which we see them here expressing. Surely, if we hope to dwell with them forever in heaven, then we ought to share something of their feelings while we are here upon earth. Let us seek a more deep sense of the sinfulness and misery of sin, and then we shall have a more deep sense of thankfulness for redemption. Let us mark, fourthly, the hymn of praise which the heavenly host sang in the hearing of the shepherds. They said, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. These famous words are variously interpreted. Man is, by nature, so dull in spiritual things that it seems as if he cannot understand a sentence of heavenly language when he hears it. Yet a meaning may be drawn from the words which is free from any objection and is not only good sense but also excellent theology. Glory to God in the highest, the song begins. Now the highest degree of glory to God has come by the appearing of His Son Jesus Christ in the world. He, by His life and death on the cross, will glorify God's attributes justice, holiness, mercy, and wisdom, as they never were glorified before. Creation glorified God, but not so much as redemption. On earth peace, the song goes on. Now the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, has come to earth, the perfect peace between a holy God and sinful man, which Christ was to purchase with his own blood, the peace which is offered freely to all mankind, and the peace which, once admitted into the heart, makes men live at peace one with another, and will one day overspread the whole world. Among men with whom he is pleased, the song concludes. Now the time has come when God's kindness and goodwill towards guilty man is to be fully made known. His power was seen in creation. His justice was seen in the flood. But his mercy remained to be fully revealed by the appearing and atonement of Jesus Christ. Such was the message of the angel's song. Happy are those who can enter into its meaning and with their hearts subscribe to its contents. The man who hopes to dwell in heaven should have some experiential acquaintance with the language of its inhabitants. Let us mark before we leave the passage. The prompt obedience to the heavenly vision displayed by the shepherds. We see in them no doubts or questionings or hesitation. Strange and improbable as the tidings might seem, they at once act upon them. They went to Bethlehem in haste. They found everything exactly as it had been told to them. Their simple faith received a rich reward. They had the mighty privilege of being the first of all mankind, after Mary and Joseph, who saw the newborn Messiah with believing eyes. They soon returned, glorifying and praising God for what they had seen. May our spirit be like theirs. May we ever believe implicitly, act promptly, and wait for nothing when the path of duty is clear. So doing, we shall have a reward like that of the shepherds. The journey that is begun in faith will generally end in praise. Luke 2, 21-24 Christ's Presentation in the Temple And when eight days had passed, before his circumcision, his name was then called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days for their purification according to the law of Moses were completed, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord, Every firstborn male that opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to what was said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. The first point which demands our attention in this passage is the obedience which our Lord rendered, as an infant, to the Jewish law. 
We read of his being circumcised on the eighth day. It is the earliest fact which is recorded in his history. It is a mere waste of time to speculate, as some have done, about the reason why our Lord submitted to circumcision. We know that in him there is no sin, either original or actual. 1 John 3 5. His being circumcised was not meant in the least as an acknowledgement that there was any tendency to corruption in his heart. It was not a confession of inclination to evil or need of grace to mortify the deeds of his body. All this should be carefully borne in mind. Let it suffice us to remember that our Lord's circumcision was a public testimony to Israel that according to the flesh, He was a Jew, made of a Jewish woman, and born under the law. Galatians 4 4. Without it, he would not have fulfilled the law's requirements. Without it, he could not have been recognized as the son of David and the seed of Abraham. Let us remember furthermore that circumcision was absolutely necessary before our Lord could be heard as a teacher in Israel. Without it, he would have had no place in any lawful Jewish assembly and no right to any Jewish ordinance. Without it, he would have been regarded by all Jews as nothing better than an uncircumcised Gentile and an apostate from the faith of the fathers. Let our Lord's submission to an ordinance which he did not need for himself be a lesson to us in our daily life. Let us endure much rather than increase the offense of the gospel or hinder in any way the cause of God. The words of Paul deserve frequent pondering. For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all, so that I may win more. To the Jews I became as a Jew, so that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law though not being myself under the law, so that I might win those who are under the law. I have become all things to all men, so that I may by all means save some. 1 Corinthians 9, 19-20-22 The man who wrote these words walked very closely in the footsteps of his crucified Master. The second point which demands our attention in this passage is the name by which our Lord was called by God's special command. And when eight days had passed before his circumcision, his name was then called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. The word Jesus simply means Savior. It is the same word as Joshua in the Old Testament. The selection of this name is very striking and instructive. The Son of God came down from heaven to be not only the Savior, but also the King, the Lawgiver, the Prophet, the Priest, and the Judge of fallen man. Had He chosen any one of these titles, He would only have chosen that which was His own. But He passed by them all. He selects a name which speaks of mercy, grace, help, and deliverance for a lost world. It is as a deliverer and redeemer that he desires principally to be known. Let us often ask ourselves what our own hearts know of the Son of God. Is he our Jesus, our Savior? This is the question on which our salvation turns. Let it not content us to know Christ as one who wrought mighty miracles and spoke as never man spoke, or to know Him as one who is fully God and will one day judge the world. Let us see that we know Him experientially, as our Deliverer from the guilt and power of sin, and as our Redeemer from Satan's bondage. Let us strive to be able to say, This is my friend. I was dead, and He gave me life. I was a prisoner, and He set me free. Precious indeed is this name of Jesus to all true believers. It is like purified oil. Song of Solomon 1 3. The name of Jesus restores them when conscience troubled. 
It comforts them when cast down. It smooths their pillows in sickness. It supports them in the hour of death. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runs into it and is safe. Proverbs 18.10. The last point which demands our attention in this passage is the poor and humble condition of our Lord's mother, Mary. This is a fact which, at first sight, may not stand out clearly in these verses, but a reference to the twelfth chapter of Leviticus will at once make it plain. There we shall see that the offering which Mary made was specially appointed to be made by poor people. If she cannot afford a lamb, then she shall take two turtle doves or two young pigeons. Leviticus 12, 8. In short, Her offering was a public declaration that she was poor. Poverty, it's obvious, was our Lord's portion upon earth from the days of his earliest infancy. He was nursed and tended as a babe by a poor woman. He passed the first thirty years of his life on earth under the roof of a poor man. We need not doubt that he ate a poor man's food and wore a poor man's apparel and worked a poor man's work, and shared in all a poor man's troubles. Such condescension is truly marvelous. Such an example of humility surpasses man's understanding. Facts like these ought often to be laid to heart by poor people. They would help to silence murmuring and complaining, and would go far to reconcile them to their hard lot. The simple fact that Jesus was born of a poor woman and lived all his life on earth among poor people ought to silence the common argument that religion is not for the poor. Above all, it ought to encourage every poor believer in all his approaches to the throne of grace in prayer. Let him remember in all his prayers that his mighty mediator in heaven is accustomed to poverty and knows by experience the heart of a poor man. Well would it be for the world if working men could only see that Christ is the true poor man's friend. Luke 2, 25-35 Simeon, His History, Praise, and Prophecy And there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to carry out for him the custom of the law, then he took him into his arms and blessed God, and said, Now, Lord, you are releasing your bondservant to depart in peace, according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light of revelation to the Gentiles, and the glory of your people Israel. And his father and mother were amazed at the things which were being said about him. And Simeon blessed them, and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rise of many in Israel, and for a sign to be opposed and a sword will pierce even your own soul, to the end that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. We have in these verses the history of one whose name is nowhere else mentioned in the New Testament, a righteous and devout man named Simeon. We know nothing of his life before or after the time when Christ was born. We are only told that he came by the Spirit into the temple when the child Jesus was brought there by his mother, and that he took him into his arms and blessed God, in words which are now well known all over the world. We see in the case of Simeon how God has a believing people even in the worst of places and in the darkest times. Religion was at a very low ebb in Israel when Christ was born. The Old Testament teachings were spoiled by the doctrines of the Pharisees and Sadducees. The fine gold had become deplorably dim. Yet, even then, we find in the midst of Jerusalem a man 
righteous and devout, a man whom the Holy Spirit was upon. It is a cheering thought that God never leaves Himself entirely without a witness. As small as His believing church may sometimes be, the gates of hell shall never completely prevail against it. The true church may be driven into the wilderness and be a scattered little flock, but it never dies. There was a lot in Sodom, and then Obadiah in Ahab's household, and a Daniel in Babylon, and a Jeremiah in Zedekiah's court. And in the last days of a Jewish church, when its iniquity was almost full, there were godly people like Simeon even in Jerusalem. True Christians in every age should remember this and take comfort. It is a truth which they are apt to forget, and in consequence give way to despondency. I alone am left, said Elijah, and they seek my life to take it away. But what was the answer of God to him? Yet I will leave seven thousand in Israel. 1 Kings 19, 14, 18. Let us learn to be more hopeful. Let us believe that grace can live and flourish even in the most unfavorable circumstances. There are more Simeons in the world than we suppose. We see in the Song of Simeon how completely a believer can be delivered from the fear of death. Now, Lord, says old Simeon, you are releasing your bond servant to depart in peace. He speaks like one for whom the grave has lost its terrors and the world its charms. He desires to be released from the miseries of this pilgrim state of existence and to be allowed to go home. He is willing to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. He speaks as one who knows where he's going when he departs from this life and cares not how soon he goes. The change with him will be a change for the better, and he desires that his change may come soon. What is it that can enable a mortal man to use such language as this? What can deliver us from that fear of death to which so many are in bondage? What can take the sting of death away? There is but one answer to such questions. Nothing but strong faith can do it. Faith laying firm hold on an unseen Savior, faith resting on the promises of an unseen God. Faith and faith alone can enable a man to look death in the face and say, Now let your servant depart in peace. It is not enough to be weary of pain and sickness and ready to submit to anything for the sake of a hopeful change. It is not enough to feel indifferent to the world when we have no more strength to mingle in its business or enjoy its pleasures. We must have something more than this if we desire to depart in real peace. We must have faith like old Simeon's, even that faith which is the gift of God. Without such faith, we may die quietly, and there may seem to be no pains in our death. Psalm 73 4. But dying without such faith, we shall never find ourselves in heaven when we wake up in another world. We see furthermore in the Song of Simeon what clear views of Christ's work and office some Jewish believers attained even before the gospel was preached. We find this good old man speaking of Jesus as the salvation which God had prepared as a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of his people Israel. Well would it have been for the letter-learned scribes and Pharisees of Simeon's time if they had sat at his feet and listened to his word. Christ was indeed a light of revelation to the Gentiles. Without him they were sunk in gross darkness and superstition. They knew not the way of life. They worshipped the works of their own hands. Their wisest philosophers were utterly ignorant in spiritual things. Professing to be wise, they became fools. Romans 1 22. The gospel of Christ was like sunrise to Greece and Rome and the whole heathen world. 
the light which it let in on men's minds on the subject of religion was as great as the change from night to day. Christ was indeed the glory of Israel. To be a descendant of Abraham, to have the covenants, the promises, the law of Moses, the divinely ordered temple service, all these were mighty privileges, but all were as nothing compared to the mighty fact that out of Israel was born the Savior of the world. This was to be the highest honor of the Jewish nation, that the mother of Christ was a Jewish woman, and that the blood of one who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh was to make atonement for the sin of mankind. Romans 1, 3. The words of old Simeon, let us remember, will yet receive a fuller accomplishment. The light which he saw by faith as he held the child Jesus in his arms shall yet shine so brightly that all the nations of the Gentile world shall see it. The glory of that Jesus whom Israel crucified shall one day be revealed so clearly to the scattered Jews that they shall look on him whom they pierced and repent and be converted. The day shall come when the veil shall be taken from the heart of Israel, and all shall glory in the Lord. Isaiah 45, 25. For that day let us wait and watch and pray. If Christ is the light and glory of our souls, then that day cannot come too soon. We see lastly in this passage a striking account of the results which would follow when Jesus Christ and his gospel came into the world. Every word of old Simeon on this subject deserves private meditation. The whole forms a prophecy which is being daily fulfilled. Christ was to be a sign to be opposed. He was to be a mark for all the fiery darts of the wicked one. He was to be despised and forsaken of men. He and his people were to be a city set on a hill, assailed on every side and hated by all sorts of enemies. And so it proved. Men who agreed in nothing else have agreed in hating Christ. From the very first, thousands of unbelievers have been persecutors of believers. Christ was to be the occasion of the fall of many in Israel. He was to be a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to many proud and self-righteous Jews who would reject Him and perish in their sins. 1 Corinthians 1.23 And so it proved. To multitudes among them, Christ crucified was a stumbling block, and His gospel an aroma from death to death. 2 Corinthians 2.16. Christ was to be the occasion of the rise of many in Israel. He was to prove the Savior of many who at one time rejected, blasphemed, and reviled Him, but afterwards repented and believed. And so it proved. When the thousands who crucified Him repented, and Saul, who persecuted him, was converted, this was nothing less than a rising again. Christ was to be the occasion of the thoughts from many hearts being revealed. His gospel was to bring to light the real character of many people. The enmity to God of some, and the inward weariness and hunger of others, would be revealed by the preaching of the cross. It would show what men really were. And so it proved. The Acts of the Apostles, in almost every chapter, bears testimony that in this, as in every other item of his prophecy, old Simeon spoke truth. And now, what do we think of Christ? This is the question which ought to occupy our minds. What thoughts does he call forth in our hearts? This is the inquiry which ought to receive our attention. Are we for him or are we against him? Do we love him or do we neglect him? Do we stumble at his doctrine or do we find it as life from the dead? 
let us never rest until these questions are satisfactorily answered. Luke 2, 36-40 Anna the Prophetess and Her History And there was a prophetess, Anna the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, and had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, and then as a widow to the age of eighty-four. She never left the temple, serving night and day with fastings and prayers. At that very moment she came up and began giving thanks to God, and continued to speak of Him to all those who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. When they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee. To their own city of Nazareth. The child continued to grow and become strong, increasing in wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. The verses we have now listened to introduce us to a servant of God whose name is nowhere else mentioned in the New Testament. The history of Anna, like that of Simeon, is related only by Luke. The wisdom of God ordained that a woman as well as a man would testify to the fact that Messiah was born. In the mouths of two witnesses it was established that Malachi's prophecy was fulfilled, that the messenger of the covenant would suddenly come to the temple. Malachi 3, 1. Let us observe in these verses the character of a holy woman before the establishment of Christ's gospel. The facts recorded about Anna are few and simple. But we shall find them full of instruction. Anna was a woman of irreproachable character. After a married life of only seven years' duration, she had spent eighty four years alone as a widow. The trials, desolation, and temptations of such a condition were probably very great. But Anna, by grace, overcame them all. She answered to the description given by Paul. She was a widow indeed. 1 Timothy 5 5. Anna was a woman who loved God's house. She never left the temple. She regarded it as the place where God especially dwelt, and toward which every pious Jew in foreign lands, like Daniel, loved to direct his prayers. Nearer to God, nearer to God, was the desire of her heart. And she felt that she was never so near as within the walls which contained the ark, the altar, and the holy of holies. She could enter into David's words, My soul longed and even yearned for the courts of the Lord. Psalm 84, 2. Anna was a woman of great self denial. She served God night and day with fastings. She was continually crucifying the flesh. And keeping it in subjection by voluntary self denial. Being fully persuaded in her own mind that the practice was helpful to her soul, she spared no pains to keep it up. Anna was a woman of much prayer. She served God night and day with prayers. She was continually communing with him as her best friend about the things that concerned her own peace. She was never weary of pleading with him on behalf of others, and, above all, for the fulfillment of his promises concerning the Messiah. Anna was a woman who held communion with other saints. As soon as she had seen Jesus, she continued to speak of him to others whom she knew in Jerusalem and with whom she was evidently on friendly terms. There was a bond of union between her and all who enjoyed the same hope. They were servants of the same master and travellers to the same home. And Anna received a rich reward for all her diligence in God's service before she left the world. She was allowed to see him who had been so long promised and for whose coming she had so often prayed. Her faith was at last changed to sight, and her hope to certainty. The joy of this holy woman must indeed have been inexpressible and full of glory. 1 Peter 1, 8. It would be well for all Christian women to ponder the character of Anna and learn wisdom from it. 
The times, no doubt, are greatly changed. The social duties of the Christian are very different from those of the Jewish believer at Jerusalem. All are not placed by God in the condition of widows. But still, after every deduction, there remains much in Anna's history which is worthy of imitation. When we read of her consistency and holiness and prayerfulness and self denial, we cannot but wish that many daughters of the Christian church would strive to be like her. Let us observe, secondly, in these verses, the description given of saints in Jerusalem in the time when Jesus was born. They were people who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. Faith, we shall always find, is the universal character of God's elect. These men and women here described, dwelling in the midst of a wicked city, walked by faith and not by sight. They were not carried away by the flood of worldliness, formality, and self righteousness around them. They were not infected by the carnal expectations of a mere worldly Messiah in which most Jews indulged. They lived in the faith of patriarchs and prophets that the coming Redeemer would bring in holiness and righteousness, and that his principal victory would be over sin and the devil. For such a Redeemer they waited patiently. For such a victory, They earnestly longed. Let's learn a lesson from these godly people. If they, with so few helps and so many discouragements, lived such a life of faith, then how much more ought we, with a finished Bible and a full gospel, live by faith? Let us strive, like them, to walk by faith and look forward. The second advent of Christ is yet to come. The complete redemption of this earth from sin and Satan, and the curse is yet to take place. Let us declare plainly by our lives and conduct that we look and long for this second coming. We may be sure that the highest style of Christianity, even now, is to wait for redemption and to love the Lord's appearing. Romans 8 23, 2 Timothy 4 8. Let us observe, lastly, in these verses, what clear proof we have that the Lord Jesus was really and truly man as well as God. We read that when Mary and Joseph returned to their own city of Nazareth, the child continued to grow and become strong. There is, doubtless, much that is deeply mysterious in the person of the Lord Jesus. How the same person could be at once perfect God and perfect man is a point that necessarily surpasses our understanding. In what manner and measure, and in what proportion in the early part of his life, that divine knowledge which he doubtless possessed was exercised, we cannot possibly explain. It is a lofty truth. We cannot attain unto it. One thing, however, is perfectly clear and we shall do well to lay firm hold upon it. Our Lord partook of everything that belongs to man's nature, sin only excepted. As man he was born an infant. As man he grew from infancy to boyhood. As man he yearly increased in bodily strength and mental power during his passage from boyhood to full age. Of all the sinless conditions of man's body, its first feebleness, its aftergrowth, its regular progress to maturity, he was in the fullest sense a partaker. We must rest satisfied with knowing this. To pry beyond is useless. To know this clearly is of much importance. An absence of settled knowledge of it has led to many wild heresies. One comfortable, practical lesson stands out on the face of this truth which ought never to be overlooked. Our Lord is able to sympathize with man in every stage of man's existence from the cradle to the grave. He knows by experience the nature and temperament of the child, the boy, and the young man. He has stood in their place. He has occupied their position. He knows their hearts. Let us never forget this in dealing with young people about their souls. Let us tell them confidently that there is one in heaven at the right hand of God who is exactly suited to be their friend. 
He who died on the cross was once a boy himself, and feels a special interest in boys and girls as well as in grown up people. Luke 2 41 to 52. Jesus and his parents at the Passover. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he became twelve, they went up there according to custom of the feast. And as they were returning, after spending the full number of days, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. But his parents were unaware of it, but supposed him to be in the caravan, and went a day's journey. And they began looking for him among their relatives and acquaintances. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem looking for him. Then, after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. When they saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us this way? Behold, your father and I have been anxiously looking for you. And he said to them, Why is it that you were looking for me? Did you not know that I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand the statement which he had made to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth, and he continued in subjection to them. And his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. These verses should always be deeply interesting to a reader of the Bible. They record the only facts which we know about our Lord Jesus Christ during the first thirty years of his life on earth after his infancy. How many things a Christian would like to know about the events of those thirty years and the daily history of the house at Nazareth? But we need not doubt that there is wisdom in the silence of Scripture on the subject. If it had been good for us to know more, then more would have been revealed. Let us first draw from the passage a lesson for all married people. We have it in the conduct of Joseph and Mary here described. We are told that they went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. They regularly honored God's appointed ordinances, and they honored them together. The distance from Nazareth to Jerusalem was great. The journey for poor people without any means of conveyance was, doubtless, troublesome and fatiguing. To leave house and home for some two weeks was no slight expense. But God had given Israel a command, and Joseph and Mary strictly obeyed it. God had appointed an ordinance for their spiritual good, and they regularly kept it. And all that they did concerning the Passover, they did together. When they went up to the feast, they always went up side by side. So ought it to be with all Christian husbands and wives. They ought to help one another in spiritual things and to encourage one another in the service of God. Marriage unquestionably is not a sacrament, as the Roman Catholic Church vainly asserts, but marriage is a state of life which has the greatest effect on the souls of those who enter into it. It helps them upwards or downwards. It leads them nearer to heaven or nearer to hell. We all depend much on the company we keep. Our characters are insensibly molded by those with whom we pass our time. To none does this apply so much as to married people. Husbands and wives are continually doing either good or harm to one another's souls. Let all who are married or think of getting married ponder these things well. Let them take their example from the conduct of Joseph and Mary and resolve to do likewise. Let them pray together and read the Bible together and go to the house of God together and talk to one another about spiritual matters. Above all, let them beware of throwing obstacles and discouragements in one another's way about means of grace. Blessed are those husbands who say to their wives, as Elkanah did to Hannah, do what seems best to you. 1 Samuel 1 23. Happy are those wives who say to their husbands as Leah and Rachel did to Jacob, Do whatever God has said to you. Genesis 31 16. 
Let us, secondly, draw conduct from the passage as an example for all young people. We have it in the conduct of our Lord Jesus Christ when he was left by himself in Jerusalem at the age of twelve. For four days he was out of sight of Mary and Joseph. For three days they had been anxiously looking for him, not knowing what had befallen him. Who can imagine the anxiety of such a mother at losing such a child? And where did they find him at last? Not idling his time away or getting into mischief as many boys of twelve years old do, not in vain an unprofitable company. They found him in the temple of God, sitting in the midst of the Jewish teachers, listening to what they had to say and asking them questions about things he wished to be explained. So ought it to be with the younger members of Christian families. They ought to be steady and trustworthy behind the backs of their parents as well as before their faces. They ought to seek the company of the wise and prudent, and to use every opportunity of getting spiritual knowledge before the cares of life come on them, and while their memories are fresh and strong. Let Christian boys and girls ponder these things well and take example from the conduct of Jesus at the age of only twelve. Let them remember that if they are old enough to do wrong, then they are also old enough to do right, and that if they are able to read storybooks and to talk, then they are also able to read their Bibles and pray. Let them remember that they are accountable to God even while they are yet young, and that it is written that God heard the voice of the lad. Genesis 21:17 Happy indeed are those families in which the children seek the Lord early and cost their parents no tears. Happy are those parents who can say of their boys and girls when absent from them, I can trust my children that they will not willfully run into sin. Let us in the last place draw from this passage an example for all true Christians. We have it in the solemn words which our Lord addressed to his mother Mary when she said to him, Son, why have you treated us this way? Did you not know, was the reply, that I had to be in my father's house? A mild reproof was evidently implied in that reply. It was meant to remind his mother that he was no common person and had come into the world to do no common work. It was a hint that she was insensibly forgetting that he had come into the world in no ordinary way, and that she could not expect him to be ever dwelling quietly in Nazareth. It was a solemn reminder that, as God, he had a Father in heaven, and that this heavenly Father's work demanded his first attention. The expression is one that ought to sink down deeply into the hearts of all Christ's people. It should supply them with a mark at which they should aim in daily life, and a test by which they should try their habits and conduct. It should quicken them when they begin to be slothful. It should check them when they feel inclined to go back to the world. Are we about our Father's business? Are we walking in the steps of Jesus Christ? Such questions will often prove very humbling and make us ashamed of ourselves. But such questions are eminently useful to our souls. Never is a church in so healthy a condition as when its believing members aim high and strive in all things to be like Christ. Chapter 3 Luke 3 1 6 The Ministry of John the Baptist Now in the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip was tetrarch of the region of Iturea and Trachonitis, and Lysanias was tetrarch of Abilene, in the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. And he came into all the district around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet. 
the voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make ready the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Every ravine will be filled, and every mountain and hill will be brought low. The crooked will become straight, and the rough roads smooth, and all flesh will see the salvation of God. These verses describe the beginning of the gospel of Christ. It began with the preaching of John the Baptist. The Jews could never say that when Messiah came, he came without notice or preparation. He graciously sent a mighty forerunner before his face, by whose ministry the attention of the whole nation was awakened. Let us notice first in this passage the wickedness of the times when Christ's gospel was brought into the world. The opening verses of the chapter tell us the names of some who were rulers and governors in the earth when the ministry of John the Baptist began. It is a melancholy list and full of instruction. There is hardly a name in it which is not infamous for wickedness. Tiberius and Pontius Pilate and Herod and his brother and Annas and Caiaphas were men of whom we know little or nothing but evil. The earth seemed given into the hands of the wicked. Job 9.24. When such were the rulers, then what must the people have been? Such was the state of things when Christ's forerunner was commissioned to begin preaching. Such were the times when the first foundation of Christ's church was brought out and laid. We may truly say that God's ways are not our ways. Let us learn never to despair about the cause of God's truth, however black and unfavorable its prospects may appear. At the very time when things seem hopeless, God may be preparing a mighty deliverance. At the very season when Satan's kingdom seems to be triumphing, the stone cut out without hands may be on the point of crushing it to pieces. The darkest hour of the night is often that which just precedes the day. Let us beware of slackening our hands from any work of God because of the wickedness of the times or the number and power of our adversaries. He who watches the wind will not sow, and he who looks at the clouds will not reap. Ecclesiastes 11.4 Let us work on and believe that help will come from heaven when it is most needed. In the very hour when a Roman emperor and ignorant priests seemed to have everything at their feet, the Lamb of God was about to come forth from Nazareth and set up the beginnings of His kingdom. What He has done once, He can do again. In a moment, He can turn His church's midnight into the blaze of noonday. Let us notice, secondly, in this passage, the account which Luke gives of the calling of John the Baptist into the ministry. We are told that the word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias. John received a special call from God to begin preaching and baptizing. A message from heaven was sent to his heart, and under the impulse of that message he undertook his marvelous work. There is something in this account which throws great light on the office of all ministers of the gospel. It is an office which no man has a right to take up unless he has an inward call from God as well as an outward call from man. Visions and revelations from heaven, of course, we have no right to expect. Fanatical claims to special gifts of the Spirit must always be checked and discouraged. But a man must have an inward call from God before he puts his hand to the work of the ministry. The Word of God must come to him as really and truly as it came to John the Baptist before he undertakes to come to the Word. In short, he must be able to profess with a good conscience that he is inwardly moved by the Holy Spirit to take upon himself the office of a minister. The man who cannot say this when he comes forward to be ordained is committing a great sin and is running without being sent. Let it be a part of our daily prayers that our churches may have no ministers except those who are really called of God. An unconverted minister is an injury and burden to a church. How can a man speak of truths which he has never tasted? How can he testify of a Savior whom he has never seen by faith 
and never laid hold of for his own soul. The pastor after God's own heart is a man to whom the word of God has come. He runs confidently and speaks boldly because he has been sent by God. Let us notice, lastly, in this passage, the close connection between true repentance and forgiveness. We are told that John the Baptist came preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The plain meaning of this expression is that John preached the necessity of being baptized in token of repentance, and that he told his hearers that unless they repented of sin, their sins would not be forgiven. We must carefully bear in mind that no repentance can make atonement for sin. The blood of Christ and nothing else can wash away sin from man's soul. No quantity of repentance can ever justify us in the sight of God. We are accounted righteous before God only for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ by faith, and not for our own works or deservings. It is of the utmost importance to understand this clearly. The trouble that men bring upon their souls by misunderstanding this subject is more than can be expressed. But while we say all this, we must carefully remember that without repentance no soul was ever yet saved. We must know our sins, mourn over them, forsake them, and abhor them, or else we shall never enter the kingdom of heaven. There is nothing meritorious in this. It forms no part whatsoever of the price of our redemption. Our salvation is all of grace, from first to last. But the great fact still remains that saved souls are always penitent souls, and that saving faith in Christ and true repentance toward God are never found asunder. This is a mighty truth, and one that ought never to be forgotten. Do we ourselves repent? This, after all, is the question which most nearly concerns us. Have we been convinced of sin by the Holy Spirit? Have we fled to Jesus for deliverance from the wrath to come? Do we know anything of a broken and contrite heart and a thorough hatred of sin? Can we say, I repent, as well as, I believe? If not, let us not delude our minds with the idea that our sins are forgiven. It is written, Unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Luke 13, 3. Luke 3, 7-14. A Specimen of John the Baptist's Ministry. So he began saying to the crowds who were going out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruits in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham for our father. For I say to you, that from these stones God is able to raise up children to Abraham. Indeed, the axe is already laid at the root of the trees. So every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds were questioning him, saying, Then what shall we do? And he would answer, and say to them, The man who has two tunics is to share with him who has none, and he who has food is to do likewise. And some tax collectors also came to be baptized, and they said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than what you have been ordered to. Some soldiers were questioning him, saying, And what about us? What shall we do? And he said to them, Do not take money from anyone by force, or accuse anyone falsely, and be content with your wages. We have in these verses a specimen of John the Baptist's ministry. It is a portion of Scripture which should always be especially interesting to a Christian mind. The immense effect which John produced on the Jews, however temporary, is evident from many expressions in the Gospels. The remarkable testimony which our Lord bore to John as, Among those born of women there has not arisen any one greater, is well known to all Bible readers. What then was the character of John's ministry? This is the question to which the chapter before us supplies a practical answer. 
We should first mark the holy boldness with which John addresses the multitudes who came to be baptized by him. He calls them a brood of vipers. He saw the rottenness and hypocrisy of the professions which the crowd around him was making, and he uses language descriptive of their case. His head was not turned by popularity. He didn't care who was offended by his words. The spiritual disease of those before him was desperate and of long standing, and he knew that desperate diseases need strong remedies. Well would it be for the Church of Christ if it possessed more plain speaking ministers in our days like John the Baptist. A morbid dislike of strong language, an excessive fear of giving offense, and a constant flinching from directness and plain speaking are, unfortunately, too much the characteristics of the modern Christian pulpit. Uncharitable language is no doubt always to be deprecated, but there is no charity in flattering unconverted people, in abstaining from any mention of their vices, or in applying smooth names to damnable sins. There are two texts which are too much forgotten by Christian preachers. In one it is written, Woe to you when all men speak well of you. Luke 6:26. In the other it is written, Am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. Galatians 1:10. We should mark secondly how plainly John speaks to his hearers about hell and danger. He tells them that there is a wrath to come. He speaks of the axe of God's judgment, and of unfruitful trees being thrown into the fire. The subject of hell is always offensive to human nature. The minister who dwells much upon it must expect to find himself regarded as barbaric, violent, unfeeling, and narrow minded. Men love to hear pleasant words. And to be told of peace and not danger. Isaiah 30 10. But the subject of hell is one that ought not to be kept back if we desire to do good to souls. It is one that our Lord Jesus Christ brought forward frequently in his public teachings. That loving Saviour, who spoke so graciously of the way to heaven, also used the plainest language about the way to hell. Let us beware of being wise above that which is written, and more charitable than Scripture itself. Let the language of John the Baptist be deeply engraved on our hearts. Let us never be ashamed to avow our firm belief that there is a wrath to come for the impenitent, and that it is possible for a man to be lost as well as to be saved. To be silent on the subject is dreadful treachery to men's souls. It only encourages them to persevere in wickedness and fosters the devil's old delusion in their minds, You surely will not die. Genesis 3 4. That minister is surely our best friend who tells us honestly of danger and who warns us, like John the Baptist, to flee from the wrath to come. Never will a man flee until he sees that there is real cause to be afraid. Never will he seek heaven until he is convinced that he is on his way to hell. The religion in which there is no mention of hell is not the religion of John the Baptist or of our Lord Jesus and his apostles. We should mark, thirdly, how John exposes the uselessness of a repentance which is not accompanied by fruits in the life. He said to the multitude who came to be baptized, Bear fruits in keeping of repentance. He tells them that every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. This is a truth which should always occupy a prominent place in our Christianity. It can never be impressed on our minds too strongly that religious talking and profession are utterly worthless without religious doing and practice. It is vain to say with our lips that we repent if we do not at the same time repent in our lives. It is more than vain, 
it will gradually sear our consciences and harden our hearts. To say that we are sorry for our sins is mere hypocrisy, unless we show that we are really sorry for them by giving them up. Doing is the very life of repentance. Don't merely tell us what a man says in religion, tell us rather what he does. Mere talk, says Solomon, leads only to poverty. Proverbs 14, 23. We should mark, fourthly, what a blow John strikes at the common notion that connection with godly people can save our souls. Do not begin to say to yourselves, he tells the Jews, We have Abraham for our father. For I say to you that from these stones God is able to raise up children to Abraham. The stronghold that this false notion has gained on the heart of man in every part of the world is an affecting proof of our fallen and corrupt condition. Thousands have always been found in every age of the church who have believed that connection with godly men made them acceptable in the sight of God. Thousands have lived and died in the blind delusion that because they were allied to holy people by ties of blood or church membership, they might themselves hope to be saved. Let it be a settled principle with us that saving religion is a personal thing. It is a business between each man's own soul and Christ. It will profit us nothing at the last day to have belonged to the church of Luther or Calvin or Cranmer or Knox or Owen or Wesley or Whitfield. Did we have the faith of these holy men? Did we believe as they believed, and strive to live as they lived, and to follow Christ as they followed Him? These will be the only points on which our salvation will turn. It will save no man to have Abraham's blood in his veins if he did not possess Abraham's faith and do Abraham's works. We should mark, lastly, in this passage, the searching test of sincerity which John applied to the consciences of the various classes who came to be baptized by him. He bade each man who made a profession of repentance to begin by breaking off from those sins which especially beset him. The selfish multitude must show common charity to each other. The publicans must collect no more than what they have been ordered to. The soldiers must not accuse anyone falsely and be content with their wages. He did not mean that by so doing they would atone for their sins and make their peace with God, but he did mean that by so doing they would prove their repentance to be sincere. Let us leave the passage with a deep conviction of the wisdom of this mode of dealing with souls, and especially with the souls of those who are beginning to make a profession of religion. Above all, let us see here the right way to prove our own hearts. It must not content us to cry out against sins to which by natural temperament we are not inclined, while we deal gently with other sins of a different character. Let us find out our own particular corruptions. Let us know our own besetting sins. Against them let us direct our principal efforts. With these let us wage unceasing war. Let the rich break off from the rich man's sins, and the poor from the sins of the poor. Let the young man give up the sins of youth, and the old man the sins of old age. This is the first step towards proving that we are in earnest when we first begin to feel about our souls. Are we real? Are we sincere? Then let us begin by looking at home and looking within. Luke 3, 15-20 The Effect of John the Baptist's Ministry Now while the people were in a state of expectation, and all were wondering in their hearts about John, as to whether he was the Christ, John answered and said to them all, As for me, I baptize you with water, but one is coming who is mightier than I, and I am not fit to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to thoroughly clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, 
but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations he preached the gospel to the people. But when Herod the Tetrarch was reprimanded by him because of Herodias his brother's wife, and because of all the wicked things which Herod had done, Herod also added this to them all. He locked John up in prison. We learn firstly from these verses that one effect of a faithful ministry is to set men thinking. We read concerning John the Baptist's hearers that the people were in a state of expectation, and all were wondering in their hearts about John as to whether he was the Christ. The cause of true religion has gained a giant step in a parish or congregation or family when people begin to think. Thoughtlessness about spiritual things is one great feature of unconverted men. It cannot be said in many cases that they either like the gospel or dislike it, but they do not give it a place in their thoughts. They never understand. Isaiah 1 3. Let us always thank God when we see a spirit of reflection on religious subjects coming over the mind of an unconverted man. Thinking and deliberation are the high road to conversion. The truth of Christ has nothing to fear from sober examination. We invite inquiry. We desire to have its claims fully investigated. We know that its fitness to supply every need of man's heart and conscience is not appreciated in many cases simply because it is not known. Thinking, no doubt, is not faith and repentance, but it is always a hopeful symptom. When hearers of the gospel begin wondering in their hearts, then we ought to bless God and take courage. We learn secondly from these verses that a faithful minister will always exalt Christ. We read that when John saw the state of mind which his hearers were in, he told them of a coming one far mightier than himself. He refused the honor which he saw the people ready to give him and referred them to him who had the winnowing fork in his hand, the Lamb of God, the Messiah. Conduct like this will always be the characteristic of a true man of God. He will never allow anything to be credited to him or his office which belongs to his divine Master. He will say, like Paul, we do not preach ourselves but Christ Jesus as Lord. And ourselves as your bondservants for Jesus' sake. 2 Corinthians 4 5. To commend Christ dying and rising again for the ungodly, to make known Christ's love and power to save sinners, this will be the main object of his ministry. He must increase, but I must decrease, will be a ruling principle in all his preaching. He will be content that his own name is forgotten, so long as Christ crucified is exalted. Would we know whether a minister is sound in the faith and deserving of our confidence as a teacher? We have only to ask a simple question Where is Christ in his teaching? Would we know whether we ourselves are receiving benefit from the preaching we attend? Let us ask whether its effect is to magnify Christ in our esteem. A minister who is really doing us good will make us think more of Jesus every year we live. We learn thirdly from these verses the essential difference between the Lord Jesus and even the best and holiest of his ministers. We have it in the solemn words of John the Baptist I baptize you with water, but He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Man, when ordained, can administer the outward ordinances of Christianity with a prayerful hope that God will graciously bless the means which he has himself appointed. But man cannot read the hearts of those to whom he ministers. He can preach the gospel faithfully to their ears, but he cannot make them receive it into their consciences. He can apply baptismal water to their foreheads, but he cannot cleanse their inward nature. He can give the bread and wine of the Lord's Supper into their hands, but he cannot enable them to eat Christ's body and blood by faith. 
Up to a certain point he can go, but he can go no further. No ordination, however solemnly conferred, can give a man power to change the heart. Christ, the great head of the church, can alone do this by the power of the Holy Spirit. It is his peculiar office to do it, and it is an office which he has delegated to no man. May we never rest until we have tasted by experience the power of Christ's grace upon our souls. We have been baptized with water, but have we also been baptized with the Holy Spirit? Our names are in the baptismal register, but are they also in the Lamb's book of life? We are members of the visible church, but are we also members of that mystical body of which Christ alone is the head? All these are privileges which Christ alone can bestow and for which all who would be saved must make personal application to Him. Man cannot give them. They are treasures laid up in Christ's hand. From Him we must seek them by faith and prayer and believing we shall not seek in vain. We learn fourthly in these verses the change that Christ will work in His visible church at His second appearing. We read in the figurative words of His forerunner that He will thoroughly clear His threshing floor and gather the wheat into His barn, but He will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. The visible church is now a mixed body. Believers and unbelievers, holy and unholy, converted and unconverted, are now mingled in every congregation and often sit side by side. It surpasses the power of man to separate them. False profession is often so like true profession, and grace is often so weak and feeble that, in many cases, the right discernment of character is an impossibility. The wheat and the chaff will continue together until the Lord returns. But there will be a solemn separation at the last day. The unerring judgment of the King of Kings shall at length divide the wheat from the chaff, and divide them for evermore. The righteous shall be gathered into a place of happiness and safety. The wicked shall be cast down to shame and everlasting contempt. In the great sifting day, everyone shall go to his own place. May we often look forward to that day and judge ourselves that we be not judged of the Lord. May we give all diligence to make our calling and election sure, and to know that we are God's wheat. A mistake in the day that the floor is cleared will be a mistake that is irretrievable. We learn, lastly, from these verses that the reward of God's servants is often not in this world. Luke closes his account of John the Baptist's ministry by telling us of his imprisonment by Herod. The end of that imprisonment, we know from other parts of the New Testament, led to John being cruelly beheaded. All true servants of Christ must be content to wait for their wages. Their best things are yet to come. They must count it no strange thing if they meet with harsh treatment from man. The world which persecuted Christ will never hesitate to persecute Christians. Do not be surprised, brethren, if the world hates you. 1 John 3.13 But let us take comfort in the thought that the great Master has laid up in heaven for His people such things as surpass man's understanding. The blood that His saints have shed in His name will all be reckoned for one day. The tears that often flow so freely in consequence of the unkindness of the wicked will one day be wiped from all faces. And when John the Baptist and all who have suffered for the truth are at last gathered together, they will find it true that heaven makes amends for all. Luke 3, 21-38 The Baptism and Genealogy of Jesus Now when all the people were baptized, Jesus was also baptized, and while he was praying, heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came out of heaven, You are my beloved Son, in you I am well pleased. 
When he began his ministry, Jesus himself was about thirty years of age, being, as supposed, the son of Joseph, the son of Eli, the son of Mattat, the son of Levi, the son of Melchi, the son of Janai, the son of Joseph, the son of Mattathias, the son of Amos, the son of Nahum, the son of Hesli, the son of Nagai, the son of Math, the son of Mattathias, the son of Semin, the son of Josech, the son of Joda, the son of Jonan, the son of Reza, the son of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the son of Neri, the son of Melchi, the son of Adai, the son of Kozam, the son of Elmadam, the son of Ur, the son of Joshua, the son of Eliezer, the son of Jorim, the son of Matat, the son of Levi, the son of Simeon, the son of Judah, the son of Joseph, the son of Jonam, the son of Eliakim, the son of Melea, the son of Mena, the son of Matatha, the son of Nathan, the son of David, the son of Jesse, the son of Obed, the son of Boaz, the son of Salmon, the son of Nashon, the son of Aminadab, the son of Admin, the son of Ram, the son of Hezron, the son of Perez, the son of Judah, the son of Jacob, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham, the son of Terah, the son of Nahor, the son of Serug, the son of Ru, the son of Peleg, the son of Heber, the son of Shelah, the son of Canaan, the son of Arphaxad, the son of Shem, the son of Noah, the son of Lamech, the son of Methuselah, the son of Enoch, the son of Jared, the son of Mahalalil, the son of Canaan, the son of Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. We see in the passage before us the high honor the Lord Jesus has put on baptism. We find that among others who came to John the Baptist, the Savior of the world came and was baptized. An ordinance which the Son of God was pleased to use, and afterwards to appoint for the use of his whole church, ought always to be held in peculiar reverence by his people. If Christ himself was baptized, then baptism cannot be a thing of slight importance. The use of baptism would never have been imposed on the church of Christ if it had been a mere outward form, incapable of conveying any blessing. It is hardly necessary to say that errors of every sort and description abound on the subject of baptism. Some make an idol of it and exalt it far above the place assigned to it in the Bible. Some degrade it and dishonor it and seem almost to forget that it was ordained by Christ Himself. Some limit the use of it so narrowly that they will baptize none unless they are grown up and can give full proof of their conversion. Some credit the baptismal water with such magic power that they would like missionaries to go into heathen lands and baptize all people, old and young, indiscriminately, and believe that however ignorant the heathen may be, baptism must do them good. On no subject in religion, perhaps, have Christians more need to pray for a right judgment and a sound mind. Let it suffice us to hold firmly the general principle that baptism was graciously intended by our Lord to be a help to His church and a means of grace, and that, when rightly and worthily used, we may confidently look upon it for a blessing. But let us never forget that the grace of God is not tied to any sacrament, and that we may be baptized with water without being baptized with the Holy Spirit. We see, secondly, in this passage, the close connection that ought to exist between the administration of baptism and prayer. We are specially told by Luke that when our Lord was baptized, he was also praying. We need not doubt that there is a great lesson in this fact, and one that the Church of Christ has too much overlooked. We are meant to learn that the baptism which God blesses must be a baptism accompanied by prayer. The sprinkling of water is not sufficient. The use of the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is not enough. The form of the sacrament alone conveys no grace. 
There must be something else besides all this. There must be the prayer of faith. A baptism without prayer, it may be confidently asserted, is a baptism on which we have no right to expect God's blessing. Why is it that the sacrament of baptism appears to bear so little fruit? How is it that thousands are every year baptized and never give the slightest proof of having received benefit from it? The answer to these questions is short and simple. In the vast majority of baptisms, there is no prayer except the prayer of the officiating minister. Parents bring their children to the baptismal place without the slightest sense of what they are doing. Sponsors stand up and answer for the child in evident ignorance of the nature of the ordinance they are attending and as a mere matter of form. What possible reason have we for expecting such baptisms to be blessed by God? None, none at all. Such baptisms may well be barren of results. They are not true baptisms according to the mind of Christ. Let us pray that the eyes of Christians on this important subject may be opened. It is one on which there is great need of change. We see, thirdly, in these verses, all three persons of the Godhead spoken of as cooperating and acting at one time. God the Son begins the mighty work of his earthly ministry by being baptized. God the Father solemnly accredits him as the appointed mediator by a voice from heaven. God the Holy Spirit descends in bodily form like a dove upon our Lord, and by so doing declares that this is he to whom the Father gives the Spirit without measure. John 3:34. There is something deeply instructive and deeply comforting about this at this particular season of our Lord's earthly ministry. It shows us how mighty and powerful is the agency that is employed in the great business of our redemption. It is the common work of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. All three persons in the Godhead are equally concerned in the deliverance of our souls from hell. The thought should cheer us when we are disturbed and cast down. The thought should hearten and encourage us when we are weary of the conflict with the world, the flesh, and the devil. The enemies of our souls are mighty, but the friends of our souls are mightier still. The whole power of the triune Jehovah is engaged upon our side. A cord of three strands is not quickly torn apart. Ecclesiastes 4 12. We see, fourthly, in these verses, a marvelous proclamation of our Lord's office as mediator between God and man. A voice was heard from heaven at his baptism, which said, You are my beloved Son, in you I am well pleased. There is but one who could say this. It was the voice of God the Father. These solemn words no doubt contain much that is deeply mysterious. One thing, however, about them is abundantly clear. They are a divine declaration that our Lord Jesus Christ is the promised Redeemer whom God from the beginning undertook to send into the world, and that with His incarnation, sacrifice, and substitution for sinful man, God the Father is satisfied and well pleased. In Him, He regards the claim of His holy law as fully discharged. Through Him, he is willing to receive poor sinful man to mercy and to remember his sins no more. Let all true Christians rest their souls on these words and draw daily consolation from them. Our sins and shortcomings are many and great. In ourselves we can see no good thing. But if we believe in Jesus, the Father sees nothing in us that he cannot abundantly pardon. He regards us as the members of His own dear Son, and for His Son's sake He is well pleased. We see, lastly, in these verses, what a frail and dying creature is man. We read at the end of the chapter a long list of names containing the genealogy of the family in which our Lord was born, traced up through David and Abraham to Adam. How little we know of many of the seventy-six people whose names are here recorded. 
They all had their joys and sorrows, their hopes and fears, their cares and troubles, their schemes and plans, like any of us. But they have all passed away from the earth and gone to their own place. And so will it be with us. We too are passing away and shall soon be gone. Forever let us bless God that in a dying world we are able to turn to a living Savior. I am the living one, and I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. I am the resurrection and the life. Revelation 1 18, John 11 25. Let our main care be to be one with Christ and Christ with us. Joined to the Lord Jesus by faith, we shall rise again to live forevermore. The second death shall have no power over us. Because I live, says Christ, you will live also. John 14, 19. Chapter 4 Luke 4, 1 to 13. Christ's Temptation in the Wilderness. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led around by the Spirit in the wilderness for forty days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days, and when they had ended, he became hungry. And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone. And he led him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, I will give you all this domain and its glory, for it has been handed over to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you worship before me, it shall all be yours. Jesus answered him, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And he led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. And Jesus answered and said to him, It is said, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every temptation, he left him until an opportune time. The first event recorded in our Lord's history after his baptism is his temptation by the devil. From a season of honor and glory, he passed immediately to a season of conflict and suffering. First came the testimony of God the Father, You are my beloved Son. Then came the sneering suggestion of Satan, If you are the Son of God. The portion of Christ will often prove the portion of Christians. From great privilege to great trial, there will often be but a step. Let us first mark in this passage the power and unwearied malice of the devil. That old serpent who tempted Adam to sin in paradise was not afraid to assault the second Adam, the Son of God. Whether he understood that Jesus was God, revealed in the flesh, may perhaps be doubted. But that he saw in Jesus one who had come into the world to overthrow his kingdom is clear and plain. He had seen what happened at our Lord's baptism. He had heard the marvelous words from heaven. He felt that the great friend of man was come, and that his own dominion was in peril. The Redeemer had come. The prison door was about to be thrown open. The lawful captives were about to be set free. All this, we need not doubt, Satan saw, and resolved to fight for his own. The prince of this world would not give way to the prince of peace without a mighty struggle. He had overcome the first Adam in the Garden of Eden. Why shouldn't he overcome the second Adam in the wilderness? He had spoiled man once of paradise. Why shouldn't he spoil him of the kingdom of God? Let it never surprise us if we are tempted by the devil. Let us rather expect it as a matter of course if we are living members of Christ. The Master's lot will be the lot of his disciples. 
That mighty and malicious spirit who did not fear to attack Jesus himself is still going about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. That murderer and liar who vexed Job and overthrew David and Peter still lives and is not yet bound. If he cannot rob us of heaven, he will at any rate make our journey there painful. If he cannot destroy our souls, he will at least bruise our heels. Genesis 3.15. Let us beware of despising him or thinking lightly of his power. Let us rather put on the whole armor of God and cry to the strong for strength. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. James 4 7. Let us mark, secondly, our Lord Jesus Christ's ability to sympathize with those who are tempted. This is a truth that stands out prominently in this passage. Jesus has been really and literally tempted himself. It was proper that he who came to destroy the works of the devil should begin his own work with a special conflict with Satan. It was proper that the great shepherd and bishop of souls should be fitted for his earthly ministry by strong temptation as well as by the word of God and prayer. But above all, it was proper that the great high priest and advocate of sinners should be one who has had personal experience of conflict and has known what it is to be in the fire. And this was the case with Jesus. It is written that he was tempted in that which he has suffered. Hebrews 2.18. How much he suffered we cannot tell, but that his pure and spotless nature did suffer intensely we may be sure. Let all true Christians take comfort in the thought that they have a friend in heaven who can be touched with the feeling of their infirmities. Hebrews 4.15. When they pour out their hearts before the throne of grace and groan under the burdens which daily harass them, there is one making intercession for them who knows their sorrows. Let us take courage. The Lord Jesus is not a stern man. He knows what we mean when we complain of temptation, and He is both able and willing to give us help. Let us mark, thirdly, the exceeding subtlety of our great spiritual enemy, the devil. Three times we see him assaulting our Lord and trying to draw him into sin. Each assault showed the hand of a master in the art of temptation. Each assault was the work of one acquainted with every weak point in human nature by long experience. Each deserves an attentive study. Satan's first device was to persuade our Lord to distrust his Father's providential care. He comes to him when he's weak and exhausted with forty days' hunger, and suggests to him that he work a miracle in order to gratify a carnal appetite. Why should he wait any longer? Why should the Son of God sit still and starve? Why not tell this stone to become bread? Satan's second device was to persuade our Lord to grasp at worldly power by unlawful means. He takes him to the top of a mountain and shows him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. All these he promises to give him if he will but worship before him. The concession was small and the promise was large. Why not, by a little momentary act, obtain an enormous gain? Satan's last device was to persuade our Lord to an act of presumption. He takes him to a pinnacle of the temple and suggests to him that he throw himself down. By so doing, he would give public proof that he was one sent by God. In so doing, he might even depend on being kept from harm. Was there not a text of Scripture which specially applied to the Son of God in such a position? Was it not written that angels will bear him up? On each of these three temptations, it would be easy to write much. Let it be sufficient to remind ourselves that we see in them the three favorite weapons of the devil unbelief, worldliness, and presumption are three grand engines which he is ever working against the soul of man and by which he is ever enticing him to do what God forbids and run into sin. Let us remember this and be on our guard. 
The acts that Satan suggests to us to do are often in appearance trifling and unimportant, but the principle involved in each of these little acts, we may be sure, is nothing short of rebellion against God. Let us not be ignorant of Satan's devices. Let us mark, lastly, the manner in which our Lord resisted Satan's temptations. Three times we see him foiling and baffling the great enemy who assaulted him. He doesn't yield a hair's breadth to him. He doesn't give him a moment's advantage. Three times we see him using the same weapon in reply to his temptations. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Ephesians 6.17 He who was full of the Holy Spirit was yet not ashamed to make the Holy Scripture his weapon of defense and his rule of action. Let us learn from this single fact, if we learn nothing else from this wondrous history, the high authority of the Bible and the immense value of a knowledge of its contents. Let us read it, search it, pray over it, diligently, perseveringly, unweariedly. Let us strive to be so thoroughly acquainted with its pages that its texts may abide in our memories and stand ready at our right hand in the day of need. Let us be able to appeal from every perversion and false interpretation of its meaning to those thousand plain passages which are written, as it were, with a sunbeam. The Bible is indeed a sword, but we must take heed that we know it well if we would use it with effect. Luke 4, 14-22 Jesus in the Synagogue at Nazareth And Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through all the surrounding district. And he began teaching in their synagogues, and was praised by all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and, as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath, and stood up to read. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. And he opened the book and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down and the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all were speaking well of him, and wondering at the gracious words which were falling from his lips, and they were saying, Is this not Joseph's son? These verses relate events which are only recorded in the Gospel of Luke. They describe the first visit which our Lord paid, after entering his public ministry, to the city of Nazareth, where he had been brought up. Taken together with the two verses which immediately follow, they furnish a solemnly striking proof that the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God. Romans 8 7. We should observe in these verses what marked honor our Lord Jesus Christ gave to public means of grace. We are told that he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read the Scriptures. In the days when our Lord was on earth, the scribes and Pharisees were the chief teachers of the Jews. We can hardly suppose that a Jewish synagogue enjoyed much of the Spirit's presence and blessing under such teaching. Yet even then we find our Lord visiting a synagogue and reading and preaching in it. It was the place where his father's day and word were publicly recognized, and as such he thought it good to do it honor. We need not doubt that there is a practical lesson for us in this part of our Lord's conduct. He would have us know that we are not lightly to forsake any assembly of worshippers which professes to respect the name, the day, and the book of God. There may be many things in such an assembly which might be done better. There may be a deficiency of fullness, clearness, and distinctness in the doctrine preached. There may be a lack of unction and devoutness in the manner in which the worship is conducted. But so long as no positive error is taught, 
and there is no choice between worshipping with such an assembly and having no public worship at all, it befits a Christian to think much before he stays away. If there are but two or three in the congregation who meet in the name of Jesus, there is a special blessing promised. But there is no like blessing promised to him who tarries alone at home. We should observe for another thing in these verses what a striking account our Lord gave to the congregation at Nazareth of his own office and ministry. We are told that he chose a passage from the book of Isaiah in which the prophet foretold the nature of the work Messiah was to do when he came into the world. He read how it was foretold that he would preach the gospel to the poor, how he would proclaim release to the captives, give recovery of sight to the blind, and set free those who are oppressed, and how he would proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And when our Lord had read this prophecy, he told the listening crowd around him that he himself was the Messiah of whom these words were written, and that in him and in his gospel the marvelous figures of the passage were about to be fulfilled. We may well believe that there was a deep meaning in our Lord's selection of this special passage of Isaiah. He desired to impress on his Jewish hearers the true character of the Messiah whom he knew all Israel was then expecting. He well knew that they were looking for a mere temporal, earthly king who would deliver them from Roman dominion and make them once more foremost among the nations. Such expectations he would have them understand were premature and wrong. Messiah's kingdom at his first coming was to be a spiritual kingdom over hearts. His victories were not to be over worldly enemies, but over sin. His redemption was not to be from the power of Rome, but from the power of the devil and the world. It was in this way, and in no other way at present, that they must expect to see the words of Isaiah fulfilled. Let us take care that we know for ourselves in what light we ought chiefly to regard Christ. It is right and good to reverence Him as Lord. It is well to know Him as Head over all things, the Mighty Prophet, the Judge of all, the King of kings. But we mustn't rest here if we hope to be saved. We must know Jesus as the Friend of the poor in spirit, the Physician of the diseased heart, the deliverer of the soul in bondage. These are the principal offices he came on earth to fulfill. It is in this light we must learn to know him and to know him by inward experience as well as by the hearing of the ear. Without such knowledge we shall die in our sins. We should observe, finally, what an instructive example we have in these verses of the manner in which religious teaching is often heard. We are told that when our Lord had finished his sermon at Nazareth, his hearers were speaking well of him and wondering at the gracious words which were falling from his lips. They couldn't find any flaw in the exposition of Scripture they had heard. They couldn't deny the beauty of the well chosen language to which they had listened. Never has a man spoken the way this man speaks. But their hearts were utterly unmoved and unaffected. They were even full of envy and enmity against the preacher. In short, there seems to have been no good effect produced on them except a little temporary feeling of admiration. It is vain to conceal from ourselves that there are thousands of people in Christian churches in little better state of mind than our Lord's hearers at Nazareth. There are thousands who listen regularly to the preaching of the gospel and admire it while they listen. They do not dispute the truth of what they hear. They even feel a kind of intellectual pleasure in hearing a good and powerful sermon. But their religion never goes beyond this point. Their sermon hearing does not prevent them from living a life of thoughtlessness, worldliness, and sin. Let us often examine ourselves on this important point. Let us see what practical effect is produced on our hearts and lives by the preaching which we profess to like. Does it lead us to true repentance towards God and lively faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ? 
Does it excite us to regular efforts to cease from sin and to resist the devil? These are the fruits which sermons ought to produce, if they are really doing us good. Without such fruit, a mere barren admiration of preaching is utterly worthless. It is no proof of grace. It will save no soul. Luke 4, 23-32 Jesus Rejected at Nazareth And he said to them, No doubt you will quote this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself. Whatever we heard was done at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, Truly, I say to you, no prophet is welcome in his hometown. But I say to you in truth, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the sky was shut up for three years and six months, when a great famine came over all the land, and yet Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. And all the people in the synagogue were filled with rage as they heard these things, and they got up and drove him out of the city, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their city had been built, in order to throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went his way. And he came down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he was teaching them on the Sabbath, and they were amazed at his teaching, for his message was with authority. Three great lessons stand out on the face of this passage. Each deserves the close attention of all who desire spiritual wisdom. We learn for one thing how apt men are to despise the highest privileges when they are familiar with them. We see it in the conduct of the men of Nazareth when they had heard the Lord Jesus preach. They could find no fault in his sermon. They could point to no inconsistency in his past life. But because the preacher had dwelt among them thirty years, and his face and voice and appearance were familiar to them, they would not receive his doctrine. They said to one another, Is not this Joseph's son? Is it possible that one so well known as this man can be the Christ? And they drew from our Lord's lips the solemn saying, No prophet is welcome in his hometown. We shall do well to remember this lesson in the matter of ordinances and means of grace. We are always in danger of undervaluing them when we have them in abundance. We are apt to think lightly of the privilege of an open Bible, a preached gospel, and the liberty of meeting together for public worship. We grow up in the midst of these things, and are accustomed to having them without trouble. And the consequence is that we often hold them very cheaply and underrate the extent of our mercies. Let us take heed to our own heart in the use of sacred things. As often as we may read the Bible, let us never read it without deep reverence. As often as we hear the name of Christ, let us never forget that He is the one mediator in whom is life. Even the manna that came down from heaven was at length scorned by Israel as miserable food. Numbers 21, 5. It is an evil day with our souls when Christ is in the midst of us and yet, because of our familiarity with His name, is lightly esteemed. We learn for another thing how bitterly human nature dislikes the doctrine of the sovereignty of God. We see this in the conduct of the Jews of Nazareth when our Lord reminded them that God was under no obligation to work miracles among them. Were there not many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah? No doubt there were. Yet to none of them was the prophet sent. All were passed over in favor of a Gentile widow at Zarephath. Were there not many lepers in Israel in the days of Elisha? No doubt there were. Yet to none of them was the privilege of healing granted. Naaman the Syrian was the only one who was cleansed. Such doctrine as this was intolerable to the Jews of Nazareth. It wounded their pride and self-conceit. It taught them that God was no man's debtor, 
and that if they themselves were passed over in the distribution of his mercies, they had no right to find fault. They couldn't bear his teaching. They were filled with rage. They thrust our Lord out of their city, and had it not been for an exercise of miraculous power on his part, they would doubtless have put him to a violent death by hurling him off the cliff. Of all the doctrines of the Bible, none is so offensive to human nature as the doctrine of God's sovereignty. Man can bear to be told that God is great, and just, and holy, and pure. But to be told that He has mercy on whom He desires, that He does not give an account of all His doings, that it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy, these are truths that natural man cannot stand. They often call forth all his enmity against God and fill him with wrath. Nothing, in short, will make him submit to them except the humbling teaching of the Holy Spirit. Let us settle it in our minds that whether we like it or not, the sovereignty of God is a doctrine clearly revealed in the Bible and a fact clearly to be seen in the world. Upon no other principle can we ever explain why some members of a family are converted and others live and die in sin, or why some quarters of the earth are enlightened by Christianity and others remain buried in heathenism. One account alone can be given of all this. All is ordered by the sovereign hand of God. Let us pray for humility in respect to this deep teaching. Let us never doubt that at the last day the whole world shall be convinced that he who now does not give an account of all his doings has done all things well. We learn lastly from this passage how diligently we ought to persevere in well-doing notwithstanding discouragements. We are doubtless meant to draw this lesson from the conduct of our Lord after his rejection at Nazareth. Not moved by the harsh treatment he received, he patiently works on. Thrust out of one place, he passes on to another. Cast forth from Nazareth, he comes to Capernaum, and there teaches on the Sabbath. Such ought to be the conduct of all the people of Christ. Whatever the work they are called to do, they should patiently continue in it and not give up for lack of success. Whether preachers or teachers, or visitors, or missionaries. They must labor on and not faint. There is often more stirring in the hearts and consciences of people than those who teach and preach to them are at all aware of. There is preparatory work to be done in many a part of God's vineyard, which is just as needful as any other work, though not as agreeable to flesh and blood. There must be sowers as well as reapers. There must be some to break up the ground and pick out the stones, as well as some to gather in the harvest. Let each labor on in his own place. The day is coming when each shall be rewarded according to his work. The very discouragements we meet with enable us to show the world that there are such things as faith and patience. When men see us working on in spite of treatment like that which Jesus received at Nazareth, it makes them think. It convinces them that, at all events, we are persuaded that we have truth on our side. Luke 4, 33-44 Jesus drives out an evil spirit and heals many. In the synagogue there was a man possessed by the spirit of an unclean demon, and he cried out with a loud voice, Let us alone! What business do we have with each other, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet, and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him down in the midst of the people, he came out of him without doing him any harm. And amazement came upon them all, and they began talking with one another, saying, What is this message? For with authority and power He commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. And the report about him was spreading into every locality in the surrounding district. Then he got up and left the synagogue and entered Simon's home. 
Now Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever, and they asked him to help her. And standing over her, he rebuked the fever, and it left her. And she immediately got up and waited on them. While the sun was setting, all those who had any who were sick with various diseases brought them to him, and laying his hands on each one of them, he was healing them. Demons also were coming out of many, shouting, You are the Son of God. But rebuking them, he would not allow them to speak, because they knew him to be the Christ. When day came, Jesus left and went to a secluded place, and the crowds were searching for him, and came to him and tried to keep him from going away from them. But he said to them, I must preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also, for I was sent for this purpose. So he kept on preaching in the synagogues of Judea. We should notice in this passage the clear religious knowledge possessed by the devil and his agents. Twice in these verses we have proof of this. I know who you are, the Holy One of God, was the language of a demon in one case. You are the Son of God, was the language of many demons in another case. Yet this knowledge was a knowledge unaccompanied by faith or hope or charity. Those who possessed it were miserable evil beings, full of bitter hatred against both God and man. Let us beware of an unsanctified knowledge of Christianity. It is a dangerous possession, but a fearfully common one in these latter days. We may know the Bible intellectually and have no doubt about the truth of its contents. We may have our memories well stored with its leading texts and be able to talk glibly about its leading doctrines. And all this time the Bible may have no influence over our hearts and wills and consciences. We may, in reality, be nothing better than the demons. Let it never content us to know religion with our heads only. We may go on all our lives saying, I know this and I know that and sink at last into hell with the words upon our lips. Let us see that our knowledge bears fruit in our lives. Does our knowledge of sin make us hate it? Does our knowledge of Christ make us trust and love Him? Does our knowledge of God's will make us strive to do it? Does our knowledge of the fruits of the Spirit make us labor to show them in our daily behavior? Knowledge of this kind is really profitable. Any other religious knowledge will only add to our condemnation at the last day. We should notice, secondly, in this passage, the almighty power of our Lord Jesus Christ. We see sicknesses and devils alike yielding to his command. He rebukes evil spirits, and they come forth from the unhappy people whom they had possessed. He rebukes a fever, and lays his hands on sick people, and at once their diseases depart and the sick are healed. We cannot fail to observe many similar cases in the four Gospels. They occur so frequently that we are apt to read them with a thoughtless eye and forget the mighty lesson which each one is meant to convey. They are all intended to fasten in our minds the great truth that Christ is the appointed healer of every evil that sin has brought into the world. Christ is the true antidote and remedy for all the soul-ruining mischief which Satan has wrought on mankind. Christ is the universal physician to whom all the children of Adam must go if they would be made whole. In him is life and health and liberty. This is the grand doctrine which every miracle of mercy in the gospel is ordained and appointed to teach. Each is a plain witness to that mighty fact which lies at the very foundation of the gospel. The ability of Christ to supply every need of human nature to the uttermost is the very cornerstone of Christianity. Christ, in one word, is all. Colossians 3.11 Let the study of every miracle help to engrave this truth deeply on our hearts. We should notice, thirdly, in these verses, our Lord's practice of occasional retirement from public notice into some solitary place. We read that after healing many who were sick, 
and after casting out many demons, he left and went to a secluded place. His object in so doing is shown by comparison with other places in the Gospels. He went aside from his work for a season to hold communion with his Father in heaven and to pray. As holy and sinless as his human nature was, it was a nature kept sinless in the regular use of means of grace, and not in the neglect of them. There is an example here which all who desire to grow in grace and walk closely with God would do well to follow. We must make time for private meditation and for being alone with God. We mustn't be content to merely pray daily and read the Scriptures, and to hear the Gospel regularly and to receive the Lord's Supper. All this is well, but something more is needed. We should set apart special seasons for solitary self examination and meditation on the things of God. How often in a year this practice should be attempted, each Christian must judge for himself. But that the practice is most desirable seems clear both from Scripture and experience. We live in hurrying, bustling times. The excitement of daily business and constant engagements keeps many men in a perpetual whirl, and entails great peril on souls. The neglect of this habit of withdrawing occasionally from worldly business is the probable cause of many an inconsistency or backsliding, which brings scandal on the cause of Christ. The more work we have to do, the more we ought to imitate our Master. If He, in the midst of His abundant labors, found time to retire from the world occasionally, Then how much more should we? If the Master found the practice necessary, then it must surely be a thousand times more necessary for his disciples. We ought to notice, lastly, in these verses, the declaration of our Lord as to one of the objects of his coming into the world. We read that he said, I must preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also, for I was sent for this purpose. An expression like this ought to silence forever the foolish remarks that are sometimes made against preaching. The mere fact that the eternal Son of God undertook the office of a preacher should satisfy us that preaching is one of the most valuable means of grace. To speak of preaching, as some do, as a thing of less importance than reading public prayers or administering the sacraments is, to say the least, to exhibit ignorance of Scripture. It is a striking circumstance in our Lord's history that although he was almost incessantly preaching, we never read of his baptizing any person. The witness of John is distinct on this point. Jesus himself was not baptizing. John 4 2. Let us beware of despising preaching. In every age of the church, preaching has been God's principal instrument. For the awakening of sinners and the edifying of saints. The days when there has been little or no preaching have been days when there has been little or no good done in the church. Let us hear sermons in a prayerful and reverent frame of mind, and remember that they are the principal engines which Christ himself employed when he was upon earth. Not least, let us pray daily for a continual supply of faithful preachers of God's word. According to the state of the pulpit, will always be the state of a congregation and of a church. Chapter 5 Luke 5 1 11 The Miraculous Catch of Fish. Now it happened that while the crowd was pressing around him, listening to the word of God, He was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two boats lying at the edge of the lake, but the fishermen had gotten out of them and were washing their nets. And he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little way from the land. And he sat down and began teaching the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water, and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered and said, Master, we worked hard all night and caught nothing, 
but I will do as you say, and let down the nets. When they had this done, they enclosed a great quantity of fish, and their nets began to break. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat for them to come and help them. And they came and filled both of the boats, so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw that, he fell down at Jesus' feet, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For amazement had seized him and all his companions because of the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not fear, from now on you will be catching men. When they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. We have in these verses the history of what is commonly called the miraculous catch of fish. It is a remarkable miracle on two accounts. For one thing, it shows us our Lord's complete dominion over the animal creation. The fish of the sea are as much obedient to His will as the frogs, the flies, and lice, and locusts in the plagues of Egypt. All are His servants, and all obey His commands. For another thing, there is a singular similarity between this miracle worked at the beginning of our Lord's ministry and another which we find Him working after His resurrection at the end of His ministry, recorded by John, John 21. In both we read of a miraculous catch of fish. In both the Apostle Peter has a prominent place in the story, and in both there is, probably, a deep spiritual lesson lying below the outward surface of the facts described. We should observe in this passage our Lord Jesus Christ's unwearied readiness for every good work. Once more we find Him preaching to a people who were pressing around Him and listening to the Word of God. And where does He preach? Not in any consecrated building or a place set apart for public worship, but in the open air not in a pulpit constructed for a preacher's use, but in a fisherman's boat. Souls were waiting to be fed. Personal inconvenience was allowed no place in his consideration. God's work must not stand still. The servants of Christ should learn a lesson from their master's conduct on this occasion. We are not to wait until every little difficulty or obstacle is removed before we put our hand to the plough or go forth to sow the seed of the word. We may often be lacking convenient buildings for assembling a company of hearers. We may often be lacking convenient rooms for gathering children to Sunday school. What then are we to do? Shall we sit still and do nothing? God forbid! If we cannot do all that we want, then let us do what we can. Let us work with such tools as we have. While we are lingering and delaying, souls are perishing. It is the slothful heart that is always looking at the hedge of thorns and the lion outside in the way. Proverbs 15, 19, 22, 13. Where we are and as we are, in season or out of season, by one means or by another, by tongue or by pen, by speaking or by writing. Let us strive to be ever working for God. But let us never stand still. We should observe, secondly, in this passage, what encouragement our Lord gives to unquestioning obedience. We are told that after preaching, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. He receives an answer which exhibits in a striking manner the mind of a good servant. Master, says Simon, We worked hard all night and caught nothing, but I will do as you say and let down the nets. And what was the reward of this ready compliance with the Lord's commands? At once, we are told, when they had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish, and their nets began to break. We need not doubt that a practical lesson for all Christians is contained under these simple circumstances. We are meant to learn the blessing of immediate, unhesitating obedience to every plain command of Christ. The path of duty may sometimes be hard and disagreeable. The wisdom of the course we propose to follow 
may not be apparent to the world. But none of these things must move us. We are not to confer with flesh and blood. We are to go straight ahead when Jesus says, Go. We are to do a thing boldly, unflinchingly, and decidedly when Jesus says, Do it. We are to walk by faith and not by sight, and believe that what we don't see now to be right and reasonable, we shall see hereafter. So acting, we shall never find in the long run that we are losers. So acting, we shall find sooner or later that we reap a great reward. We should observe thirdly in this passage how much a sense of God's presence abases man and makes him feel his sinfulness. We see this strikingly illustrated by Peter's words when the miraculous catch of fish convinced him that one greater than man was in his boat. We read that he fell down at Jesus' feet, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. In measuring these words of Peter, we must of course remember the time at which they were spoken. He was, at best, but a babe in grace, weak in faith weak in experience, and weak in knowledge. At a later period in his life he would doubtless have said, Abide with me, and not depart from me. But still, after every deduction of this kind, the words of Peter exactly express the first feelings of man when he is brought into anything like close contact with God. The sight of divine greatness and holiness makes him feel strongly his own littleness and sinfulness. Like Adam after the fall, his first thought is to hide himself. Like Israel under Sinai, the language of his heart is, Let not God speak to us, or we will die. Exodus 20, 19. Let us strive to know more and more, every year we live, our need of a mediator between ourselves and God. Let us seek more and more to realize that without a mediator, our thoughts of God can never be comfortable, and the more clearly we see God, the more uncomfortable we must feel. Above all, let us be thankful that we have in Jesus the very mediator whose help our souls require, and that through him we may draw near to God with boldness and cast fear away. Out of Christ, God is a consuming fire. In Christ, he is a reconciled father. Without Christ, the strictest moralist may well tremble as he ponders his final destiny. Through Christ, the chief of sinners may approach God with confidence and feel perfect peace. We should observe, lastly, in this passage, the mighty promise which Jesus holds out to Peter Do not fear, from now on you will be catching men. That promise, we may well believe, was not intended for Peter only, but for all the apostles, and not for all the apostles only, but for all faithful ministers of the gospel who walk in the apostles' steps. It was spoken for their encouragement and consolation. It was intended to support them under that sense of weakness and unprofitableness by which they are sometimes almost overwhelmed. They certainly have a treasure in earthen vessels. 2 Corinthians 4 7. They are men of like passions with others. They find their own hearts weak and frail like the hearts of any of their hearers. They are often tempted to give up in despair and to leave off preaching. But here stands a promise on which the great head of the church would have them daily lean. Do not fear, from now on you will be catching men. Let us pray daily for all ministers, that they may be true successors of Peter and his brethren, and that they may preach the same full and free gospel which they preached, and live the same holy lives which they lived. These are the only ministers who will ever prove successful fishermen. To some of them God may give more honor, and to others less. But all true and faithful preachers of the gospel have a right to believe that their labor shall not prove in vain. They may often preach the word with many tears and see no result of their labor. But God's word shall not return void. Isaiah 55, 11. The last day shall show 
that no sincere work for God was ever wasted. Every faithful fisherman shall find his master's words made good. You will be catching men. Luke 5, 12-16 Jesus Heals a Leper While he was in one of the cities, behold, there was a man covered with leprosy. And when he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and implored him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And he stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. And immediately the leprosy left him. And he ordered him to tell no one, but go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing, just as Moses commanded, as a testimony to them. But the news about him was spreading even farther, and large crowds were gathering to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. But Jesus himself would often slip away to the wilderness and pray. We see in this passage our Lord Jesus Christ's power over incurable diseases. A man covered with leprosy appeals to him for relief and is at once healed. This was a mighty miracle. Of all illnesses which can afflict the body of man, leprosy appears to be the most severe. It affects every part of the constitution at once. It brings sores and decay upon the skin, corruption into the blood, and rottenness into the bones. It is a living death which no medicine can check or stop. Yet here we read of a leper being made well in a moment. It is but one touch from the hand of the Son of God, and the cure is effected. It is but one single touch of that almighty hand. And immediately the leprosy left him. We have in this wonderful history a lively emblem of Christ's power to heal our souls. What are we all but spiritual lepers in the sight of God? Sin is the deadly leprosy by which we are all affected. It has eaten into our vitals. It has infected all our faculties. Heart, conscience, mind, and will, all are diseased by sin. From the sole of our foot to the crown of our head, there is no soundness in us, only welts and wounds and putrefying sores. Isaiah 1 6. Such is the state in which we are all born. Such is the state in which we all naturally live. We are in one sense dead long before we are laid in the grave. Our bodies may be healthy and active, but our souls are by nature dead in trespasses and sins. Who shall deliver us from this body of death? Let us thank God that Jesus Christ can. He is that divine great physician who can make old things pass away and all things become new. In Him is life. He can wash us thoroughly in His own blood from all the defilement of sin. He can quicken us and revive us by His own Spirit. He can cleanse our hearts, open the eyes of our understanding, renew our wills, and make us whole. Let this truth sink down deeply into our hearts. There is only one medicine to heal our sin-sick souls. If we are lost, it is not because we have no remedy provided. However corrupt our hearts and however wicked our past lives, there is hope for us in the gospel. There is no case of spiritual leprosy too hard for Christ. We see, secondly, in this passage, our Lord Jesus Christ's willingness to help those who are in need. The petition of the afflicted leper was a very touching one. Lord, he said, if you are willing, you can make me clean. The answer he received was singularly merciful and gracious. At once our Lord replies, I am willing, be cleansed. Those three little words, I am willing, deserve special notice. They are a deep mine rich in comfort and encouragement to all laboring and heavy laden souls. They show us the mind of Christ towards sinners. They exhibit his infinite willingness to do good to sinful men 
and his readiness to show compassion. Let us always remember that if men are not saved, it is not because Jesus is not willing to save them. He is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. 2 Peter 3 9. He would have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy 2 4. He has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Ezekiel 18 32. He would have gathered Jerusalem's children as a hen gathers her chicks if they would only have been gathered. Matthew 23 37. He would, but they would not. The blame of the sinner's ruin must be borne by himself. If he is lost forever, it is his own will. It is a solemn saying of our Lord's, You are unwilling to come to me so that you may have life. John 5.40 We see thirdly in this passage what respect our Lord Jesus Christ paid to the ceremonial law of Moses. He bids the leper go and show himself to the priest according to the requirement in Leviticus that he may be legally pronounced clean. He bids him present an offering on the occasion of his doing so, just as Moses commanded. Our Lord knew well that the ceremonies of the Mosaic law were only shadows and types of good things to come, and had in themselves no inherent power. He knew well that the last days of the Levitical institutions were close at hand, and that they were soon to be laid aside forever. But so long as they were not abrogated, he would have them respected. They were ordained by God Himself. They were pictures and lively emblems of the gospel. They were not, therefore, to be lightly esteemed. There is a lesson here for Christians which we shall do well to remember. Let us take heed that we do not despise the ceremonial law because its work is done. Let us beware of neglecting those parts of the Bible which contain it under the idea that the believer in the gospel has nothing to do with them. It's true that the darkness is past and the true light now shines. 1 John 2, 8. We have nothing to do now with altars, sacrifices, or priests. Those who wish to revive them are like men who light a candle at noonday. But as true as this is, we must never forget that the ceremonial law is still full of instruction. It contains that same gospel in the bud, which we now see in full flower. Rightly understood, we shall always find it throwing strong light on the gospel of Christ. The Bible reader who neglects to study it will always find at least that by the neglect of it his soul has suffered damage. We see lastly in this passage our Lord Jesus Christ's diligence about private prayer. Although large crowds were gathering to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses, he still made time for secret devotion. As holy and undefiled as he was, he wouldn't allow the demands of public ministry to prevent regular private communion with God. We are told that he would often slip away to the wilderness and pray. There is an example set before us here which is much overlooked in these latter days. There are few professing Christians, it may be feared, who strive to imitate Christ in this matter of private devotion. There is abundance of hearing and reading and talking and profession, and visiting and almsgiving, and subscribing to societies, and teaching at schools. But is there, together with all this, a due proportion of private prayer? Are believing men and women sufficiently careful to be frequently alone with God? These are humbling and heart searching questions. But we shall find it useful to give an answer to them. Why is it that there is so much apparent religious working and yet so little result in real conversions to God? Why is it that there are so many sermons and yet so few souls saved? Why is it that there is so much church machinery and yet so little effect produced? Why is it that there is so much running here and there and yet so few brought to Christ? Why is all this? The reply is short and simple. 
there is not enough private prayer. The cause of Christ doesn't need less working, but it does need more praying among the workers. Let us each examine ourselves and amend our ways. The most successful workmen in the Lord's vineyard are those who are like their master, often and much upon their knees. Luke 5, 17-26 Jesus Heals a Paralytic One day he was teaching, and there were some Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting there, who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present for him to perform healing. And some men were carrying on a bed a man who was paralyzed, and they were trying to bring him in and to set him down in front of him. But not finding any way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and let him down through the tiles with his stretcher into the middle of the crowd in front of Jesus. Seeing their faith, he said, Friend, your sins are forgiven you. The scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this man who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But Jesus, aware of their reasonings, answered and said to them, Why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins have been forgiven you, or to say, Get up and walk? But, so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, Get up, and pick up your stretcher, and go home. Immediately he got up before them, and picked up what he had been lying on, and went home glorifying God. They were all struck with astonishment, and began glorifying God. And they were all filled with fear, saying, We have seen remarkable things today. A threefold miracle demands our attention in these verses. At one and the same time, we see our Lord forgiving sins, reading men's thoughts, and healing a paralytic. He who could do such things, and do them with such perfect ease and authority, must indeed be very God. Power like this was never possessed by any man. Let us mark firstly in this passage what pains men will take about an object when they are in earnest. The friends of a paralyzed man desired to bring him to Jesus that he might be cured. At first they were unable to do it because of the crowd by which our Lord was surrounded. What then did they do? Not finding any way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and let him down through the tiles with his stretcher, into the middle of the crowd in front of Jesus. At once their objective was met. Our Lord's attention was drawn to their sick friend, and he was healed. By pains and labor and perseverance, his friends succeeded in obtaining for him the mighty blessing of a complete cure. The importance of pains and diligence is a truth which meets our eyes on every side. In every calling and vocation and trade, we see that great effort is one prominent secret of success. It isn't by luck or accident that men prosper, but by hard work. Bankers and merchants don't make fortunes without effort and trouble and attention. Lawyers and physicians do not make their practices without diligence and hard study. The principle is one with which the people of this world are perfectly familiar. It is one of their favorite maxims. There are no gains without pains. Let us thoroughly understand that pains and diligence are just as essential to the well being and prosperity of our souls as of our bodies. In all our endeavors to draw near to God, in all our approaches to Christ, there ought to be the same determined earnestness which was shown by this sick man's friends. We must allow no difficulties to check us and no obstacle to keep us back from anything which is really for our spiritual good. Especially must we bear this in mind in the matter of regularly reading the Bible, hearing the gospel, keeping the Sabbath holy, and coming to private prayer. On all these points we must beware of laziness and an excuse-making spirit. Necessity 
must be the mother of invention. If we cannot find means of keeping up these habits in one way, then we must in another way. But we must settle it in our minds that the thing shall be done. The health of our soul is at stake. Let the crowd of difficulties be what it may, we must get through it. If the people of this world take so much pains about a corruptible crown, then we ought to take far more pains about one that is incorruptible. Why is it that so many people take no pains in religion? How is it that they can never find time for praying, Bible reading, and hearing the gospel? What is the secret of their continual string of excuses for neglecting means of grace? How is it that the very same men who are full of zeal about money, business, pleasure, or politics will take no trouble about their souls? The answer to these questions is short and simple. These men are not in earnest about salvation. They have no sense of their spiritual disease. They have no consciousness of requiring a spiritual physician. They don't feel that their souls are in danger of eternal damnation. They see no use in taking trouble about religion. In darkness like this, thousands live and die. Happy indeed are those who have found out their peril and count all things loss if they may only win Christ and be found in Him. Let us mark, secondly, the kindness and compassion of our Lord Jesus Christ. Twice in this passage we see him speaking most graciously to the poor sufferer who was brought before him. He first addressed those marvelous and heart cheering words to him, Friend, your sins are forgiven you. Afterwards, he adds words which, in point of comfort, must have been second only to the blessing of forgiveness. Get up, he says, and pick up your stretcher and go home. First, he assures him that his soul is healed. Then he tells him that his body is cured and sends him away rejoicing. Let us never forget this part of our Lord's character. Christ's loving kindness to his people never changes and never fails. It is a deep well of which no one has ever found the bottom. It began from all eternity before they were born. It chose Called and quickened them when they were dead in trespasses and sins. It drew them to God and changed their character and put a new will in their minds and a new song in their mouths. It has borne with them in all their waywardness and shortcomings. It will never allow them to be separated from God. It will flow ever forward like a mighty river through the endless ages of eternity. Christ's love and mercy must be a sinner's plea when he first begins his journey. Christ's love and mercy will be his only plea when he crosses the dark river and enters his eternal home. Let us seek to know this love by inward experience and prize it more. Let it constrain us more continually to live not unto ourselves but unto him who died for us and rose again. Let us mark, lastly, our Lord's perfect knowledge of the thoughts of men. We read that when the scribes and Pharisees began to reason secretly among themselves and privately charge our Lord with blasphemy, He knew what they were about and put them to open shame. It is written that Jesus was aware of their reasonings. It should be a daily and habitual reflection with us that we can keep nothing secret from Christ. To him apply the words of Paul, All things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Hebrews 4.13 To him belong the solemn expressions of the 139th Psalm, the psalm which every Christian should often study. There is not a word in our mouths nor an imagination in our hearts, but Jesus knows it altogether. How many searchings of heart this mighty truth ought to awaken within us. Christ ever sees us. Christ always knows us. Christ continually reads and observes our acts, words, and thoughts. The recollection of this should alarm the wicked 
and drive them from their sins. Their wickedness is not hidden, and it will one day be fearfully exposed unless they repent. It should frighten hypocrites out of their hypocrisy. They may deceive man, but they are not deceiving Christ. It should quicken and comfort all sincere believers. They should remember that a loving master is ever watching them, and they should do all as in his sight. Above all, they should feel that however mocked and slandered by the world, they are fairly and justly measured by their Saviour's eye. They can say, Lord, you know all things, you know that I love you. John 21 17. Luke 5 27 32. The Calling of Matthew. After that, he went out and noticed a tax collector named Levi sitting in the tax booth, and he said to him, Follow me. And he left everything behind and got up and began to follow him. And Levi gave a big reception for him in his own house, and there was a great crowd of tax collectors and other people who were reclining at the table with them. The Pharisees and their scribes began grumbling at his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with the tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered and said to them, It is not those who are well who need a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. The verses we have now heard ought to be deeply interesting to everyone who knows the value of his immortal soul and desires salvation. They describe the conversion and experience of one of Christ's earliest disciples. We also are all, by nature, born in sin and need conversion. Let us see what we know of the mighty change. Let us compare our own experience with that of the man whose case is here described, and by comparison learn wisdom. We are taught in this passage the power of Christ's calling grace. We read that our Lord called a tax collector named Levi to become one of his disciples. This man belonged to a class who were a very proverb for wickedness among the Jews. Yet even to him our Lord says, Follow me. We read furthermore that such mighty influence on Levi's heart accompanied our Lord's words, that although sitting in the tax booth, when called, he at once got up, left everything, followed Jesus, and became his disciple. We must never despair of anyone's salvation so long as he lives, after reading a case like this. We must never say of anyone that he is too wicked or too hardened or too worldly to be saved. No sins are too many or too bad to be forgiven. No heart is too hard or too worldly to be changed. He who called Levi still lives, and he is the same as he was eighteen hundred years ago. With Christ nothing is impossible. How is it with ourselves? This, after all, is the grand question. Are we waiting and delaying and hanging back under the idea that the cross is too heavy and that we can never serve Christ? Let us cast such thoughts away at once and forever. Let us believe that Christ can enable us by His Spirit to give up all and come out from the world. Let us remember that He who called Levi never changes. Let us take up the cross boldly and go forward. We are taught, secondly, in this passage, that conversion is a cause of joy to a true believer. We read that when Levi was converted, he gave a big reception in his house. A feast reception is made for laughter and merriment. Ecclesiastes 10.19 Levi regarded the change in himself as an occasion of rejoicing, and he wished others to rejoice with him. We can easily imagine that Levi's conversion was a cause of grief to his worldly friends. They saw him giving up a profitable calling to follow a new teacher from Nazareth. They doubtless regarded his conduct as a grievous piece of folly and an occasion for sorrow rather than joy. They only looked at his temporal losses by becoming a Christian. Of his spiritual gains they knew nothing. 
In the same way, there are many like them. There are always thousands of people who, if they hear of a relative being converted, consider it rather a misfortune. Instead of rejoicing, they only shake their heads and mourn. Let us, however, settle it in our minds that Levi did right to rejoice, and if we are converted, let us rejoice likewise. Nothing can happen to a man which ought to be such an occasion of joy as his conversion. It is a far more important event than being married, or being made a nobleman, or receiving a great fortune. It is the birth of an immortal soul. It is the rescue of a sinner from hell. It is a passage from life to death. It is being made a king and priest forevermore. It is being provided for both in time and eternity. It is adoption into the noblest and richest of all families, the family of God. Let us not heed the opinion of the world in this matter. They speak evil of things which they know nothing of. Let us, with Levi, consider every fresh conversion as a cause for great rejoicing. Never ought there to be such joy, gladness, and congratulation as when our sons or daughters or brethren or sisters or friends are born again and brought to Christ. The words of the prodigal's father should be remembered. We had to celebrate and rejoice, for this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live, and was lost and has been found. Luke 15, 32. We are taught thirdly in this passage that converted souls desire to promote the conversion of others. We are told that when Levi was converted and had made a feast on the occasion, he invited a great company of tax collectors and others to share it. Most probably these men were his old friends and companions. He knew well what their souls needed, for he had been one of them. He desired to make them acquainted with that Saviour who had been merciful to him. Having found mercy, he wanted them also to find it. Having been graciously delivered from the bondage of sin, he wished others also to be set free. This feeling of Levi will always be the feeling of a true Christian. It may be safely asserted that there is no grace in the man who cares nothing about the salvation of his fellow men. The heart which is really taught by the Holy Spirit will always be full of love, charity, and compassion towards others. The soul which has been truly saved by God will earnestly desire that others may experience the same salvation. A converted man will not wish to go to heaven alone. How is it with ourselves in this matter? Do we know anything of Levi's spirit after his conversion? Do we strive in every way to make our friends and relatives acquainted with Christ? Do we say to others, as Moses to Hobab, Come with us and we will do you good? Numbers 10.29 Do we say, as the Samaritan woman, Come, see a man who told me all the things that I have done? John 4.29 Do we cry to our brethren, as Andrew did to Simeon, We have found the Messiah? John 1. 41. These are very serious questions. They supply a most searching test of the real condition of our souls. Let us not shrink from applying it. There is not enough of a missionary spirit among Christians. It shouldn't satisfy us to be safe ourselves. We ought also to try to do good to others. All cannot go to the heathen. But every believer should strive to be a missionary to his fellow men. Having received mercy, we should be eager to share the gospel with others. We are taught, lastly, in this passage, one of the chief objects of Christ's coming into the world. We have it in the well known verse, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. This is that great lesson of the gospel which, in one form or another, we find continually taught in the New Testament. It is one which we can never have too strongly impressed upon our minds. Such is our natural ignorance and self righteousness in religion that we are constantly losing sight of it. We need to be frequently reminded that Jesus did not come merely as a teacher, but also as the Saviour of those who are utterly lost, 
and that they alone can receive salvation from Him who will confess that they are ruined, bankrupt, hopeless, miserable sinners. Let us use this mighty truth if we never used it before. Are we sensible of our own wickedness and sinfulness? Do we feel that we are unworthy of anything but divine wrath and condemnation? Then let us understand that we are the very people for whose sake Jesus came into the world. If we feel ourselves to be righteous, then Christ has nothing to say to us. But if we feel ourselves to be lost sinners, then Christ calls us to repentance. Let not the call be made in vain. Let us go on using this mighty truth if we have used it in times past. Do we find our own hearts weak and deceitful? Do we often feel the principle that evil is present in us, the ones who want to do good? Romans 7.21 It may all be true, but it must not prevent our resting on Christ. He came into the world to save sinners. And if we feel ourselves to be such, then we have warrant for appealing to and trusting in Him to our life's end. Only let us never forget one thing, that Christ came to call us to repentance and not to sanction our continuing in sin. Luke 5, 33-39 Fasting and Wineskins And they said to him, The disciples of John often fast and offer prayers. The disciples of the Pharisees also do the same, but yours eat and drink. And Jesus said to them, You cannot make the attendants of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them, can you? But the days will come, and when the bridegroom is taken away from them, then they will fast in those days. And he was also telling them a parable. No one tears a piece of cloth from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. Otherwise, he will both tear the new, and the piece from the new will not match the old. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins, and it will be spilled out, and the skins will be ruined. But new wine must be put into fresh wineskins. And no one, after drinking old wine, wishes for new. For he says, the old is good enough. We should observe in these verses that men may disagree on the lesser points of religion while they agree on its weightier matters. We have this brought out in the alleged difference between the disciples of John the Baptist and the disciples of Christ. The statement was said to our Lord, The disciples of John often fast and offer prayers. The disciples of the Pharisees also do the same but yours eat and drink. We cannot suppose that there was any essential difference between the doctrines held by these two parties of disciples. The teaching of John the Baptist was doubtless clear and explicit upon all the main points necessary to salvation. The man who could say of Jesus, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, was not likely to teach his followers anything contrary to the gospel. His teaching, of course, lacked the fullness and perfection of his divine master's teaching, but it is absurd to suppose that it contradicted it. Nevertheless, there were points of practice on which his disciples differed from those of Christ. Agreeing, as they doubtless did, about the necessity of repentance and faith and holiness, they disagreed about such matters as fasting, eating, drinking, and the manner of public devotion. One in heart and hope and aim as they were about the weightier matters of inward religion, they were not entirely of one mind about secondary outward matters. We must make up our minds to see differences of this kind among Christians as long as the world stands. We may much regret them because of the handle they give to an ignorant and prejudiced world, but they will exist. They are one of the many evidences of our fallen condition about church government, about the manner of conducting public worship, about fasts and feasts and ceremonials, Christians have never been entirely of one mind, even from the days of the apostles. On all these points, the holiest and ablest servants of God have arrived at different conclusions. 
argument, reasoning, persuasion, persecution, have all alike proved unable to produce unity. Let us, however, bless God that there are many points on which all true servants of God are thoroughly agreed. About sin and salvation, about repentance and faith and holiness, there is a mighty unity among all believers of every name and nation and people and tongue. Let us make much of these points in our own personal religion. These, after all, are the principal things which we shall think of in the hour of death and the day of judgment. On other matters, we must agree to differ. It will signify little at the last day what we thought about fasting and eating and drinking and ceremonies. Did we repent and bring forth fruits fit for repentance? Did we behold the Lamb of God by faith? And sincerely receive him as our Saviour. All of every church who are found right on these points will be saved. All of every church who are found wrong on these points will be lost forevermore. We should observe, secondly, in these verses, the implied name which our Lord Jesus Christ speaks of himself. Three times he uses the name bridegroom. The name bridegroom, like every name applied to our Lord in the Bible, is full of instruction. It is a name particularly comforting and encouraging to all true Christians. It teaches the deep and tender love with which Jesus regards all sinners who believe in him. Weak and unworthy and full of shortcomings as they are in themselves, he feels towards them a tender affection, even as a husband does towards his wife. The name bridegroom teaches the close and intimate union which exists between Jesus and believers. It is something far nearer than the union of king and subject, master and servant, teacher and scholar, or shepherd and sheep. It is the closest of all unions, the union of husband and wife, the union of which it is written, What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. Above all, the name teaches the entire participation of all that Jesus is and has, which is the privilege of every believer. Just as the husband gives to his wife his name, makes her partaker of his property, home, and dignity, and undertakes all her debts and liabilities, so does Christ deal with all true Christians. He takes on himself all their sins. He declares that they are a part of himself and that he who hurts them hurts him. He gives them, even in this world, such good things as surpass man's understanding. And he promises that in the next world they shall sit with him on his throne and never leave his presence forever. If we know anything of true and saving religion, then let us often rest our souls on this name and office of Christ. Let us remember daily that the weakest of Christ's people are cared for with a tender care that surpasses knowledge, and that whoever hurts them is hurting the apple of Christ's eye. In this world, we may be poor and contemptible and laughed at because of our religion. But if we have saving faith, then we are precious in the sight of Christ. The bridegroom of our soul will one day plead our cause before the whole world. We should observe, lastly, in these verses, how gently and tenderly Christ would have his people deal with young and inexperienced Christians. He teaches us this lesson by two parables drawn from the affairs of daily life. He shows the folly of sewing a piece of cloth from a new garment and putting it on an old garment, or of putting new wine into old wineskins. In the same way, he would have us know that there is a lack of harmony between a new dispensation and an old one. It is vain to expect those who have been trained and taught under one system to become immediately used to another system. On the contrary, they must be led on by degrees and taught as they are able to bear. The lesson is one which all true Christians would do well to lay to heart, and none perhaps so much as Christian ministers and Christian parents. Forgetfulness of it often does much harm to the cause of truth. 
The hard judgments and unreasonable expectations of old disciples have often driven back and discouraged young beginners in the school of Christ. Let us settle it in our minds that grace must have a beginning in every believer's heart, and that we have no right to say a man has no grace because it does not come to full ripeness at once. We don't expect a child to do the work of a full grown man, even though he may one day if he lives long enough. In the same way, we mustn't expect a new disciple of Christ to show the faith and love and knowledge of an old soldier of the cross. He may by and by become a mighty champion of the truth, but at first we must give him time. There is great need of wisdom in dealing with young people about religion, and generally speaking with all young disciples. Kindness and patience and gentleness are of the first importance. We must not try to pour in the new wine too quickly, or it will ruin the wineskins. We must take them by the hand and lead them on gently. We must beware of frightening them, or hurrying them, or pressing them on too fast. If they have only got hold of the main principles of the gospel, then let us not set them down as godless because of a few lesser matters. We must bear with much weakness and infirmity and not expect to find old heads on young shoulders, or ripe Christian experience in those who are only babes. There was deep wisdom in Jacob's saying, If they are driven hard one day, all the flocks will die. Genesis 33, 13Chapter 6, Luke 6, 1-5 Jesus and the Sabbath Now it happened that he was passing through some grain fields on a Sabbath, and his disciples were picking the heads of grain, rubbing them in their hands, and eating the grain. But some of the Pharisees said, Why do you do what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And Jesus answering them said, Have you not even read what David did when he was hungry, he and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and took and ate the consecrated bread, which is not lawful for any to eat except the priests alone, and gave it to his companions? And he was saying to them, The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. We should notice in this passage what excessive importance hypocrites attach to trifles. We are told that, He was passing through some grain fields on a Sabbath, and his disciples were picking the heads of grain, rubbing them in their hands, and eating the grain. At once the hypocritical Pharisees found fault and charged them with committing a sin. They said, Why do you do what is not lawful on the Sabbath? The mere act of plucking the heads of wheat, of course, they didn't find fault with. It was an action sanctioned by the Mosaic law. Deuteronomy 23.25. The supposed fault with which they charged the disciples was the breach of the fourth commandment. They had done work on the Sabbath by taking and eating a handful of food. This exaggerated zeal of the Pharisees about the Sabbath, we must remember, did not extend to other plain commandments of God. It is evident from many expressions in the Gospels that these very men who pretended such strictness on one little point were more than lax and indifferent about other points of infinitely greater importance. While they stretched the commandment about the Sabbath beyond its true meaning, they openly trampled on the tenth commandment and were notorious for covetousness. Luke 16, 14. But this is precisely the character of the hypocrite. To use our Lord's illustration, in some things he makes a fuss about straining a gnat out of his cup, while in other things he can swallow a camel. Matthew 23, 24. It is a bad symptom of any man's state of soul when he begins to put the second things in religion in the first place and the first things in the second place, or the things ordained by man above the things ordained by God. Let us beware of falling into this state of mind. 
There is something sadly wrong in our spiritual condition when the only thing we look at in others is their outward Christianity, and when the principal question we ask is whether they worship in our denomination and use our ceremonies and serve God in our way. Do they repent of sin? Do they believe on Christ? Are they living holy lives? These are the chief points to which our attention ought to be directed. The moment we begin to place anything in religion before these things, we are in danger of becoming as thorough Pharisees as the accusers of the disciples. We should notice, secondly, in this passage, how graciously our Lord Jesus Christ pleaded the cause of his disciples and defended them against their accusers. We are told that he answered the nitpickings of the Pharisees with arguments by which they were silenced if not convinced. He didn't leave his disciples to fight their battle alone. He came to their rescue and spoke for them. We have in this fact a cheering illustration of the work that Jesus is ever doing on behalf of his people. There is one, we read in the Bible, who is called the accuser of our brethren, who accuses them before our God day and night. Even Satan, the prince of this world. Revelation 12, 10. How many grounds of accusation we give him by reason of our infirmity! How many charges he may justly lay against us before God! But let us thank God that believers have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, who is ever maintaining the cause of his people in heaven and continually making intercession for them. Let us take comfort in this cheering thought. Let us daily rest our souls on the recollection of our great friend in heaven. Let our morning and evening prayer continually be, Answer for me, answer for me, O Lord my God. We should notice, lastly in these verses, the clear light which our Lord Jesus Christ throws on the real requirements of the fourth commandment. He tells the hypocritical Pharisees who pretended to such strictness in their observance of the Sabbath, That the Sabbath was never intended to prevent works of necessity. He reminds them of how David himself, when suffering from hunger, took and ate that consecrated bread which ought only to be eaten by the priests, and how the act was evidently allowed by God because it was an act of necessity. And he argues from David's case that he who permitted his own temple rules to be infringed in cases of necessity would doubtless allow work to be done on his own Sabbath days when it was work for which there was really a need. We should weigh carefully the nature of our Lord Jesus Christ's teaching about the observance of the Sabbath both here and in other places. We mustn't allow ourselves to be carried away by the common notion that the Sabbath is a mere Jewish ordinance and that it was abolished and done away with by Christ. There is not a single passage of the Gospels which proves this. In every case where we find our Lord speaking upon it, he speaks against the false views of it which were taught by the Pharisees, but not against the day itself. He cleanses and purifies the fourth commandment from the man made additions by which the Jews had defiled it, but he never declares that it was not to bind Christians. He shows that the seventh day's rest was not meant to prevent works of necessity and mercy, but he says nothing to imply that it was to pass away as a part of the ceremonial law. We live in days where anything like strict Sabbath observance is loudly denounced in some quarters as a remnant of Jewish superstition. We are boldly told by some people that to keep the Sabbath holy is legalistic and that to enforce the fourth commandment on Christians is going back to bondage. Let it suffice us to remember, when we hear such things, that assertions are not proofs, and that vague talk like this has no confirmation in the word of God. Let us settle it in our minds that the fourth commandment has never been repealed by Christ, and that we have no more right to break the Sabbath day under the gospel than we have to murder and to steal. The architect who repairs a building and restores it to its proper use is not the destroyer of it, 
but the preserver. The Savior, who redeemed the Sabbath from Jewish traditions and so frequently explained its true meaning, ought never to be regarded as the enemy of the fourth commandment. On the contrary, he has magnified it and made it honorable. Let us cling to our Sabbath as the best safeguard of our country's religion. Let us defend it against the assaults of ignorant and mistaken men who would gladly turn the day of God into a day of business and pleasure. Above all, let us each strive to keep the day holy ourselves. Much of our spiritual prosperity depends, under God, on the manner in which we employ our Sundays. Luke 6, 6 6-11 The Withered Hand Healed On another Sabbath he entered the synagogue and was teaching, and there was a man there whose right hand was withered. The scribes and the Pharisees were watching him closely to see if he healed on the Sabbath, so that they might find reason to accuse him. But he knew what they were thinking, and he said to the man with the withered hand, Get up and come forward. And he got up and came forward. And Jesus said to them, I ask you, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save a life or to destroy it? After looking around at them all, he said to him, Stretch out your hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored. But they themselves were filled with rage and discussed together what they might do to Jesus. These verses contain another example of our Lord Jesus Christ's mode of dealing with the Sabbath question. Once more we find him coming into collision with the vain traditions of the Pharisees about the observance of the fourth commandment. Once more we find him clearing the day of God from the rubbish of human traditions and placing its requirements on the right foundation. We are taught in these verses the lawfulness of doing works of mercy on the Sabbath day. We read that before all the scribes and Pharisees, our Lord healed a man with a withered hand on the Sabbath. He knew that these enemies of all righteousness were watching to see whether he would do it in order that they might find reason to accuse him. He boldly asserts the right of doing such works of mercy even on the day when it is said, No work at all shall be done. He openly challenges them to show that such a work was contrary to the law. I ask you, he says, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save a life or to destroy it? To this question his enemies were unable to find an answer. The principle here laid down is one of wide application. The fourth commandment was never meant to be so interpreted as to inflict injury on man's body. It was intended to admit of adaptation to that state of things which sin has brought into the world. It was not meant to forbid showing kindness on the Sabbath to the afflicted or attending to the needs of the sick. We may drive in a carriage to minister comfort to the dying. We may stay away from public worship in order to fetch a doctor or be useful in a sick room. We may visit the fatherless and widow in trouble. We may preach and teach and instruct the ignorant. These are works of mercy. We may do them and yet keep the Sabbath holy. They are not breaches of God's law. One thing, however, we must carefully remember. We must take heed that we do not abuse the liberty which Christ has given us. It is in this direction that our danger chiefly lies in modern times. There is little risk of our committing the error of the Pharisees and keeping the Sabbath more strictly than God intended. The thing to be feared is the general disposition to neglect the Sabbath and to rob it of that honor which it ought to receive. Let us take heed to ourselves in this matter. We are taught, secondly, in these verses, the perfect knowledge that our Lord Jesus Christ possesses of men's thoughts. We see this in the language used about him when the scribes and Pharisees were watching him. We read that he knew what they were thinking. Expressions like this are among the many evidences of our Lord's divinity. It belongs to God alone 
to read hearts. He who could discern the secret intents and imaginations of others must have been more than man. No doubt he was a man like ourselves in all things, sin only excepted. This we may freely grant to the Socinian who denies the divinity of Christ. The texts the Socinian quotes in proof of our Lord's manhood are texts which we believe and hold to as fully as he does. But there are other plain texts in Scripture which prove that our Lord was God as well as man. Of such texts, the passage before us is one. It shows that Jesus was God over all, blessed forever. Romans 9 5. Let the remembrance of our Lord's perfect knowledge always exercise a humbling influence upon our souls. How many vain thoughts and worldly imaginations pass through our minds every hour which man's eye never sees! What are our own thoughts at this moment? What have they been this very day while we have been reading or listening to this passage of Scripture? Would they bear public examination? Would we want others to know all that passes in our mind? These are serious questions and deserve serious answers. Whatever we may think of them, it is a certain fact that Jesus Christ is hourly reading our hearts. Truly, we ought to humble ourselves before Him and cry daily, Who can discern my errors? Acquit me of hidden faults. God, be merciful to me, the sinner. We are taught, lastly, in these verses, the nature of the first act of faith when a soul is converted to God. The lesson is conveyed to us in a striking manner by the history of the cure which is here described. We read that our Lord said to the man whose hand was withered, Stretch out your hand. The command at first sight seems unreasonable because the man's obedience was apparently impossible. But the poor sufferer was not stopped by any doubts or reasonings of this kind. At once we read that he made the attempt to stretch forth his hand, and in making the attempt was cured. He had faith enough to believe that he who bade him to stretch forth his hand was not mocking him and ought to be obeyed. And it was precisely in this act of implicit obedience that he received the blessing. His hand was restored. Let us see in this simple history the best answer to those doubts and hesitations and questionings by which anxious inquirers often perplex themselves in the matter of coming to Christ. They ask, How can we believe? How can we come to Christ? How can we lay hold on the hope set before us? The best answer to all such inquiries is to bid men do as he did who had the withered hand. Let them not stand still, reasoning, but act. Let them not torment themselves with philosophic speculations, but cast themselves just as they are on Jesus Christ. So doing, they will find their course made clear. How or in what manner we may not be able to explain, but we may boldly make the assertion that in the act of striving to draw near to God, they shall find God drawing near to them, but that if they deliberately sit still, they must never expect to be saved. Luke 6, 12-19 Choosing of the Twelve Apostles it was at this time that he went off to the mountain to pray, and he spent the whole night in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples to him and chose twelve of them, whom he also named as apostles Simon, whom he also named Peter, and Andrew his brother, and James and John, and Philip and Bartholomew, and Matthew and Thomas, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon. Who was called the Zealot, Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. Jesus came down with them and stood on a level place, and there was a large crowd of his disciples, and a great throng of people from all Judea and Jerusalem, and the coastal region of Tyre and Sidon, who had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. 
and those who were troubled with unclean spirits were being cured. And all the people were trying to touch him, for power was coming from him and healing them all. These verses describe the appointment of our Lord Jesus Christ's twelve apostles. That appointment was the beginning of the Christian ministry. It was the first ordination and an ordination conducted by the great head of the church himself. Since the day when the events here recorded took place, there have been many thousands of ordinations. Myriads of bishops, elders, and deacons have been called to the office of the ministry, and often with far more pomp and splendor than we read of or listen to here. But never was there so solemn an ordination as this. Never were men ordained who have done so much for the church and the world as these twelve apostles. Let us observe, firstly, in these verses, that when our Lord ordained His first ministers, He did it after much prayer. We read that He went off to the mountain to pray, and He spent the whole night in prayer to God. And when day came, He called His disciples to Him and chose twelve of them, whom He also named as apostles. We need not doubt that there is a deep significance in this special mention of our Lord's praying upon this occasion. It was intended to be a perpetual lesson to the Church of Christ. It was meant to show the great importance of prayer and intercession on behalf of ministers, and particularly at the time of their ordination. Those to whom the responsible office of ordaining is committed should pray that they may not lay hands upon anyone too hastily. Those who offer themselves for ordination should pray that they may not take up work for which they are unfit and not run without being sent. The lay members of the church, not least, should pray that none may be ordained but men who are inwardly moved by the Holy Spirit. Happy are those ordinations in which all concerned have the mind that was in Christ and come together in a prayerful spirit. Do we desire to help forward the cause of pure and undefiled religion in the world? Then let us never forget to pray for ministers and especially for young men about to enter the ministry. The progress of the gospel under God will always depend much on the character and conduct of those who profess to preach it. An unconverted minister can never be expected to do good to souls. He cannot teach properly what he does not feel experientially. From such men let us pray daily that the church may be delivered. Converted ministers are God's special gift. Man cannot create them. If we would have good ministers, then we must remember our Lord's example and pray for them. Their work is heavy. Their responsibility is enormous. Their strength is small. Let us see that we support them and hold up their hands by our prayers. In this, and in too many other cases, the words of James are often sadly applicable. You do not have because you do not ask. James 4, 2 We don't ask God to raise up a constant supply of converted young men to fill our pulpits, and God chastises our neglect by withholding them. Let us observe, secondly, how little we are told of the worldly position of the first ministers of the Christian church. Four of them, we know, were fishermen. One of them, at least, was a tax collector. Most of them, probably, were Galileans. Not one of them, so far as we can see from the New Testament, was great, or rich, or noble, or highly connected. Not one was a Pharisee, or scribe, or priest, or ruler, or elder among the people. All were apparently uneducated and untrained men. Acts 4.13. All were poor. There is something deeply instructive in the fact which is now before us. It shows us that our Lord Jesus Christ's kingdom was entirely independent of help from this world. His church was not built by might, Or by power, but by the Spirit of the living God. Zechariah 4 6. 
It supplies us with an unanswerable proof of the divine origin of Christianity. A religion which turned the world upside down while its first preachers were all poor men must have been from heaven. If the apostles had possessed money to give to their hearers or been followed by armies to compel them, then an infidel might well deny that there was anything astonishing in their success. But the poverty of our Lord's disciples cuts away such arguments from beneath the infidel's feet. With a doctrine most unpalatable to the natural heart, with nothing whatsoever to bribe or compel obedience, a few lowly Galileans shook the world and changed the face of the Roman Empire. One thing alone can account for this. The gospel of Christ, which these men proclaimed, was the truth of God. Let us remember these things if we ever strive to do any work for Christ, and beware of leaning on an arm of flesh. Let us watch against the secret inclination, which is natural to all, to look to money, or learning, or high patronage, or great men's support for success. If we want to do good to souls, then we must not look first to the powers of this world. We should begin just where the Church of Christ began. We should seek pastors filled with the Holy Spirit. Let us observe, lastly, in these verses, that one whom our Lord chose to be an apostle was a false disciple and a traitor. That man was Judas Iscariot. We cannot for a moment doubt that in choosing Judas Iscariot our Lord Jesus knew well what he was doing. He who could read hearts certainly saw from the beginning that notwithstanding his profession of piety, Judas was a graceless man and would one day betray him. Why then did he appoint him to be an apostle? The question is one which has perplexed many. Yet it admits of a satisfactory answer. Like everything which our Lord did, it was done advisedly, deliberately, and with deep wisdom. It conveyed lessons of high importance to the whole church of Christ. The choice of Judas was meant to teach ministers humility. They are not to suppose that ordination necessarily conveys grace, or that once ordained they cannot err. On the contrary, they are to remember that one ordained by Christ Himself was a wretched hypocrite. Let the minister who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Again, the choice of Judas was meant to teach the lay members of the church not to make idols of ministers. They are to esteem them highly in love for their work's sake, but they are not to bow down to them as infallible and honor them with an unscriptural honor. They are to remember that ministers may be successors of Judas Iscariot as well as of Peter and Paul. The name of Judas should be a standing warning to stop regarding man, Isaiah 2.22. Let no one boast in men, 1 Corinthians 3.21. Finally, our Lord's choice of Judas was meant to teach the whole church that it must not expect to see a perfectly pure communion in the present state of things. The wheat and the tares, the good fish and the bad, will always be found side by side until the Lord comes again. It is vain to look for perfection in visible churches. We shall never find it. A Judas was found even among the apostles. Converted and unconverted people will always be found mixed together in all congregations. Luke 6, 20-26 Blessings and Woes And turning his gaze toward his disciples, he began to say, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you, and ostracize you, and insult you, and scorn your name as evil for the sake of the Son of Man. Be glad in that day, and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way their fathers used to treat the prophets. 
But woe to you who are rich, for you are receiving your comfort in full. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for their fathers used to treat the false prophets in the same way. The discourse of our Lord which we have now begun resembles in many respects His well-known Sermon on the Mount. The resemblance, in fact, is so striking that many have concluded that Luke and Matthew are reporting one and the same discourse, and that Luke is giving us, in an abridged form, what Matthew reports at length. There seems no sufficient ground for this conclusion. The occasions on which the two discourses were delivered were entirely different. Our Lord's repetition of the same great lesson in almost the same words on two different occasions is nothing extraordinary. It is unreasonable to suppose that none of His mighty teachings were ever delivered more than once. In the present case, the repetition is very significant. It shows us the great and deep importance of the lessons which the two discourses contain. Let us first notice in these verses who they are whom the Lord Jesus pronounced blessed. The list is a remarkable and startling one. It singles out those who are poor, those who hunger, those who weep, and those who are hated by man. These are the people to whom the great head of the church says, Blessed are you. We must take good heed that we don't misunderstand our Lord's meaning when we read these expressions. We must not for a moment suppose that the mere fact of being poor and hungry and sorrowful and hated by man will entitle anyone to lay claim to an interest in Christ's blessing. The poverty here spoken of is a poverty accompanied by grace. The need here spoken of is a need entailed by faithful adherence to Jesus. The afflictions here spoken of are the afflictions of the gospel. The persecution here spoken of is persecution for the Son of Man's sake. Such need and poverty and affliction and persecution were the inevitable consequences of faith in Christ at the beginning of Christianity. Thousands had to give up everything in this world because of their belief in Jesus. It was their case which Jesus had specially in view in this passage. He desired to supply them and all who suffer like them for the gospel's sake with special comfort and consolation. Let us notice, secondly, in these verses, who they are to whom our Lord addresses the solemn words, Woe to you! Once more we read expressions which at first sight seem most extraordinary. Woe to you who are rich! Woe to you who are well fed! Woe to you who laugh! Woe to you when all men speak well of you! Stronger and more cutting sayings than these cannot be found in the New Testament. Here, however, no less than in the preceding verses, we must take care that we don't misapprehend our Lord's meaning. We are not to suppose that the possession of riches and a rejoicing spirit and the good word of man are necessarily proofs that people are not Christ's disciples. Abraham and Job were rich. David and Paul had their seasons of rejoicing. Timothy was one who had a good reputation with those outside the church. All these, we know, were true servants of God. All these were blessed in this life and shall receive the blessing of the Lord in the day of His appearing. Who then are the people to whom our Lord says, Woe to you! They are the men who refuse to seek treasure in heaven because they love the good things of this world better and will not give up their money if need requires for Christ's sake. They are the men who prefer the joys and so-called happiness of this world to the joy and peace in believing, and will not risk the loss of the one in order to gain the other. They are those who love the praise of man more than the praise of God, and will turn their backs on Christ rather than not keep in with the world. These are the kind of men whom our Lord had in view when He pronounced the solemn words, Woe to you! 
He knew well that there were thousands of such people among the Jews, thousands who, notwithstanding his miracles and sermons, would love the world better than him. He knew well that there would be thousands of such in his professing church, thousands who, though convinced of the truth of the gospel, would never give up anything for its sake. To all such he delivers a solemn warning Woe to you! One mighty lesson stands out plainly on the face of these verses. May we all lay it to heart and learn wisdom. That lesson is the utter contrariety between the mind of Christ and the common opinions of mankind, the entire variance between the thoughts of Jesus and the prevailing thoughts of the world. The conditions of life which the world reckons desirable are the very conditions upon which the Lord pronounces woes. Poverty and hunger and sorrow and persecution are the very things which man labors to avoid. Riches and fullness and merriment and popularity are precisely the things which men are always struggling to attain. When we have said all in the way of qualifying, explaining, and limiting our Lord's words, there still remain two sweeping assertions which flatly contradict the current doctrine of mankind. The state of life which our Lord blesses, the world cordially dislikes. The people to whom our Lord says, Woe to you, are the very people whom the world admires, praises, and imitates. This is a solemn fact. It ought to raise great searchings of heart within us. Let us leave the whole passage with honest self inquiry and self examination. Let us ask ourselves what we think of the wonderful declarations that it contains. Can we subscribe to what our Lord says? Are we of one mind with Him? Do we really believe that poverty and persecution endured for Christ's sake are positive blessings? Do we really believe that riches and worldly enjoyments and popularity among men, when sought for more than salvation or preferred to the praise of God, are a certain curse? Do we really think that the favor of Christ with trouble and the world's persecution is better than having money and merriment and a good name among men without Christ? These are most serious questions and deserve a most serious answer. The passage before us is eminently one which tests the reality of our Christianity. The truths it contains are truths which no unconverted man can love and receive. Happy are those who have found them as truths by experience and can say Amen to all of our Lord's declarations. Whatever men may please to think, those whom Jesus blesses are blessed, and those whom Jesus does not bless will be cast out forevermore. Luke 6, 27-38 Love for Enemies But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. Whoever hits you on the cheek, offer him the other also, and whoever takes away your coat, do not withhold your shirt from him either. Give to everyone who asks of you, and whoever takes away what is yours, do not demand it back. Treat others the same way you want them to treat you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners in order to receive back the same amount. But love your enemies, and do good, and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for He Himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged and do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. 
Pardon, and you will be pardoned. Give, and it will be given to you. They will pour into your lap a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. For by your standard of measure it will be measured to you in return. The teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ in these verses is confined to one great subject. That subject is Christian charity, or love. Charity, which is the grand characteristic of the gospel, charity which is the bond of perfectness, charity without which a man is nothing in God's sight, is here fully expounded and strongly enforced. Well would it have been for the Church of Christ if its Master's precept in this passage had been more carefully studied and more diligently observed. In the first place, our Lord explains the nature and extent of Christian charity. The disciples might ask, Whom are we to love? He bids them to love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. Their love was to be like his own love towards sinners, unselfish and uninfluenced by any hope of return. The disciples might ask, What was to be the manner of this love? It was to be self sacrificing and self denying. Whoever hits you on the cheek, offer him the other also, and whoever takes away your coat, do not withhold your shirt from him either. They were to give up much and endure much for the sake of showing kindness and avoiding strife. They were to forego even their rights and submit to wrong rather than awaken angry passions and create quarrels. In this they were to be like their master, patient, meek, and lowly of heart. In the second place, our Lord lays down a golden principle for the settlement of doubtful cases. He knew well that there will always be occasions when the line of duty towards our neighbor is not clearly defined. He knew how much self-interest and private feelings will sometimes dim our perceptions of right and wrong. He supplies us with a precept of infinite wisdom for our guidance in all such cases, a precept which even infidels have been compelled to admire. Treat others the same way you want them to treat you. To do to others as they do to us, and to return evil for evil, is the standard of the world. To behave toward others as we would like others to behave toward us, Whatever their actual behavior may be, this should be the mark at which the Christian should aim. This is to walk in the steps of our blessed Saviour. If he had dealt with the world as the world dealt with him, we would all have been ruined forever in hell. In the third place, our Lord points out to his disciples the necessity of their having a higher standard of duty to their neighbor than the people of this world. He reminds them, that to love those who love them, and do good to those who do good to them, and lend to those of whom they hope to receive, is to act no better than the sinner who knows nothing of the gospel. The Christian must be altogether another style of man. His feelings of love and his deeds of kindness must be like his master's, free and gracious. He must let men see that he loves others from higher principles than the ungodly do, and that his charity is not confined to those from whom he hopes to get something in return. Anybody can show kindness and charity when he hopes to gain something by it, but such charity should never content a Christian. The man who is content with it ought to remember that his practice does not rise an inch above the level of an old Roman or Greek idolater. In the fourth place, our Lord shows his disciples that in discharging their duty to their neighbors, they should look to the example of God. If they call themselves sons of the Most High, then they should consider that their Father is kind to ungrateful and evil men, and they should learn from him to be merciful even as he is merciful. The extent of God's unacknowledged mercies to man can never be reckoned up. 
Every year he pours benefits on millions who do not honor the hand from which they come or even thank the giver of them. Yet every year these benefits are continued. Seed time and harvest, and summer and winter, shall not cease. His mercy endures forever. His loving kindness is unwearied. His compassions never fail. So ought it to be with all who profess themselves to be his children. Thanklessness and ingratitude should not make them slacken their hands from works of love and mercy. Like their Father in heaven, they should never be tired of doing good. In the last place, our Lord assures his disciples that the practice of the high standard of charity he recommends shall bring its own reward. Do not judge, and you will not be judged, and do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Pardon, and you will be pardoned. Give, and it will be given to you. And he concludes with the broad assertion that, for by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. The general meaning of these words appears to be that no man shall ever be a loser in the long run by deeds of self denying charity and love. At times he may seem to get nothing by his Christ like conduct. He may appear to reap nothing but ridicule, contempt, and injury. His kindness may sometimes tempt men to take advantage of him. His patience and forbearance may be abused. But at the last, he will always be found a gainer, often, very often, a gainer in this life, and certainly, most certainly, a gainer in the life to come. Such is the teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ about charity. Few of his sayings are so deeply heart searching as those we have now been considering. Few passages in the Bible are so truly humbling as these twelve verses. How little of the style of charity which our Lord recommends is to be seen either in the world or in the church! How common is an angry, passionate spirit, a morbid sensitiveness about what is called our rights, and a readiness to quarrel on the least occasion! How seldom we see men and women who love their enemies and do good, hoping for nothing in return, and who bless those who curse them and are kind to the unthankful and evil. Truly, we are reminded here of our Lord's words, For the gate is small, and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Matthew 7 14. How happy the world would be! If Christ's precepts were strictly obeyed. The chief causes of half the sorrows of mankind are selfishness, strife, unkindness, and lack of love. Never was there a greater mistake than to suppose that vital Christianity interferes with human happiness. It is not having too much religion, but too little, which makes people gloomy, wretched, and miserable. Wherever Christ is best known and obeyed, there will always be found most real joy and peace. Would we know anything by experience of this blessed grace of charity? Then let us seek to be joined to Christ by faith and to be taught and sanctified by His Spirit. We do not gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles. We cannot have flowers without roots or fruit without trees. In the same way, we cannot have the fruit of the Spirit without vital union with Christ and a new creation within. Such as are not born again can never really love in the manner which Christ commands. Luke 6, 39-45 A Tree and Its Fruit And he also spoke a parable to them. A blind man cannot guide a blind man, can he? Will they not both fall into a pit? A pupil is not above his teacher, but every one, after he has been fully trained, will be like his teacher. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, Brother, let me take out the speck that is in your eye, 
when you yourself do not see the log that is in your own eye. You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take out the speck that is in your brother's eye. For there is no good tree which produces bad fruit, nor, on the other hand, a bad tree which produces good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. For men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they pick grapes from a briar bush. The good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth what is good, and the evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth what is evil. For his mouth speaks from that which fills his heart. We learn in the first place from these verses the great danger of listening to false religious teachers. Our Lord compares such teachers and their hearers to the blind leading the blind, and asks the reasonable question, Will they not both fall into a pit? He goes on to confirm the importance of his warning by declaring that a pupil is not above his teacher, and the pupil cannot be expected to know more than his teacher. If a man will hear unsound instruction, then we cannot expect him to become otherwise than unsound in the faith himself. The subject which our Lord brings before us here deserves far more attention than it generally receives. The amount of evil which unsound religious teaching has brought on the church in every age is incalculable. The loss of souls which it has occasioned is fearful to contemplate. A teacher who does not know the way to heaven himself is not likely to lead his hearers to heaven. The man who hears such a teacher runs a fearful risk himself of being lost eternally. A blind man cannot guide a blind man, can he? Will they not both fall into a pit? If we would escape the danger against which our Lord warns us, then we must not neglect to test the teaching that we hear by the Holy Scriptures. We must not believe things merely because ministers say them. We must not suppose, as a matter of course, that ministers can make no mistakes. We must call to mind our Lord's words on another occasion. Beware of the false prophets. Matthew 7.15 We must remember the advice of Paul and John. Examine everything carefully. Test the spirits to see whether they are from God. 1 Thessalonians 5, 21, 1 John 4, 1. With the Bible in our hands, and the promise of guidance from the Holy Spirit to all who seek it, we shall be without excuse if our souls are led astray. The blindness of ministers is no excuse for the darkness of the people. The man who, from laziness or superstition or affected humility, refuses to distrust the teaching of the minister whom he finds set over him, however unsound it may be, will at length share his minister's portion. If people will trust blind guides, then they must not be surprised if they are led to the pit. We learn secondly from these verses that those who reprove the sins of others should strive to be of a blameless life. Our Lord teaches us this lesson by a practical saying. He shows the unreasonableness of a man finding fault with a speck or a trifling thing in a brother's eye when he himself has a log or some large and formidable object sticking in his own eye. The lesson must doubtless be received with suitable and scriptural qualifications. If no man is to teach or preach to others until he himself is faultless, then there could be no teaching or preaching in the world. The erring would never be corrected, and the wicked would never be reproved. To put such a sense as this on our Lord's words brings them into collision with other plain passages of Scripture. The main object of our Lord Jesus appears to be to impress on ministers and teachers the importance of consistency in life. The passage is a solemn warning not to contradict by our lives what we have said with our lips. The office of the preacher will never command attention unless he practices what he preaches. Ordination, university degrees, high-sounding titles, a loud profession of doctrinal purity, 
will never procure respect for a minister's sermon if his congregation sees him cleaving to ungodly habits. But there is much here which we shall all do well to remember. The lesson is one which many besides ministers should seriously consider. All heads of families, all parents, all teachers of schools, all tutors, all managers of young people should often think of the speck and the log. All such should see in our Lord's words the mighty lesson that nothing influences others as much as consistency of conduct. Let the lesson be treasured up and not forgotten. We learn, lastly, from these verses that there is only one satisfactory test of a man's religious character. That test is his conduct and conversation. The words of our Lord on this subject are clear and unmistakable. He draws an illustration from a tree and lays down the broad principle that each tree is known by its own fruit. But our Lord doesn't stop here. He proceeds further to show that a man's conversation is one indication of his state of heart. His mouth speaks from that which fills his heart. Both of these sayings are deeply important. Both should be stored up among the leading maxims of our practical Christianity. Let it be a settled principle in our religion that when a man brings forth no fruits of the Spirit, he doesn't have the Holy Spirit within him. Let us resist as a deadly error the common idea that all baptized people are born again and that all members of the church, as a matter of course, have the Holy Spirit. One simple question must be our rule. What fruit does a man bring forth? Does he repent? Does he believe with his heart on Jesus? Does he live a holy life? Does he overcome the world? Habits like these are what Scripture calls fruit. When these fruits are lacking, then it is profane to talk of a man having the Spirit of God within him. Let it be a settled principle again in our religion that when a man's general conversation is ungodly, his heart is graceless and unconverted. Let us not give way to the vulgar notion that no one can know anything of the state of another's heart, and that although men are living wickedly, they have good hearts at the bottom. Such notions are flatly contradictory to our Lord's teaching. Is the general tone of a man's communication carnal? worldly, godless, or profane? Then let us understand that this is the state of his heart. When a man's tongue is extensively wrong, it is absurd and no less than unscriptural to say that his heart is right. Let us close this passage with solemn self-inquiry and use it for the trial of our own state before God. What fruits are we bringing forth in our lives? Are they or are they not fruits of the Spirit? What kind of evidence do our words supply as to the state of our hearts? Do we talk like men whose hearts are right in the sight of God? There is no evading the doctrine laid down by our Lord in this passage. Conduct is the grand test of character. Words are one great evidence of the condition of the heart. Luke 6, 46-49 The Wise and the Foolish Builders Why do you call you me, Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and acts on them, I will show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house, who dug deep and laid a foundation on the rock. And when a flood occurred, the torrent burst against that house and could not shake it, because it had been well built. But the one who has heard and has not acted accordingly is like a man who built a house on the ground without any foundation, and the torrent burst against it, and immediately it collapsed, and the ruin of that house was great. It has been said with much truth that no sermon should conclude without some personal application to the consciences of those who hear it. The passage before us is an example of this rule, 
and a confirmation of its correctness. It is a solemn and heart searching conclusion to a most solemn discourse. Let us mark in these verses what an old and common sin is profession without practice. It is written that our Lord said, Why do you call you me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? The Son of God Himself had many followers who pretended to honor Him by calling Him Lord, but yielded no obedience to His commandments. The evil which our Lord exposes here has always existed in the church of God. It was found six hundred years before our Lord's time in the days of Ezekiel. They come to you as people come, and sit before you as my people, and hear your words, but they do not do them, for they do the lustful desires expressed by their mouth, and their heart goes after their gain. Ezekiel 33:31. It was found in the primitive church of Christ in the days of James. Prove yourselves doers of the word, he says, and not merely hearers who delude themselves. James 1, 22. It is a disease which has never ceased to prevail all over Christendom. It is a soul-ruining plague which is continually sweeping away crowds of gospel hearers down the broad way to destruction. Open sin and avowed unbelief no doubt slay their thousands, but profession without practice slays its tens of thousands. Let us settle it in our minds that no sin is so foolish and unreasonable as the sin which Jesus here denounces. Common sense alone might tell us that a mere profession and a form of Christianity can profit us nothing as long as we cleave to sin in our hearts and live unchristian lives. Let it be a fixed principle in our religion that obedience is the only sound evidence of saving faith, and that the talk of the lips is worse than useless if it is not accompanied by sanctification of the life. The man in whose heart the Holy Spirit really dwells will never be content to sit still and do nothing to show his love for Christ. Let us mark, secondly, in these verses, what a striking picture our Lord draws of the religion of the man who not only hears Christ's sayings, but also does Christ's will. He compares him to one building a house who dug deep and laid a foundation on the rock. Such a man's religion may cost him much. Like the house built on a rock, it may entail on him pains, labor, and self denial. To lay aside pride and self righteousness, to crucify the rebellious flesh, to put on the mind of Christ, to take up the cross daily, to count all things but loss for Christ's sake, all this may be hard work. But, like the house built on the rock, such religion will stand. The streams of affliction may beat violently upon it, and the floods of persecution dash fiercely against it, but it will not give way. The Christianity which combines good profession and good practice is a building that will not fall. Let us mark, lastly, in these verses what a mournful picture our Lord draws of the religion of the man who hears Christ's sayings but does not obey them. He compares him to one who built a house on the ground without any foundation. Such a man's religion may look well for a season. An ignorant eye may detect no difference between the possessor of such a religion and a true Christian. Both may worship in the same church. Both may use the same ordinances. Both may profess the same faith. The outward appearance of the house built on the rock and the house without any solid foundation may be much the same. But the day of trial and affliction is the test to which the religion of the mere outward professor cannot stand. When storm and tempest beat on the house which has no foundation, then the walls which looked well in sunshine and fair weather are sure to fall to the ground. The Christianity which consists of merely hearing religion taught without doing anything is a building which must finally fall. Great indeed will be the ruin.
there is no loss like the loss of an eternal soul. This passage of Scripture is one which ought to call up in our minds peculiarly solemn feelings. The pictures it presents are pictures of things which are daily going on around us. On every side we shall see thousands building for eternity on a mere outward profession of Christianity. They are striving to shelter their souls under false refuges. They are contenting themselves with a name to live while they are dead, and with a form of godliness without the power. Few indeed are the builders upon rocks, and great is the ridicule and persecution which they have to endure. Many are the builders upon sand, and mighty are the disappointments and failures which are the only result of their work. Surely, if ever there was proof that man is fallen and blind in spiritual things, it may be seen in the fact that the majority of every generation of baptized people persist in building on sand. What is the foundation on which we ourselves are building? This, after all, is the question that concerns our souls. Are we upon the rock, or are we upon the sand? We love, perhaps, to hear the gospel. We approve of all its leading doctrines. We assent to all its statements of truth about Christ and the Holy Spirit, about justification and sanctification, about repentance and faith, about conversion and holiness, about the Bible and prayer. But what are we doing? What is the daily practical history of our lives in public and private, in the family and in the world? Can it be said of us that we not only hear Christ's sayings, but that we also practice them? The hour comes, and will soon be here, when questions like these must be asked and answered, whether we like them or not. The day of sorrow and bereavement of sickness and death, will make it plain whether we are on the rock or on the sand. Let us remember this presently, and not trifle with our souls. Let us strive so to believe, and so to live, so to hear Christ's voice, and so to follow Him, that when the flood arises, and the streams beat over us, our house may stand, and not fall. Chapter 7 Luke 7, 1 to 10. The Faith of the Centurion. When he had completed all his discourse in the hearing of the people, he went to Capernaum, and a centurion's slave, who was highly regarded by him, was sick and about to die. When he heard about Jesus, he sent some Jewish elders, asking him to come and save the life of his slave. When they came to Jesus, they earnestly implored him, saying, He is worthy for you to grant this to him, for he loves our nation, and it was he who built us our synagogue. Now Jesus started on his way with them, and when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself further, for I am not worthy for you to come under my roof. For this reason I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But just say the word, and my servant will be healed for I also am a man placed under authority, with soldiers under me, and I say to this one, Go, and he goes, and to another, Come, and he comes, and to my slave, Do this, and he does it. Now when Jesus heard this, he marveled at him, and turned and said to the crowd that was following him, I say to you, not even in Israel have I found such great faith. When those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the slave in good health. These verses describe the miraculous cure of a sick man. A centurion, or officer in the Roman army, appeals to our Lord on behalf of his servant and obtains what he requests. A greater miracle of healing than this is nowhere recorded in the Gospels. Without even seeing the sufferer, without touch of hand or look of eye, our Lord restores a dying man to health by a single word. He speaks, and the sick man is cured. He commands, and the deadly disease departs. 
we read of no prophet or apostle who wrought miracles in this manner. We see here the finger of God. We should notice in these verses the kindness of the centurion. It is a part of his character which appears in three ways. We see his kindness in his treatment of his servant. He cares for him tenderly when sick and takes pains to have him restored to health. We see his kindness again in his feeling towards the Jewish people. He did not despise them as other Gentiles commonly did. The elders of the Jews bear this strong testimony, He loves our nation. We see his kindness, lastly, in his liberal support of the Jewish place of worship at Capernaum. He did not love Israel with word or with tongue, but in deed. The messengers he sent to our Lord supported their petition by saying, It was he who built us our synagogue. Now, where did the centurion learn this kindness? How can we account for one who was a heathen by birth and a soldier by profession showing such a spirit as this? Habits of mind like these were not likely to be gathered from heathen teaching or promoted by the society of a Roman camp. Greek and Latin philosophy would not recommend them. Tribunes, consuls, prefects, and emperors would not encourage them. There is but one account of the matter. The centurion was what he was by the grace of God. The Spirit had opened the eyes of his understanding and put a new heart within him. His knowledge of divine things, no doubt, was very dim. His religious views were probably built on a very imperfect acquaintance with the Old Testament scriptures. But whatever light from above he had, it influenced his life and one result of it was the kindness which is recorded in this passage. Let us learn a lesson from the centurion's example. Let us, like him, show kindness to everyone with whom we have to do. Let us strive to have an eye ready to see, and a hand ready to help, and a heart ready to feel, and a will ready to do good to all. Let us be ready to weep with those who weep, and rejoice with those who rejoice. This is one way to recommend our religion and make it beautiful before men. Kindness is a grace that all can understand. This is one way to be like our blessed Saviour. If there is one feature in Jesus' character more notable than another, it is His unwearied kindness and love. This is one way to be happy in the world and see good days. Kindness always brings its own reward. The kind person will seldom be without friends. We should notice, secondly, in this passage, the humility of the centurion. It appears in his remarkable message to our Lord when he was not far from his house I am not worthy for you to come under my roof. For this reason, I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. Such expressions are a striking contrast to the language used by the elders of the Jews. He is worthy, said they, for you to grant this to him. I am not worthy, says the good centurion, for you to come under my roof. Humility like this is one of the strongest evidences of the indwelling of the Spirit of God. We know nothing of humility by nature, for we are all born proud. To convince us of sin, to show us our own vileness and corruption, to put us in our right place, to make us lowly and self-abased, these are among the principal works which the Holy Spirit works in the soul of man. Few of our Lord's sayings are so often repeated as the one which closes the parable of the Pharisees and the tax collector. Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. Luke 18, 14. To have great gifts and do great works for God is not given to all believers, but all believers ought to strive to clothe themselves with humility. We should notice, thirdly, in this passage, the centurion's faith. 
we have a beautiful example of it in the request that he made to our Lord. Just say the word, and my servant will be healed. He thinks it needless for our Lord to come to the place where his servant lay dying. He regards our Lord as one possessing authority over diseases as complete as his own authority over his soldiers, or a Roman emperor's authority over himself. He believes that a word of command from Jesus is sufficient to send sickness away. He asks to see no sign or wonder. He declares his confidence that Jesus is an almighty master and king, and that diseases, like obedient servants, will at once depart at his orders. Faith like this was indeed rare when the Lord Jesus was upon earth. What sign do you show as your authority? was the demand of the sneering Pharisees. To see something sensational was the great desire of the multitudes who crowded after our Lord. No wonder that we read the remarkable words, Jesus marveled at him, and said unto the people, Not even in Israel have I found such great faith. None ought to have been so believing as the children of those who were led through the wilderness and brought into the promised land. But the last was first, and the first last. The faith of a Roman soldier proved stronger than that of the Jews. Let us not forget to walk in the steps of this blessed spirit of faith which the centurion here exhibited. Our eyes do not yet behold the book of life. We see not our Saviour pleading for us at God's right hand. But do we have Christ's promises? Then let us rest on them and fear nothing. Let us not doubt that every word that Christ has spoken shall be made good. The word of Christ is a sure foundation. He who leans upon it shall never be confounded. Believers shall all be found pardoned, justified, and glorified at the last day. Jesus says so, and therefore it shall be done. We should notice, finally, in these verses, the advantage of being connected with godly families. We need no clearer proof of this than the case of the centurion's servant. We see him cared for in sickness. We see him restored to health through his master's intercession. We see him brought under Christ's notice through his master's faith. Who can tell but the outcome of the whole history was the conversion and salvation of the man's soul? It was a happy day for that servant when he first began service in such a household. Well would it be for the church if the benefits of connection with the household of the faith were more frequently remembered by professing Christians. Often, far too often, a Christian parent will hastily place his son in a position where his soul can get no good simply for the sake of mere worldly advantage. Often, far too often, a Christian servant will seek a new place where true religion is not valued for the sake of a few more wages. These things ought not to be so. In all our moves, our first thought should be the interest of our souls. In all our settlements, our chief desire should be to be connected with godly people. In all our purposes and planning, for ourselves or our children, one question should ever be uppermost in our minds. What shall it profit us to gain the whole world and lose our own souls? Good situations, as they are called, are often godless situations, and ruin to all eternity those who take them. Luke 7, 11-17 Jesus raises a widow's son. Soon afterwards he went to a city called Nain, and his disciples were going along with him, accompanied by a large crowd. Now as he approached the gate of the city, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a sizable crowd from the city was with her. When the Lord saw her, he felt compassion for her, and said to her, Do not weep. And he came up and touched the coffin, and the bearers came to a halt. And he said, 
Young man, I say to you, arise. The dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. Fear gripped them all, and they began glorifying God, saying, A great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. This report concerning him went out all over Judea and in all the surrounding district. The wondrous event described in these verses is only recorded in Luke's Gospel. It is one of the three great instances of our Lord restoring a dead person to life, and, like the raising of Lazarus and the ruler's daughter, is rightly regarded as one of the greatest miracles which he wrought on earth. In all three cases, we see an exercise of divine power. In each, we see an indisputable proof that the Prince of Peace is stronger than the King of Terrors, and that though death, the last enemy, is mighty, he is not as mighty as the sinner's friend. We learn from these verses what sorrow sin has brought into the world. We are told of a funeral at Nain. All funerals are mournful things. But it is difficult to imagine a funeral more mournful than the one here described. It was the funeral of a young man, and that young man the only son of his mother, and that mother a widow. There is not an item in the whole story which is not full of misery. And all this misery, be it remembered, was brought into the world by sin. God did not create sin at the beginning when he made all things very good. Sin is the cause of it all. Sin entered into the world when Adam fell, and so death spread to all men. Romans 5.12 Let us never forget this great truth. The world around us is full of sorrow. Sickness and pain and infirmity and poverty and labor and trouble abound on every side. From one end of the world to the other, the history of families is full of lamentation and weeping and mourning and woe. And from where does it all come? Sin is the fountain and root to which all must be traced. There would have been neither tears nor tears, nor illness nor deaths, nor funerals in the earth if there had been no sin. We must bear this sinful and sorrowful state of things patiently. We cannot alter it. We may thank God that there is a remedy in the gospel and that this present life is not all there is. But in the meantime, let us lay the blame at the right door. Let us lay the blame on sin. How much we ought to hate sin! Instead of loving it, cleaving to it, dallying with it, Excusing it or playing with it, we ought to hate it with a deadly hatred. Sin is the great murderer and thief and pestilence and nuisance of this world. Let us make no peace with it. Let us wage a ceaseless warfare against it. It is the abominable thing which God hates. Happy is he who is of one mind with God and can say, I abhor that which is evil. Romans 12, 9. We learn secondly from these verses how deep is the compassion of our Lord Jesus Christ's heart. We see this beautifully brought out in his behavior at this funeral in Nain. He meets the mournful procession accompanying the young man to his grave and is moved with compassion at the sight. He doesn't wait to be requested to help. His help appears to have been neither asked for nor expected. He saw the weeping mother and knew well what her feelings must have been, for he had been born of a woman himself. At once he addressed her with words both startling and touching. He said unto her, Do not weep. A few more seconds and the meaning of his words became plain. The widow's son was restored alive to her. Her darkness was turned into light and her sorrow into joy. Our Lord Jesus Christ never changes. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His heart is still as compassionate as when he was upon earth. 
His sympathy with sufferers is still as strong. Let us bear this in mind and take comfort in it. There is no friend or comforter who can be compared to Christ. In all our days of darkness, which must be many, let us first turn for consolation to Jesus, the Son of God. He will never fail us, never disappoint us, and never refuse to take interest in our sorrows. He still lives, who made the widow's heart sing for joy in the gate of Nain. He still lives, to receive all laboring and heavy laden ones if they will only come to him by faith. He still lives to heal the brokenhearted and be a friend who sticks closer than a brother. And he lives to do greater things than these one day. He lives to come again to his people that they may weep no more at all, and that all tears may be forever wiped from their eyes. We learn lastly from these verses the almighty power of our Lord Jesus Christ. We can ask no proof of this more striking than the miracle which we are now considering. He gives life back to a dead man with a few words. He speaks to a cold corpse, and at once it becomes a living person. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the heart, the lungs, the brain, the senses again resume their work and discharge their duty. Young man, he cried, I say to you, arise. That voice was a voice mighty in operation. At once, the dead man sat up and began to speak. Let us see in this mighty miracle a pledge of that solemn event, the general resurrection. That same Jesus who here raised one dead person shall raise all mankind at the last day. An hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come forth, those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life, those who committed the evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. John 5, 28-29 When the trumpet sounds and Christ commands, there can be no refusal or escape. All must appear before His judgment bar in their bodies. All shall be judged according to their works. Let us see, furthermore, in this mighty miracle, a lively emblem of Christ's power to give life to those dead in sins. In Him is life. He gives life to whom He will. John 5.21 He can raise to a new life souls that are now dead in worldliness and sin. He can say to hearts that are now corrupt and lifeless, Arise to repentance and live in the service of God. Let us never despair of any soul. Let us pray for our children and never lose heart. Our young men and our young women may be long traveling on the way to ruin. But let us pray on. Who can tell but he who met the funeral at the gates of Nain may yet meet our unconverted children and say with almighty power, Young man, arise. With Christ, nothing is impossible. Let us leave the passage with a solemn recollection of those things which are yet to happen at the last day. We read that fear gripped them all at Nain when the young man was raised. What then shall be the feelings of mankind when all the dead are raised at once? The unconverted man may well fear that day. He is not prepared to meet God. But the true Christian has nothing to fear. He may lay himself down and sleep peacefully in his grave. In Christ he is complete and safe, and when he rises again he shall see God's face in peace. Luke 7, 18-23 Jesus and John the Baptist the disciples of John reported to him about all these things. Summoning two of his disciples, John sent them to the Lord, saying, Are you the expected one, or do we look for someone else? When the men came to him, they said, John Baptist has sent us to you to ask, Are you the expected one, or do we look for someone else? 
At that very time he cured many people of diseases and afflictions and evil spirits, and he gave sight to many who were blind. And he answered and said to them, Go and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, the poor have the gospel preached to them. Blessed is he who does not take offense at me. The message which John the Baptist sent to our Lord in these verses is particularly instructing when we consider the circumstances under which it was sent. John the Baptist was now a prisoner in the hands of Herod. John, while imprisoned, heard of the works of Christ. Matthew 11, 2. John's life was drawing to a close. His opportunities for active usefulness were ended. A long imprisonment or a violent death were the only prospects before him. Yet, even in these dark days, we see this man maintaining his old ground as a witness for Christ. He is the same man that he was when he cried, Behold the Lamb of God! To testify of Christ was his continual work as a preacher at liberty. To send men to Christ was one of his last works as a prisoner in chains. We should mark in these verses the wise forethought which John exhibited toward his disciples before he left the world. He sent some of them to Jesus with a message of inquiry Are you the expected one, or do we look for someone else? He doubtless calculated that they would receive such an answer as would make an indelible impression on their minds, and he was right. They got an answer in deeds as well as in words. They received an answer which probably produced a deeper effect than any arguments which they could have heard from their master's lips. We can easily imagine that John the Baptist must have felt much concern about the future course of his disciples. He knew their ignorance and weakness in the faith. He knew how natural it was for them to regard the disciples of Jesus with feelings of jealousy and envy. He knew how likely it was that a petty party spirit would creep in among them and make them keep aloof from Christ when their own master was dead and gone. Against this unhappy state of things, he makes provision, as far as possible, while he is yet alive. He sends some of them to Jesus that they may see for themselves what kind of teacher he is and not reject him unseen and unheard. He takes care to supply them with the strongest evidence that our Lord was indeed the Messiah. Like his divine Master, having loved his disciples, he loved them to the end. And now, perceiving that he must soon leave them, he strives to leave them in the best of hands. He does his best to make them acquainted with Christ. What an instructive lesson we have here for ministers and parents and heads of families for all, in short, who have anything to do with the souls of others. We should endeavor, like John the Baptist, to provide for the future spiritual welfare of those we leave behind when we die. We should often remind them that we cannot always be with them. We should often urge them to beware of the broad way when we are taken from them and they are left alone in the world. We should spare no pains to make all who in any way look up to us acquainted with Christ. Happy are those ministers and parents whose consciences can testify on their deathbeds that they have told their hearers and children to go to Jesus and follow Him. We should mark secondly in these verses the peculiar answer which the disciples of John received from our Lord. We are told that, At that very time he cured many people of diseases and afflictions and evil spirits, and he gave sight to many who were blind. And then he said, Go and report to John what you have seen and heard. He makes no formal declaration that he is the Messiah who was to come. He simply supplies the messengers with facts to repeat to their master and sends them away. He knew well how John the Baptist would employ these facts. He would say to his disciples, Behold, in him who worked these miracles, the prophet greater than Moses, this is the one whom you must hear and follow when I am dead. This is indeed the Christ. 
Our Lord's reply to John's disciples contains a great practical lesson which we shall do well to remember. It teaches us that the right way to test the value of churches and ministers is to examine the works they do for God and the fruits they bring forth. Would we know whether a church is true and trustworthy? Would we know whether a minister is really called of God and sound in the faith? We must apply the old rule of Scripture. You will know them by their fruits. As Christ would be known by His works and doctrine, so must true churches of Christ and true ministers of Christ be known. When the dead in sin are not quickened, and the blind are not restored to sight, and the poor have no glad tidings proclaimed to them, then we may generally suspect that Christ's presence is lacking. Where He is, He will be seen and heard. Where He is, there will be more than empty profession, forms, ceremonies, and a show of religion. There will be actual, visible, saving work in hearts and lives. We should mark, lastly, in these verses, the solemn warning which our Lord gave to John's disciples. He knew the danger they were in. He knew that they were disposed to question his claim to be the Messiah because of his lowly appearance. They saw no signs of a king about him, no riches, no royal apparel, no guards, no courtiers, and no crown. They only saw a man, to all appearances as poor as any one of themselves, attended by a few fishermen and publicans. Their pride may have rebelled at the idea that such a one as this could be the long-awaited Messiah. It seemed incredible. There must be some mistake. Such thoughts as these, in all probability, passed through their minds. Our Lord read their hearts and dismissed them with a searching caution. Blessed, he said, is he who does not take offence at me. The warning is one that is just as needful now as it was when it was delivered. So long as the world stands, Christ and his gospel will be a stumbling block to many. To hear that we are all lost and guilty sinners and cannot save ourselves, to hear that we must give up our own righteousness and trust in one who was crucified between two thieves, to hear that we must be content to enter heaven side by side with wicked sinners and harlots and to owe all our salvation to free grace, this is always offensive to the natural man. Our proud hearts do not like it. We are offended. Let the caution of these verses sink down deeply into our memories. Let us take heed that we are not offended by Jesus or His message. Let us beware of being offended either by the humbling doctrines of the gospel or the holy practice which it enjoins on those who receive it. Secret pride is one of the worst enemies of man. It will prove at last to have been the ruin of thousands of souls. Thousands will be found to have had the offer of salvation but to have rejected it. They did not like the terms. They would not stoop to enter through the narrow gate. They would not humbly come as sinners to the throne of grace. In a word, they were offended. And then will appear the deep meaning in our Lord's words, Blessed is he who does not take offense at me. Luke 7, 24-30 Jesus' Testimony to John the Baptist When the messengers of John had left, he began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Those who are splendidly clothed and live in luxury are found in royal palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I say to you, and one who is more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way before you. I say to you, among those born of women there is no one greater than John, yet he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. When all the people and the tax collectors heard this, 
they acknowledged God's justice, having been baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected God's purpose for themselves, not having been baptized by John. The first point that demands our notice in this passage is the tender care which Jesus takes of the characters of his faithful servants. He defended the reputation of John the Baptist as soon as his messengers departed. He saw that the people around him were apt to think lightly of John, partly because he was in prison and partly because of the inquiry which his disciples had just brought. He pleads the cause of his absent friend in warm and strong language. He bids his hearers to dismiss from their minds their unworthy doubts and suspicions about John. He tells them that he was no wavering and unstable character, that he was no mere reed shaken by the wind. He tells them that John was no mere courtier around king's palaces, though circumstances at the end of his ministry had brought him into connection with King Herod. He declares to them that John was more than a prophet for he was a prophet who had been the subject of prophecy himself. And he winds up his testimony by the remarkable saying that, Among those born of women there is no one greater than John. There is something deeply touching in these sayings of our Lord on behalf of his absent servant. The position which John now occupied as Herod's prisoner was widely different from that which he occupied at the beginning of his ministry. At one time he was the best known and most popular preacher of his day. There was a time when Jerusalem was going out to him and all Judea and all the district around the Jordan, and they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River. Matthew 3, 5-6 Now he was an obscure prisoner in Herod's prison, deserted, friendless, and with nothing before him but death. But the lack of man's favor is no proof that God is displeased. John the Baptist had one friend who never failed him, and never forsook him, a friend whose kindness did not ebb and flow like John's popularity, but was always the same. That friend was our Lord Jesus Christ. There is comfort here for all believers who are defamed, slandered, and falsely accused. Few are the children of God who do not suffer in this way at one time or another. The accuser of our brethren knows well that character is one of the points in which he can most easily wound a Christian. He knows well that slander is easily called into existence, greedily received and propagated, and seldom entirely silenced. Lies and false reports are the chosen weapons by which he labors to injure the Christian's usefulness, and destroy his peace. But let all who are assaulted in their characters rest in the thought that they have an advocate in heaven who knows all their sorrows. That same Jesus who maintained the character of his imprisoned servant before a Jewish crowd will never desert any of his people. The world may frown on them, their names may be cast out as evil by man, but Jesus never changes. He will one day plead their cause before the whole world. The second point which demands our attention in these verses is the vast superiority of the privileges enjoyed by believers under the New Testament compared to those of believers under the Old Testament. This is a lesson which appears to be taught by one expression used by our Lord regarding John the Baptist. After commending his graces and gifts, he adds these remarkable words, He who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than John. Our Lord's meaning in using this expression appears to be simply this. He declares that the spiritual light of the least disciple who lived after his crucifixion and resurrection would be far greater than that of John Baptist who died before those mighty events took place. The weakest believing hearer of Paul would understand things by the light of Christ's death on the cross, which John the Baptist could never have explained. Great as that holy man was in faith and courage, the humblest Christian would, in one sense, be greater than him. 
Greater in grace and works he certainly could not be. But beyond doubt, he would be greater in privileges and knowledge. Such an expression as this should teach all Christians to be deeply thankful for Christianity. We have probably very little idea of the wide difference between the religious knowledge of the best instructed Old Testament believer and the knowledge of one familiar with the New Testament. We little know how many blessed truths of the gospel were at one time seen through a glass darkly, which now appear to us as plain as noonday. Our very familiarity with the gospel makes us blind to the extent of our privileges. We can hardly realize at this time how many glorious truths of our faith were brought out in their full proportions by Christ's death on the cross and were never unveiled and understood until his blood was shed. The hopes of John the Baptist and Paul were undoubtedly one and the same. Both were led by one Spirit. Both knew their sinfulness. Both trusted in the Lamb of God. But we cannot suppose that John the Baptist could have given as full an account of the way of salvation as Paul. Both looked at the same object of faith, but one saw it afar off and could only describe it generally. The other saw it close at hand and could describe the reason of his hope particularly. Let us learn to be more thankful. The child who knows the story of the cross possesses a key to religious knowledge which patriarchs and prophets never enjoyed. The last point which demands our attention in these verses is the solemn declaration which it makes about man's power to injure his own soul. We read that the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected God's purpose for themselves. The meaning of these words appears to be simply this, that they rejected God's offer of salvation. They refused to avail themselves of the door of repentance which was offered to them by John the Baptist's preaching. In short, they fulfilled to the very letter the words of Solomon, You neglected all my counsel and did not want my reproof. Proverbs 1.25 That every man possesses a power to ruin himself forever in hell is a great foundational truth of Scripture and a truth which ought to be continually before our minds. Impotent and weak as we all are for everything which is good, we are all naturally potent for that which is evil. By continued impenitence and unbelief, by persevering in the love and practice of sin, by pride, self-will, laziness, and determined love of the world, we may bring upon ourselves everlasting destruction. And if this takes place, we shall find that we have no one to blame but ourselves. God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Christ wants to gather men to his bosom if they will only be gathered. Matthew 23:37. The fault will lie at man's own door. Those who are lost will find that they have lost their own souls. Mark 8:36. What are we doing ourselves? This is the chief question that the passage should suggest to our minds. Are we likely to be lost or saved? Are we in the narrow path to heaven or on the broad way to hell? Have we received that gospel which we hear into our hearts? Do we really live by that Bible which we profess to believe? Or are we daily traveling towards the bottomless pit and ruining our own souls? It is a painful thought that the Pharisees are not the only people who reject God's purpose for themselves. There are thousands of people who call themselves Christians who are continually doing the very same thing. Luke 7, 31-35 Jesus exposes the unreasonableness of unbelief. To what then shall I compare the men of this generation, and what are they like? They are like children who sit in the marketplace and call to one another, and they say, We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not weep. 
For John the Baptist has come eating no bread and drinking no wine, and you say, He has a demon. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, Behold, a gluttonous man and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by all her children. We learn in the first place from these verses that the hearts of unconverted men are often desperately perverse as well as wicked. Our Lord brings out this lesson in a remarkable comparison describing the generation of men among whom He lived while He was on earth. He compares them to children. He says that children at play were not more wayward, perverse, and hard to please than the Jews of His day. Nothing would satisfy them. They were always finding fault. Whatever ministry God employed among them, they took exception to it. With whatever messenger God sent among them, they were not pleased. First came John the Baptist, living a retired, ascetic, self denying life. At once the Jews said, He has a demon. After him, the Son of Man came eating and drinking and adopting habits of social life like the ordinary run of men. At once the Jews accused him of being a glutton and a drunkard. In short, it became evident that the Jews were determined to receive no message from God at all. Their pretended objections were only a cloak to cover over their hatred of God's truth. What they really disliked was not so much God's ministers as God Himself. Perhaps we read or listen to this account with wonder and surprise. We think that never were men so wickedly unreasonable as these Jews were. But are we sure that their conduct is not continually repeated among Christians? Do we not know that the same thing is continually going on around us at the present day? As strange as it may seem at first sight, the generation which will neither dance when their companions play the flute, nor weep when they sing a dirge, is only too numerous in the Church of Christ. Is it not a fact that many who strive to serve Christ faithfully and walk closely with God find their neighbors and relatives always dissatisfied with their conduct? No matter how holy and consistent their lives may be, they are always thought wrong. If they withdraw entirely from the world and live like John the Baptist, a retired and ascetic life, then the cry is raised that they are exclusive, narrow minded, sour spirited, and self righteous. If, on the other hand, they go much into society and endeavor as far as they can to take interest in their neighbor's pursuits, the remark is soon made that they are no better than other people and have no more real religion than those who make no profession at all. Treatment like this is only too common. Few are the decided Christians who do not know it by bitter experience. The servants of God in every age, whatever they do, are blamed. The plain truth is that the natural heart of man hates God. The carnal mind is enmity against God. It dislikes His law, His gospel, and His people. It will always find some excuse for not believing and obeying. The doctrine of repentance is too strict for it. The doctrine of faith and grace is too easy for it. John the Baptist goes too much out of the world. Jesus Christ goes too much into the world. And so the heart of man excuses itself for sitting still in its sins. All of this must not surprise us. We must make up our minds to find unconverted people as perverse, unreasonable, and hard to please as the Jews of our Lord's time. We must give up the vain idea of trying to please everybody. The thing is impossible, and the attempt is a mere waste of time. We must be content to walk in Christ's steps and let the world say what it likes. Do what we will, we shall never satisfy it or silence its bitter remarks. The world first found fault with John the Baptist and then with his blessed Master. And it will go on quibbling and finding fault with that Master's disciples so long as one of them is left upon earth. We learn, secondly, from these verses 
that the wisdom of God's ways is always recognized and acknowledged by those who are wise-hearted. This is a lesson which is taught in a sentence of somewhat obscure character. Wisdom is vindicated by all her children. But it seems difficult to extract any other meaning from the words by fair and consistent interpretation. The idea which our Lord desired to impress upon us appears to be that though the vast majority of the Jews were hardened and unreasonable, there were some who were not, and though multitudes saw no wisdom in the ministry of John the Baptist and himself, there were a chosen few who did. Those few were the children of wisdom. Those few, by their lives and obedience, declared their full conviction that God's ways of dealing with the Jews were wise and right, and that John the Baptist and the Lord Jesus were both worthy of all honor. In short, they vindicated God's wisdom and so proved themselves to be truly wise. This saying of our Lord about the generation among whom he lived describes a state of things which will always be found in the Church of Christ. In spite of the quibbles, sneers, objections, and unkind remarks with which the gospel is received by the majority of mankind, there will always be some in every country who will assent to it and obey it with delight. There will never be lacking a little flock which hears the voice of the shepherd gladly and counts all his ways to be right. The people of this world may mock the gospel and pour contempt on the lives of believers. They may count their practice madness and see no wisdom nor beauty in their ways. But God will take care that He has a believing people in every age. There will be always some who will assert the perfect excellence of the doctrines and requirements of the gospel and who will vindicate the wisdom of Him who sent it. And these, however much the world may despise them, are those whom Jesus calls wise. They have been given the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. 2 Timothy 3.15 Let us ask ourselves as we leave this passage whether we deserve to be called children of wisdom. Have we been taught by the Spirit to know the Lord Jesus Christ? Have the eyes of our understanding been opened? Have we the wisdom that comes from above? If we are truly wise, then let us not be ashamed to confess our Master before men. Let us boldly declare that we approve the whole of His gospel, all of its doctrines, and all of its requirements. We may find few with us and many against us. The world may laugh at us and count our wisdom no better than folly, but such laughter is but for a moment. The hour is coming when the few who have confessed Christ and justified His ways before men shall be confessed and vindicated by Him before His Father and the holy angels. Luke 7, 36-50 Jesus Anointed by a Sinful Woman Now one of the Pharisees was requesting him to dine with him, and he entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And there was a woman in the city who was a sinner, and when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster phial of perfume, and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears, and kept wiping them with the hair of her head and kissing his feet and anointing them with the perfume. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who and what sort of person this woman is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. And Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he replied, Say it, teacher. A moneylender had two debtors, one owed five hundred denarii, and the other fifty. When they were unable to repay, he graciously forgave them both. So which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, You have judged correctly. Turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? 
I entered your house, you gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she anointed my feet with perfume. For this reason I say to you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven, for she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little. Then he said to her, Your sins have been forgiven. Those who were reclining at the table with him began to say to themselves, Who is this man who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. The deeply interesting narrative contained in these verses is only found in the Gospel of Luke. In order to see the full beauty of the story, we should read or listen to, in connection with it, the eleventh chapter of Matthew. We shall then discover the striking fact that the woman whose conduct is here recorded most likely owed her conversion to the well known words, Come to me, all who weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That wondrous invitation, in all human probability, was the means of the saving of her soul, and gave her that sense of peace for which we see her so grateful. A full offer of free pardon is generally God's chosen instrument for bringing sinners to repentance. We see in this passage that men may show some outward respect to Christ and yet remain unconverted. The Pharisee before us is a case in point. He showed our Lord Jesus Christ more respect than many did. He even asked Jesus to have dinner with him. Yet all this time he was profoundly ignorant of the nature of Christ's gospel. His proud heart secretly revolted at the sight of a poor, contrite sinner being allowed to wash our Lord's feet. And even the hospitality he showed appears to have been cold and ungenerous. Our Lord himself says, You gave me no water for my feet. You gave me no kiss. You did not anoint my head with oil. In short, in all that the Pharisee did, there was one great defect. There was outward civility, but there was no heart love. We shall do well to remember the case of this Pharisee. It is quite possible to have a decent form of religion and yet to know nothing of the gospel of Christ. It is possible to treat Christianity with respect and yet to be utterly blind to its cardinal doctrines. It is quite possible to behave with great correctness and propriety at church, and yet to hate justification by faith and salvation by grace with a deadly hatred. Do we really feel affection toward the Lord Jesus? Can we say, Lord, you know all things, you know that I love you? Have we cordially embraced his whole gospel? Are we willing to enter heaven side by side with the chief of sinners? and to owe all our hopes to sovereign grace? These are questions which we ought to consider. If we cannot answer them satisfactorily, then we are in no respect better than Simon the Pharisee, and our Lord might say to us, I have something to say to you. We see in the next place in this passage that grateful love is the secret of doing much for Christ. The penitent woman in the story before us showed far more honor to our Lord than the Pharisee had done. She stood behind him at his feet weeping. She wet his feet with her tears. She kept wiping them with the hair of her head. She was kissing his feet and anointing them with the perfume. No stronger proofs of reverence and respect could she have given and the secret of her giving such proofs was love. She loved our Lord, and she thought nothing too much to do for Him. She felt deeply grateful to our Lord, and she thought no mark of gratitude too costly to bestow on Him. More doing for Christ is the universal demand of all the churches. It is the one point on which all are agreed. 
All desire to see among Christians more good works, more self-denial, more practical obedience to Christ's commands. But what will produce these things? Nothing, nothing but love. There never will be more done for Christ until there is more hearty love for Christ Himself. The fear of punishment, the desire of reward, the sense of duty are all useful arguments in their way to persuade men to holiness, but they are all weak and powerless until a man loves Christ. Once let that mighty principle get hold of a man, and you will see his whole life changed. Let us never forget this. However much the world may sneer at feelings in religion, and however false or unhealthy religious feelings may sometimes be, the great truth still remains that love for Jesus is the secret of doing for Jesus. The heart must be engaged for Christ, or the hands will soon hang down. The affections must be enlisted into His service, or our obedience will soon stand still. It will always be the loving workman who will do most in the Lord's vineyard. We see, lastly, in this passage, That a sense of having our sins forgiven is the mainspring and lifeblood of love for Christ. This, beyond doubt, was the lesson which our Lord wished Simon the Pharisee to learn when he told him the story of the two debtors. One owed five hundred denarii and the other fifty. Both were unable to repay, and both were forgiven freely. And then came the searching question. Which of them will love him more? Here was the true explanation, our Lord told Simon, of the deep love which the penitent woman before him had displayed. Her many tears, her deep affection, her public reverence, her action in anointing his feet, were all traceable to one cause. She had been much forgiven, and so she loved much. Her love for Jesus was the effect of her forgiveness, not the cause, the consequence of her forgiveness, not the condition, the result of her forgiveness, not the reason, the fruit of her forgiveness, not the root. Would the Pharisee know why this woman showed so much love? It was because she felt much forgiven. Would he know why he himself had shown his guest so little love? It was because he felt he was under no obligation to Jesus. He had no consciousness of having obtained forgiveness nor any sense of debt to Christ. Forever let the mighty principle laid down by our Lord in this passage abide in our memories and sink down into our hearts. It is one of the great cornerstones of the whole gospel. It is one of the master keys to unlock the secrets of the kingdom of God. The only way to make men holy is to teach and preach free and full forgiveness through Jesus Christ. The secret of being holy ourselves is to know and feel that Christ has pardoned our sins. To know that we are justified and at peace with God is the only root that will bear the fruit of holiness. Forgiveness must go before sanctification. We shall do nothing until we are reconciled to God. This is the first step in religion. We must work from life and not for life. Our best works before we are justified are little better than splendid sins. We must live by faith in the Son of God, and then and not until then we shall walk in His ways. The heart that has experienced the pardoning love of Christ is the heart that loves Christ and strives to glorify Him. Let us leave the passage with a deep sense of our Lord Jesus Christ's amazing mercy and compassion for the chief of sinners. Let us see in His kindness to the woman of whom we have been reading and hearing about an encouragement to anyone, however wicked he may be, to come to Him for pardon and forgiveness. That word of His shall never be broken. The one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. Never, never need anyone despair of salvation if he will only come to Christ.
Let us ask ourselves in conclusion, what are we doing for Christ's glory? What kind of lives are we living? What proof are we making of our love for Him who first loved us and died for our sins? These are serious questions. If we cannot answer them satisfactorily, we may well doubt whether we are forgiven. The hope of forgiveness which is not accompanied by love in the life is the hope of a hypocrite, which ends only in wrath. The man whose sins are really cleansed away will always show by his ways that he loves the Saviour who cleansed them. Chapter 8 Luke 8, 1-3 The Women Who Accompanied Jesus Soon afterwards he began going around from one city and village to another, proclaiming and preaching the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and sicknesses. Mary, who was called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others who were contributing to their support out of their private means. Let us mark in these verses our Lord Jesus Christ's unwearied diligence in doing good. We read that He began going around from one city and village to another, proclaiming and preaching the kingdom of God. We know the reception that He met with in many places. We know that while some believed, many did not believe. But man's unbelief did not move our Lord or hinder His working. He was always doing his father's business. As short as his earthly ministry was in point of duration, it was long when we consider the work that it comprised. Let the diligence of Christ be an example to all Christians. Let us follow in his steps, however far we may come short of his perfection. Like him, let us labor to do good in our day and generation and to leave the world a holier world than we found it. It is not in vain that the Scripture says expressly, The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. 1 John 2, 6 Time is undoubtedly short, but much is to be done with time if it is well economized and properly arranged. Few have an idea of how much can be done in twelve hours if men will stick to their business and avoid idleness and frivolity. Then let us, like our Lord, be diligent and redeem the time. Time is undoubtedly short, but it is the only season in which Christians can do any active work of mercy. In the world to come there will be no ignorant to instruct, no mourners to comfort, no spiritual darkness to enlighten, no distress to relieve, no sorrow to minister to. Whatever work we do of this kind must be done on this side of the grave. Let us awake to a sense of our individual responsibility. Souls are perishing and time is flying. Let us resolve by God's grace to do something for God's glory before we die. Once more, Let us remember our Lord's example and, like Him, be diligent and redeem the time. Let us mark, secondly, in these verses the power of the grace of God and the constraining influence of the love of Christ. We read that among those who followed our Lord in His journeyings were some women who had been healed of evil spirits and sicknesses. We can well imagine that the difficulties these holy women had to face in becoming Christ's disciples were neither few nor small. They had their full share of the contempt and scorn which was poured on all followers of Jesus by the scribes and Pharisees. They had, besides, many a trial from the harsh talk and hard usage which any Jewish woman who thought for herself about religion would probably have to undergo. But none of these things moved them. Grateful for mercies received at our Lord's hands, they were willing to endure much for His sake. Strengthened inwardly by the renewing power of the Holy Spirit, 
they were enabled to cleave to Jesus and not give way. And nobly they did cleave to him to the very end. It was not a woman who sold the Lord for thirty pieces of silver. They were not women who forsook the Lord in the garden and fled. It was not a woman who denied him three times in the high priest's house. But they were women who wailed and lamented when Jesus was led forth to be crucified. They were women who stood to the last by the cross. And they were women who were first to visit the grave where he was lying. Great indeed is the power of the grace of God. Let the recollection of these women encourage all the daughters of Adam who read of them or hear about them to take up the cross and follow Christ. Let no sense of weakness or fear of falling away keep them back from a decided profession of religion. The mother of a large family with limited means may tell us that she has no time for religion. The wife of an ungodly husband may tell us that she dares not take up religion. The young daughter of worldly parents may tell us that it is impossible for her to have any religion. The maidservant in the midst of unconverted companions may tell us that in her place a person cannot follow religion. But they are all wrong, quite wrong. With Christ nothing is impossible. Let them think again and change their minds. Let them begin boldly in the strength of Christ and trust Him for the consequences. The Lord Jesus never changes. He who enabled many women to serve Him faithfully while He was on earth can enable women to serve Him, glorify Him, and be His disciples at the present day. Let us mark, lastly, in these verses, the peculiar privilege which our Lord grants to His faithful followers. We read that those who accompanied Him in His journeyings were contributing to their support out of their private means. Of course, He didn't need their help. All the beasts of the forest were His, and the cattle upon a thousand hills. Psalm 50, 10. That mighty Saviour, who could multiply a few loaves and fish into food for thousands, could have called forth food from the earth for His own sustenance, if He had thought fit. But He did not do so, for two reasons. One reason was to show us that He was a man like ourselves in all things, sin only excepted, and that He lived a life of faith in His Father's providence. The other reason was that by allowing His followers to minister to Him, He might prove their love and test their regard for Him. True love will count it a pleasure to give anything to the object loved. False love will often talk and profess much, but do and give nothing at all. This matter of ministering to Christ opens up a most important train of thought, and one which we shall do well to consider. The Lord Jesus Christ is continually providing for His church at the present day. No doubt it would be easy for Him to convert the Chinese or Hindus in a moment, and to call grace into being with a word, just as He created light on the first day of this world's existence. But He doesn't do so. He is pleased to work by means. He condescends to use the agency of missionaries and the foolishness of man's preaching in order to spread His gospel. And by so doing, He is continually proving the faith and zeal of the churches. He lets Christians be fellow workers with Him so that He may manifest who has a will to minister and who has none. He lets the spread of the gospel be carried on by subscriptions, contributions, and religious societies so that He may manifest who are the covetous and unbelieving and who are the truly rich toward God. In short, the visible church of Christ may be divided into two great parties, those who minister unto Christ and those who do not. May we all remember this great truth and test our own selves. While we live, we are all upon our trial. Our lives are continually showing whose we are and whom we serve, whether we love Christ or whether we love the world. Happy are those who know something of ministering to Christ out of their own substance. 
It is a thing which can still be done, though we do not see him with our eyes. Those words which describe the proceedings of the judgment day are very solemn. I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. Matthew 25, 42. Luke 8, 4 to 15. The Parable of the Sower. When a large crowd was coming together, and those from the various cities were journeying to him, he spoke by way of a parable. The sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell beside the road, and it was trampled underfoot, and the birds of the air ate it up. Other seed fell on rocky soil, and as soon as it grew up, it withered away, because it had no moisture. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up with it and choked it out. Other seed fell into the good soil and grew up and produced a crop a hundred times as great. As he said these things, he would call out, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. His disciples began questioning him as to what this parable meant, and he said, To you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to the rest it is in parables so that seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. Now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. Those beside the road are those who have heard, then the devil comes and takes away the word from their heart, so that they will not believe and be saved. Those on the rocky soil are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no firm root. They believe for a while, and in time of temptation fall away. The seed which fell among the thorns, these are the ones who have heard, and as they go on their way, they are choked with worries and riches and pleasures of this life, and bring no fruit to maturity. But the seed in the good soil, these are the ones who have heard the word in an honest and good heart, and hold it fast, and bear fruit with perseverance. The parable of the sower, which is contained in these verses, is reported more frequently than any parable in the Bible. It is a parable of universal application. The things it relates are continually going on in every congregation to which the gospel is preached. The four kinds of hearts it describes are to be found in every assembly which hears the word. These circumstances should make us always read the parable or listen to it with a deep sense of its importance. We should say to ourselves as we read or listen to it, This concerns me. My heart is to be seen in this parable. I too am here. The passage itself requires little explanation. In fact, the meaning of the whole picture is so fully explained by our Lord that no exposition of man can throw much additional light on it. The parable is preeminently a parable of caution, and caution about a most important subject, the way of hearing the word of God. It was meant to be a warning to the apostles not to expect too much from hearers. It was meant to be a warning to all ministers of the gospel not to look for too great results from their sermons. It was meant not least to be a warning to hearers to take heed how they hear. Preaching is an ordinance of which the value can never be overrated in the Church of Christ. But it should never be forgotten that there must not only be good preaching, but also good hearing. The first caution that we learn from the parable of the sower is to beware of the devil when we hear the word. Our Lord tells us that the hearts of some hearers are like the road. The seed of the gospel is plucked away from them by the devil almost as soon as it is sown. It doesn't sink down into their consciences. It doesn't make the least impression on their minds. That malicious devil is unwearied in his efforts to do us harm. He is ever watching for our halting and seeking occasion to destroy our souls. But nowhere, perhaps, is the devil so active as in a congregation of gospel hearers. Nowhere does he labor so hard to stop the progress of that which is good and to prevent men and women being saved. From him come 
wandering thoughts, and roving imaginations, listless minds, and dull memories, sleepy eyes, and fidgety nerves, weary ears, and distracted attention. In all these things, Satan has a great hand. People wonder where they come from, and marvel how it is that they find sermons so dull and remember them so badly. They forget the parable of the sower. They forget the devil. Let us take heed that we are not roadside hearers. Let us beware of the devil. We shall always find him at church. He never stays away from public ordinances. Let us remember this and be on our guard. Heat and cold and rain and snow are often dreaded by churchgoers and alleged as reasons for not going to church. But there is one enemy whom they ought to fear more than all these things together. That enemy is the devil. The second caution that we learn from the parable of the sower is to beware of resting on mere temporary impressions when we have heard the word. Our Lord tells us that the hearts of some hearers are like rocky soil. The seed of the word springs up immediately as soon as they hear it and bears a crop of joyful impressions and pleasurable emotions. But these impressions, unfortunately, are only on the surface. There is no deep and abiding work done in their souls. And hence, as soon as the scorching heat of temptation or persecution begins to be felt, the little bit of religion which they seemed to have attained withers and vanishes away. Feelings, no doubt, fill a most important office in our personal Christianity. Without them, there can be no saving religion. Hope and joy and peace and confidence and resignation and love and fear are things which must be felt if they really exist. But it must never be forgotten that there are religious affections which are spurious and false, and spring from nothing better than fleshly excitement. It is quite possible to feel great pleasure or deep alarm under the preaching of the gospel, and yet to be utterly destitute of the grace of God. The tears of some hearers of sermons and the extravagant delight of others are no certain marks of conversion. We may be warm admirers of favorite preachers, and yet remain nothing better than rocky soil hearers. Nothing should content us but a deep, humbling, self-mortifying work of the Holy Spirit and a heart union with Christ. The third caution contained in the parable of the sower is to beware of the cares of this world. Our Lord tells us that the hearts of many hearers of the word are like thorns. The seed of the word, when sown upon them, is choked by the multitude of other things by which their affections are occupied. They have no objection to the doctrines and requirements of the gospel. They even wish to believe and obey them. But they allow earthly things to get such a hold upon their minds that they leave no room for the word of God to do its work. And hence it follows that however many sermons they hear, they seem nothing bettered by them. A weekly process of truth stifling goes on within them. They bring no fruit to perfection. The things of this world form one of the greatest dangers which beset a Christian's path. The money, the pleasures, the daily business of the world are so many traps to catch souls. Thousands of things which in themselves are innocent become, when followed to excess, little better than soul poisons and helps to hell. Open sin is not the only thing that ruins souls. In the midst of our families and in the pursuit of our lawful callings, we have need to be on our guard. Unless we watch and pray, these temporal things may rob us of heaven and smother every sermon we hear. We may live and die as thorny hearers. The last caution contained in the parable of the sower is to beware of being content with any religion which does not bear fruit in our lives. Our Lord tells us that the hearts of those who hear the word aright are like good soil. 
The seed of the gospel sinks down deeply into their wills and produces practical results in their faith and lives. They not only hear with pleasure, but they also act with decision. They repent, they believe, they obey. Forever let us bear in mind that this is the only religion that saves souls. Outward profession of Christianity and the formal use of church ordinances and sacraments never yet gave man a solid hope in life or peace in death or rest in the world beyond the grave. There must be fruits of the Spirit in our hearts and lives, or else the gospel is preached to us in vain. Only those who bear such fruits shall be found at Christ's right hand in the day of his appearing. Let us leave the parable with a deep sense of the danger and responsibility of all hearers of the gospel. There are four ways in which we may hear, and of these four, only one is right. There are three kinds of hearers whose souls are in imminent peril. How many of these three kinds are to be found in every congregation? There is only one class of hearers which is right in the sight of God. And what are we? Do we belong to that one? Finally, let us leave the parable with a solemn recollection of the duty of every faithful preacher to separate his congregation and give to each class his portion. The clergyman who ascends his pulpit every Sunday and addresses his congregation as if he thought that each one was going to heaven is surely not doing his duty to God or man. His preaching is flatly contradictory to the parable of the sower. Luke 8, 16-21 A Lamp on a Stand Now no one, after lighting a lamp, covers it over with a container, or puts it under a bed, but he puts it on a lampstand, so that those who come in may see the light. For nothing is hidden that will not become evident, nor anything secret that will not be known and come to light. So take care how you listen, for whoever has, to him more shall be given, and whoever does not have, even what he thinks he has, shall be taken away from him. And his mother and brothers came to him, and they were unable to get to him because of the crowd. And it was reported to him, Your mother and your brothers are standing outside, wishing to see you. But he answered and said to them, My mother and my brothers are these who hear the word of God and do it. These verses form a practical application of the famous parable of the sower. They are intended to nail and clench in our minds the mighty lessons which that parable contains. They deserve the special attention of all true-hearted hearers of the gospel of Christ. We learn firstly from these verses that spiritual knowledge ought to be diligently used. Our Lord tells us that spiritual knowledge is like a lamp, utterly useless when covered with a container or put under a bed. It is only useful when set upon a lamp stand and placed where it can be made serviceable to the needs of men. When we hear this lesson, let us first think of ourselves. The gospel which we possess was not given to us only to be admired, talked of, and professed, but to be practiced. It was not meant merely to reside in our intellect and memories and tongues, but to be seen in our lives. Christianity is a talent committed to our charge, and one which brings with it great responsibility. We are not in darkness like the heathen. A glorious light is put before us. Let us take heed that we use it. While we have the light, let us walk in the light. John 12, 35. But let us not only think of ourselves. Let us also think of others. There are millions in the world who have no spiritual light at all. They are without God, without Christ, and without hope. Ephesians 2, 12 Can we do nothing for them? There are thousands around us in our own land who are unconverted and dead in sins, seeing nothing and knowing nothing aright. Can we do nothing for them? 
These are questions to which every true Christian ought to find an answer. We should strive in every way to spread our religion. The highest form of selfishness is that of the man who is content to go to heaven alone. The truest charity is to endeavor to share with others every spark of religious light that we possess ourselves, and so to hold up our own lamp that it may give light to everyone around us. Happy is that soul which, as soon as it receives light from heaven, begins to think of others as well as itself. No lamp that God lights was ever meant to shine alone. We learn secondly from these verses the great importance of right hearing. The words of our Lord Jesus Christ ought to impress that lesson deeply on our hearts. He says, Take care how you listen. The degree of benefit which men receive from all the means of grace depends entirely on the way in which they use them. Private prayer lies at the very foundation of religion. Yet the mere formal repetition of a set of words when the heart is far away does good to no man's soul. Reading the Bible is essential to the attainment of sound Christian knowledge. Yet the mere formal reading of so many chapters as a task and duty, without a humble desire to be taught of God, is little better than a waste of time. Just as it is with praying and Bible reading, so it is with hearing the Word preached. It is not enough that we go to church and hear sermons. We may do so for fifty years, and not be helped at all, but rather grow worse. Take care, says our Lord, how you listen. Would anyone know how to hear aright? Then let him lay to heart three simple rules. For one thing, we must hear with faith, believing implicitly that every word of God is true and shall stand forever. The word in old time did not profit the Jews, because it was not united by faith in those who heard. Hebrews 4, 2. For another thing, we must hear with reverence, remembering constantly that the Bible is the book of God. This was the habit of the Thessalonians. They received Paul's message, not as the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God. 1 Thessalonians 2.13 Above all, we must hear with prayer, praying for God's blessing before the sermon is preached, and praying for God's blessing again when the sermon is over. Here lies the grand defect of the hearing of many. They ask no blessing, and so they have none. The sermon passes through their minds like water through a leaky vessel and leaves nothing behind. Let us bear these rules in mind every Sunday morning before we go to hear the Word of God preached. Let us not rush into God's presence in a careless, reckless, and unprepared manner as if it didn't matter in what way such work was done. Let us carry with us faith, reverence, and prayer. If these three are our companions, then we shall hear with profit and return with praise. We learn finally from these verses the great privileges of those who hear the word of God and do it. Our Lord Jesus Christ declares that He regards them as His mother and His brothers. The man who hears the Word of God and does it is the true Christian. He hears the call of God to repent and be converted, and he obeys it. He ceases to do evil and learns to do good. He puts off the old man and puts on the new. He hears the call of God to believe on Jesus Christ for justification and he obeys it. He forsakes his own righteousness and confesses his need of a Savior. He receives Christ crucified as his only hope and counts all things loss for the knowledge of him. He hears the call of God to be holy, and he obeys it. He strives to mortify the deeds of his body and to walk after the Spirit. He labors to lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily besets him. This is true, vital Christianity.
all men and women who are of this character are true Christians. The troubles of all who hear the word of God and do it are neither few nor small. The world, the flesh, and the devil continually vex them. They often groan, being burdened. 2 Corinthians 5 4. They often find the cross heavy and the way to heaven rough and narrow. They often feel disposed to cry with Paul, Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? Romans 7 24. Let all such take comfort in the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, which we are now considering. Let them remember that the Son of God Himself regards them as His own near relations. Let them not heed the laughter and mockery and persecution of this world. The woman of whom Christ says, She is my mother, and the man of whom Christ says, He is my brother, have no cause to be ashamed. Luke 8, 22-25 Jesus Calms the Storm Now on one of those days Jesus and his disciples got into a boat, and he said to them, Let us go over to the other side of the lake. So they launched out. But as they were sailing along, he fell asleep, and a fierce gale of wind descended on the lake, and they began to be swamped and to be in danger. They came to Jesus and woke him up, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. And he got up and rebuked the wind and the surging waves, and they stopped, and it became calm. And he said to them, Where is your faith? They were fearful and amazed, saying to one another, Who then is this, that he commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him? The event in our Lord's life described in these verses is related three times in the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke were all inspired to record it. This circumstance should teach us the importance of the event, and should make us give the more earnest heed to the lessons it contains. We see firstly in these verses that our Lord Jesus Christ was really man as well as God. We read that as he sailed over the lake of Gennesaret in a ship with his disciples, he fell asleep. Sleep, we must be all aware, is one of the conditions of our natural constitution as human beings. Angels and demons require neither food nor refreshment, but flesh and blood, to keep up a healthy existence, must eat and drink and sleep. If the Lord Jesus could be weary and need rest, then he must have had two natures in one person, a human nature as well as a divine nature. The truth now before us is full of deep consolation and encouragement for all true Christians. The one mediator in whom we are bid to trust has himself shared in flesh and blood. The mighty high priest who is living for us at God's right hand has had personal experience of all the infirmities of the body. He has himself hungered and thirsted and suffered pain. He has himself endured weariness and sought rest in sleep. Let us pour out our hearts before him with freedom and tell him our smallest troubles without reserve. He who made atonement for us on the cross is one who can Sympathize with our weaknesses. Hebrews 4.15. To be weary of working for God is sinful, but to be wearied and worn in doing God's work is no sin at all. Jesus himself was weary, and Jesus slept. We see, secondly, in these verses what fears and anxiety may assault the hearts of true disciples of Christ. We read that when a fierce gale of wind descended on the lake, and the boat in which our Lord was sailing was filled with water and in jeopardy, his companions were greatly alarmed. They came to Jesus and woke him up, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. They forgot for a moment their master's never failing care for them in times past. They forgot that as long as they were with him, they would be safe whatever happened. 
It is only too true that sight and sense and feeling make men very poor theologians. Facts like these are sadly humbling to the pride of human nature. It ought to lower our pride and high thoughts to see what a poor creature is man, even at his best estate. But facts like these are deeply instructive. They teach us what to watch and pray against in our own hearts. They teach of what we must make up our minds to find in other Christians. We must be moderate in our expectations. We must not suppose that men cannot be believers if they sometimes exhibit great weakness. We must not think that men have no grace because they are sometimes overwhelmed with fears. Even Peter, James, and John could cry, Master, Master, we are perishing. We see thirdly in these verses how great is the power of our Lord Jesus Christ. We read that when his disciples awoke him in the storm, he got up and rebuked the wind and the surging waves, and they stopped and it became calm. This was no doubt a mighty miracle. It needed the power of him who brought the flood on earth in the days of Noah, and in due season took it away, who divided the Red Sea and the river Jordan into two parts and made a path for his people through the waters, who brought the locusts on Egypt by an east wind and by a west wind swept them away. No power short of this could in a moment turn a storm into a calm. To speak to the winds and waves is a common proverb for attempting that which is impossible. But here we see Jesus speaking, and at once the wind and waves obey. As man he had slept, as God he stilled the storm. It is a blessed and comforting thought that all this almighty power of our Lord Jesus Christ is engaged on behalf of his believing people. He has undertaken to save each one of them to the uttermost, and he is mighty to save. The trials of his people are often many and great. The devil never ceases to make war against them. The rulers of this world frequently persecute them. The very heads of the church, who ought to be tender shepherds, are often bitterly opposed to the truth as it is in Jesus. Yet, notwithstanding all this, Christ's people shall never be entirely forsaken. Though severely harassed, they shall not be destroyed. Though cast down, they shall not be cast away. At the darkest times, let true Christians rest in the thought that greater is He who is for them than all who are against them. The winds and waves of political and ecclesiastical trouble may beat fiercely over them, and all hope may seem to have been taken away. But still let them not despair. There is one living for them in heaven who can make these winds and waves cease in a moment. The true church, of which Christ is the head, shall never perish. Its glorious head is almighty and lives forevermore, and his believing members shall all live also and reach their heavenly home safely at last. John 14, 19. We see lastly in these verses how needful it is for Christians to keep their faith ready for use. We read that our Lord said to his disciples when the storm had ceased and their fears had subsided, Where is your faith? Well, might he ask that question. Where was the profit of believing if they couldn't believe in the time of need? Where was the real value of faith unless they kept it in active exercise? Where was the benefit of trusting if they were to trust their master in sunshine only, but not in storms? The lesson now before us is one of deep practical importance. To have true saving faith is one thing. To have that faith always ready for use is quite another thing. Many receive Christ as their Savior and deliberately commit their souls to Him for time and eternity, who yet often find their faith sadly failing when something unexpected happens and they are suddenly tested. These things ought not to be so. We ought to pray that we may have a stock of faith ready for use at a moment's notice 
and may never be found unprepared. The highest style of Christian is the man who lives like Moses, seeing him who is unseen. Hebrews 11:27. That man will never be greatly shaken by any storm in life. He will see Jesus near him in the darkest hour and blue sky behind the blackest cloud. Luke 8:26 to 36. The demon-possessed man. Then they sailed to the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. And when he came out onto the land, he was met by a man from a city who was possessed with demons, and who had not put on any clothing for a long time, and was not living in a house but in the tombs. Seeing Jesus, he cried out and fell before him, and said in a loud voice, What business do we have with each other, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For it had seized him many times, and he was bound with chains and shackles, and kept under guard, and yet he would break his bonds, and be driven by the demon into the desert. And Jesus asked him, What is your name? And he said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. They were imploring him not to command them to go away into the abyss. Now there was a herd of many swine feeding there on the mountain, and the demons implored him to permit them to enter the swine. And he gave them permission. And the demons came out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When the herdsmen saw what had happened, they ran away and reported it in the city and out in the country. The people went out to see what had happened, and they came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone out, sitting down at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they became frightened. Those who had seen it reported to them how the man who was demon-possessed had been made well. The well-known narrative which we have now listened to is carefully recorded by all of the first three gospel writers. It is a striking instance of our Lord's complete dominion over the evil prince of this world. We see the great enemy of our souls for once completely vanquished, the strong man foiled by one stronger than him, and the lion spoiled of his prey. Let us mark first in this passage the miserable condition of those over whom the devil reigns. The picture brought before us is a frightful one. We are told that when our Lord arrived in the country of the Gerasenes, he was met by a man from the city who was possessed with demons, and who had not put on any clothing for a long time, and was not living in a house but in the tombs. We are also told that although he had been bound with chains and shackles, and kept under guard, yet he would break his bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. In short, the case seems to have been one of the most aggravated forms of demon possession. The unhappy sufferer was under the complete dominion of Satan, both in body and soul. As long as he continued in this state, he must have been a burden and a trouble to all around him. His mental faculties were under the control of a legion of demons. His bodily strength was only employed for his own injury and shame. It's difficult to conceive a more pitiful state for mortal man to be in. Cases of bodily possession by Satan like this are, to say the least, very rarely met with in modern times. Yet we mustn't on this account forget that the devil is continually exercising a fearful power over many hearts and souls. He still urges many, in whose hearts he reigns, into self-dishonoring and self-destroying habits of life. He still rules many with a rod of iron. He goads them on from vice to vice and from debauchery to debauchery. He drives them far from decent society and the influence of respectable friends. He plunges them into the lowest depths of wickedness. He makes them little better than self-murderers. He renders them as useless to society as if they were dead and not alive. 
Where is the faithful minister who could not put his finger on many such cases? What truer account can be given of many a young man and many a young woman than that they seem possessed by demons? It is vain to shut our eyes to facts. Demon possession of men's bodies may be comparatively rare, but many, unfortunately, are the cases in which the devil appears completely to possess men's souls. These things are fearful to think upon. It is fearful to see to what a wreck of body and mind Satan often brings young people. It is fearful to observe how he often drives them out of the reach of all good influence and buries them in a wilderness of bad companions and loathsome sins. It is fearful above all to reflect that in a little while Satan's slaves will be lost forever and will be in hell. There often remains only one thing that can be done for them. They can be named before Christ in prayer. He who came to the country of the Gerasenes and healed the miserable demoniac there still lives in heaven and pities sinners. The worst slave of Satan in England is not beyond a remedy. Jesus may yet take compassion on him and set him free. Let us mark, secondly, in these verses, the absolute power which the Lord Jesus Christ possesses over Satan. We are told that he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, whose miserable condition we have just heard described. At once the unhappy sufferer was healed. The many demons by whom he had been possessed were compelled to leave him. Nor is this all. Cast forth from their abode in the man's heart, we see these malignant spirits beseeching our Lord that he would not torment them or command them to go away into the abyss, and so confessing his supremacy over them. Mighty as they were, they plainly felt themselves in the presence of one mightier than themselves. Full of malice as they were, they couldn't even hurt the swine of the Gerasenes until our Lord granted them permission. Our Lord Jesus Christ's dominion over the devil should be a cheering thought to all true Christians. Without it, indeed, we might well despair of salvation. To feel that we have ever near us an invisible spiritual enemy laboring night and day to bring about our destruction would be enough to crush our every hope if we did not know a friend and protector. Blessed be God, the gospel reveals such a one. The Lord Jesus is stronger than that strong man fully armed who is ever warring against our souls. The Lord Jesus is able to deliver us from the devil. He proved his power over him frequently when upon earth. He triumphed over him gloriously on the cross. He will never let him pluck any of his sheep out of his hand. He will one day bruise him under our feet and forever bind him in the prison of hell. Happy are they who hear Christ's voice and follow him. Satan may vex them, but he cannot really hurt them. He may bruise their heel, but he cannot destroy their souls. They shall overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved them. Romans 8 37. Let us mark finally the wonderful change that Christ can work in Satan's slaves. We are told that the Gerasenes found the man from whom the demons had gone out sitting down at the feet of Jesus clothed and in his right mind. That sight must indeed have been strange and astonishing. The man's history and condition, no doubt, were well known. He had probably been a nuisance and a terror to all the neighborhood. Yet here, in one moment, a complete change had come over him. Old things had passed away, and all things had become new. The power by which such a cure was wrought must indeed have been almighty. When Christ is the physician, then nothing is impossible. One thing, however, must never be forgotten. As striking and as miraculous as this cure was, it's not really any more astonishing than every case of true conversion to God. 
As marvellous as the change was which appeared in this demoniac's condition when healed, it is not one whit more marvellous than the change which passes over every one who is born again and turned from the power of Satan to God. Never is a man in his right mind until he is converted. Never is a man in his right place until he sits by faith at the feet of Jesus. Never is a man rightly clothed until he has put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Have we ever considered what real conversion to God is? It is nothing else than the miraculous release of a captive, the miraculous restoration of a man to his right mind, the miraculous deliverance of a soul from the devil. What are we ourselves? This, after all, is the grand question which concerns us. Are we slaves of Satan or servants of God? Has Christ made us free, or does the devil yet reign in our hearts? Do we sit at the feet of Jesus daily? Are we in our right minds? May the Lord help us to answer these questions aright. Luke 8, 37-40 Christ Rejected by the Gerasenes And all the people of the country of the Gerasenes and the surrounding district asked him to leave them, for they were gripped with great fear, and he got into a boat and returned. But the man from whom the demons had gone out was begging him that he might accompany him, but he sent him away, saying, Return to your house and describe what great things God has done for you. So he went away, proclaiming throughout the whole city what great things Jesus had done for him. And as Jesus returned, the people welcomed him, for they had all been waiting for him. We see in this passage two requests made to our Lord Jesus Christ. They were widely different one from the other, and were offered by people of widely different character. We see, moreover, how these requests were received by our Lord Jesus Christ. In each case, the request received a most remarkable answer. The whole passage is singularly instructive. Let us observe in the first place that the Gerasenes besought our Lord to depart from them, and their request was granted. We read these painfully solemn words, And all the people of the country of the Gerasenes and the surrounding district asked him to leave them, for they were gripped with great fear. And he got into a boat and returned. Why did these unhappy men want the Son of God to leave them? Why, after the amazing miracle of mercy which had just been wrought among them, did they feel no wish to know more of him who wrought it? Why, in a word, did they become their own enemies, forsake their own mercies, and shut the door against the gospel? There is but one answer to these questions. The Gerasenes loved the world and the things of the world, and were determined not to give them up. They felt convinced in their own consciences that they could not receive Christ among them and keep their sins, and they were resolved to keep their sins. They saw at a glance that there was something about Jesus with which their habits of life would never agree, and having to choose between the new ways and their own old ones, they refused the new and chose the old. And why did our Lord Jesus Christ grant the request of the Gerasenes and leave them? He did it in judgment, to testify to his sense of the greatness of their sin. He did it to show how great is the wickedness of those who willfully reject the truth. It seems to be an eternal law of his government that those who obstinately refuse to walk in the light shall have the light taken from them. Great is Christ's patience and long suffering. His mercy endures forever. His offers and invitations are wide and broad and sweeping and universal. He gives every church its day of grace and time of visitation. But if men persist in refusing his counsel, he has nowhere promised to persist in forcing it upon them. People who have the gospel and yet refuse to obey it must not be surprised if the gospel is removed from them. Hundreds of churches and parishes and families are at this moment in the same state of the Gerasenes. 
They said to Christ, Depart from us, and he has taken them at their word. Let us take heed that we do not sin the sin of the Gerasenes. Let us beware lest by coldness and inattention and worldliness we drive Jesus from our doors and compel him to forsake us entirely. Of all sins which we can sin, this is the most sinful. Of all states of soul into which we can fall, none is so fearful as to be let alone. Let it rather be our daily prayer that Christ may never leave us to ourselves. The old wreck, high and dry on the sandbank, is not a more wretched sight than the man whose heart Christ has visited with mercies and judgments, but has at last ceased to visit, because he was not received. The barred door is a door at which Jesus will not always knock. The Gerasene mind must not be surprised to see Christ leaving it and going away. Let us observe, in the second place, that the man out of whom the devils departed besought our Lord that he might be with him, but his request was not granted. We read that Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your house and describe what great things God has done for you. We can easily understand the request which this man made. He felt deeply grateful for the amazing mercy which he had just received in being cured. He felt full of love and warm affection toward him who had so wonderfully and graciously cured him. He felt that he could not see too much of him, be too much in his company, or cleave too closely to him. He forgot everything else under the influence of these feelings family, relations, friends, home, house, country, all seemed as nothing in his eyes. He felt that he cared for nothing but to be with Christ. We cannot blame him for his feelings. They may have been tinged with something of enthusiasm and inconsideration. There may have been a zeal not according to knowledge about them. In the first excitement of a newly felt cure, he may not have been fit to judge what his future line of life should be. But, Excited feelings in religion are far better than no feelings at all. In the petition he made, there was far more to praise than to blame. But why did our Lord Jesus Christ refuse to grant this man's request? Why, at a time when he had few disciples, did he send this man away? Why, instead of allowing him to join with himself and his disciples, did he bid him to return to his own house? Our Lord did what he did in infinite wisdom. He did it for the benefit of the man's own soul. He saw that it was more for his good to be a witness for the gospel at home than to be a disciple abroad. He did it in mercy to the Gerasenes. He left among them one standing testimony of the truth of his own divine mission. He did it, above all, for the perpetual instruction of his whole church. He would have us to know that there are various ways of glorifying Him, that He may be honored in private life as well as in the apostolic office, and that the first place in which we should witness for Christ is our own home. There is a lesson of deep experiential wisdom in this little incident which all true Christians would do well to lay to heart. That lesson is our own utter ignorance of what position is good for us in this world, and the necessity of submitting our own wills to the will of Christ. The place that we wish to fill is not always the place that is best for us. The line of life that we want to take up is not always that which Christ sees to be most for the benefit of our souls. The place that we are obliged to fill is sometimes very distasteful, and yet it may be needful to our sanctification. The position we are compelled to occupy may be very disagreeable to flesh and blood, and yet it may be the very one that is necessary to keep us in our right mind. It is better to be sent away from Christ's bodily presence by Christ Himself than to remain in Christ's bodily presence without His consent. Let us pray for the spirit of contentment with what we have. Let us be fearful of choosing for ourselves in this life without Christ's consent, or moving in this world when the 
pillar of fire and cloud is not moving before us. Let us ask the Lord to choose everything for us. Let our daily prayer be, Give me what you will. Place me where you will. Only let me be your disciple and abide in you. Luke 8, 41-48 A Sick Woman Healed And there came a man named Jairus, and he was an official of the synagogue. And he fell at Jesus' feet and began to implore him to come to his house. For he had an only daughter, about twelve years old, and she was dying. But as he went, the crowds were pressing against him. And a woman who had a hemorrhage for twelve years and could not be healed by anyone came up behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak. And immediately her hemorrhage stopped. And Jesus said, Who is the one who touched me? And while they were all denying it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing in on you. But Jesus said, Someone did touch me, for I was aware that power had gone out of me. When the woman saw that she had not escaped notice, she came trembling and fell down before him, and declared in the presence of all the people the reason why she had touched him, and how she had been immediately healed. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. How much misery and trouble sin has brought into the world! The passage we have just listened to affords a melancholy proof of this. First we see a distressed father in bitter anxiety about a dying daughter. Then we see a suffering woman who has been afflicted twelve years with an incurable disease. And these are things which sin has sown broadcast over the whole earth. These are but examples of what is going on continually on every side. These are evils which God did not create at the beginning, but man has brought upon himself by the fall. There would have been no sorrow and no sickness among Adam's children if there had been no sin. Let us see, in the case of the woman here described, a striking picture of the condition of many souls. We are told that she had been afflicted with a wearing disease for twelve years. The state of many a sinner's heart is placed before us in this description as in a mirror. Perhaps it describes ourselves. There are men and women in most congregations who have felt their sins deeply and been sorely afflicted by the thought that they are not forgiven and not fit to die. They have desired relief and peace of conscience but have not known where to find them. They have tried many false remedies and found themselves not better but rather have grown worse. They have gone the round of all the forms of religion and wearied themselves with every imaginable man-made device for obtaining spiritual health. But all has been in vain. Peace of conscience seems as far off as ever. The wound within is a fretting, intractable sore, which nothing can heal. They are still wretched, still unhappy, still thoroughly discontented with their own state. In short, like the woman of whom we heard about today, they are ready to say, There is no hope for me, I shall never be saved. Let all such take comfort in the miracle which we are now considering. Let them know that there is a balm in Gilead, which can cure them if they will only seek it. There is one door at which they have never knocked in all their efforts to obtain relief. There is one physician to whom they have not applied who never fails to heal. Let them consider the conduct of the woman before us in her necessity. When all other means had failed, she went to Jesus for help. Let them go and do likewise. Let us see, secondly, in the conduct of the woman before us, a striking picture of the first beginnings of saving faith and its effect. We are told that she came up behind our Lord and touched the fringe of his cloak, and immediately her hemorrhage stopped. The act appeared a most simple one and utterly inadequate to produce any great result. 
but the effect of that act was most marvelous. In an instant, the poor sufferer was healed. The relief that many physicians had failed to give in twelve years was obtained in one moment. It was but one touch, and she was made well. It is hard to conceive a more lively image of the experience of many souls than the history of this woman's cure. Hundreds could testify that, like her, they long sought spiritual help from physicians of no value, and wearied their souls by using remedies which brought no cure. At last, like her, they heard of one who healed laboring consciences and forgave sinners without money and without cost, if men would only come to him by faith. The terms sounded too good to be credible. The tidings sounded too good to be true. But, like the woman before us, they resolved to try. They came to Christ by faith with all their sins and, to their amazement, at once found relief. And now they feel more comfort and hope than they ever felt before. The burden was rolled off their backs. The weight was taken off their minds. Light was breaking in on their hearts. They begin to exult in hope of the glory of God. Romans 5, 2. And all, they would tell us, is owing to one simple thing. They came to Jesus just as they were with all their sin. They touched him by faith and were healed. Forever let it be engraved on our hearts that faith in Christ is the grand secret of peace with God. Without it, we shall never find inward rest, whatever else we may do in religion. Without it, we may go to religious services daily and receive the Lord's Supper every week. We may give our goods to the poor and our bodies to be burned, we may fast and wear sackcloth and live the lives of hermits. All this we may do and be miserable after all. One true believing touch of Christ is of more worth than all these things put together. The pride of human nature may not like it, but it is true. Thousands will rise up at the last day and testify that they never felt comfort of soul until they came to Christ by faith and were content to cease from their own works and be saved wholly and entirely by His grace. Let us see, lastly, in this passage, how much our Lord desires that those who have received benefit from Him should confess Him before men. We are told that He did not allow this woman, whose case we have been listening to, to retire from the crowd unnoticed. He inquired, Who is the one who touched me? He inquired again, until the woman came forward and declared her case before all the people. And then came the gracious words, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Confession of Christ is a matter of great importance. Let this never be forgotten by true Christians. The work that we can do for our blessed Master is little and poor. Our best endeavors to glorify Him are weak and full of imperfections. Our prayers and praises are sadly defective. Our knowledge and love are miserably small. But do we feel within that Christ has healed our souls? Then can we not confess Christ before men? Can we not plainly tell others that Christ has done everything for us? Can we not tell others that we were dying of a deadly disease and were cured? Can we not tell others that we were lost and are now found, that we were blind and now see? Let us do this boldly and not be afraid. Let us not be ashamed to let all men know what Jesus has done for our souls. Our Master loves to see us doing so. He likes His people not to be ashamed of His name. It is a solemn saying of Paul, If you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. Romans 10, 9. It is a still more solemn saying of Christ Himself, Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him. Luke 9, 
26. Luke 8, 49-56 Jairus' daughter raised from the dead. While he was still speaking, someone came from the house of the synagogue official, saying, Your daughter has died. Do not trouble the teacher any more. But when Jesus heard this, he answered him, Do not be afraid any longer. Only believe, and she will be made well. When he came to the house, he did not allow anyone to enter with him except Peter and John and James and the girl's father and mother. Now they were all weeping and lamenting for her. But he said, Stop weeping, for she has not died, but is asleep. And they began laughing at him, knowing that she had died. He, however, took her by the hand and called, saying, Child, arise. And her spirit returned, and she got up immediately, and he gave orders for something to be given her to eat. Her parents were amazed, but he instructed them to tell no one what had happened. The verses we have now listened to contain one of the three great instances which the Holy Spirit has thought fit to record of our Lord restoring a dead person to life. The other two instances are those of Lazarus and the widow's son at Nain. There seems no reason to doubt that our Lord raised others besides these three. But these three cases are especially described as patterns of His almighty power. One was a young girl who had just breathed her last. One was a young man who was being carried to his burial. One was a man who had already laid four days in the grave. In all three cases alike, we see life at once restored at Christ's command. Let us notice in the verses before us how universal is the dominion which death holds over mankind. We see death coming to a rich man's house and tearing from him the desire of his eyes with a stroke. Such tidings as these are the bitterest cups which we have to drink in this world. Nothing cuts so deeply into man's heart as to part with beloved ones and lay them in the grave. Few griefs are so crushing and heavy as the grief of a parent over the death of an only child. Death is indeed a cruel enemy. He makes no distinction in his attacks. He comes to the rich man's mansion as well as to the poor man's cottage. He does not spare the young, the strong, and the beautiful any more than the old, the infirm, and the gray haired. Not all the gold of Australia, nor all the skill of doctors, can keep the hand of death from our bodies in the day of his power. When the appointed hour comes, and God permits him to smite, then our worldly schemes must be broken off, and our darlings must be taken away and buried out of our sight. These thoughts are melancholy, and few like to hear of them. The subject of death is one that men shut their eyes at and refuse to look at. All men think all men mortal but themselves. But why should we treat this great reality in this way? Why should we not rather look the subject of death in the face in order that when our turn comes we may be prepared to die? Death will come to our houses whether we like it or not. Death will take each of us away, despite our dislike in hearing about it. Surely it is the part of a wise man to get ready for this great change. Why should we not be ready? There is one who can deliver us from the fear of death. Christ has overcome death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. He who believes on him has everlasting life. Though he dies, yet shall he live. Let us believe in the Lord Jesus, and then death will lose his sting. We shall then be able to say with Paul, To me, to die is gain. Philippians 1, 21. Let us notice, secondly, in the verses before us, that faith in Christ's love and power is the best remedy in time of trouble. We are told that when Jesus heard the news that the ruler's daughter was dead, he said to him, Do not be afraid any longer. Only believe, and she will be made well. 
These words, no doubt, were spoken with immediate reference to the miracle our Lord was going to perform. But we need not doubt that they were also meant for the perpetual benefit of the Church of Christ. They were meant to reveal to us the grand secret of comfort in the hour of need. That secret is to exercise faith to fall back on the thought of Christ's loving heart and mighty hand. In one word, to believe. Let a petition for more faith form a part of all our daily prayers. As ever we would desire to have peace and calmness and quietness of heart, let us often say, Lord, increase our faith. A hundred painful things may happen to us every week in this evil world, of which our poor, weak minds cannot see the reason. Without faith, we shall be constantly disturbed and cast down. Nothing will make us cheerful and tranquil but an abiding sense of Christ's love, Christ's wisdom, Christ's care over us, and Christ's providential management of all our affairs. Faith will not sink under the weight of evil tidings. He will not fear evil tidings. His heart is steadfast, trusting in the Lord. Psalm 112, 7. Faith can sit still and wait for better times. Faith can see light even in the darkest hour, and a necessary reason for the heaviest trial. Faith can find room to build an Ebenezer, stone of help, under any circumstances, and can sing songs in the night in any condition. He who believes will not be disturbed. The steadfast of mind you will keep in perfect peace. Once more, let the lesson be engraved on our minds. If we would travel comfortably through this world, we must believe. Let us notice finally in these verses the almighty power which our Lord Jesus Christ possesses even over death. We are told that he came to the house of Jairus and turned the mourning into joy. He took the hand of the ruler's daughter's breathless body and said, Child, arise. At once, by that all powerful voice, life was restored. Her spirit returned and she got up immediately. Let us take comfort in the thought that there is a limit to death's power. The king of terrors is very strong. How many generations he has mowed down and swept into the dust! How many of the wise and strong and lovely he has swallowed down and snatched away in their prime! How many victories he has won, and how often he has written vanity of vanities on the pride of man! Patriarchs and kings and prophets and apostles have all in turn been obliged to yield to him. They have all died. But thanks be unto God, there is one stronger than death. There is one who has said, O death, where are your thorns? O Sheol, where is your sting? Hosea 13, 14. That one is the friend of sinners. Christ Jesus the Lord. He proved his power frequently when he came to the earth the first time, in the house of Jairus, by the tomb of Bethany, in the gate of Nain. He will prove his power to all the world when he comes again. The last enemy that will be abolished is death. 1 Corinthians 15 26. The earth will give birth to the departed spirits. Isaiah 26 19. Let us leave the passage with the consoling thought that the things that happened in Jairus's house are a type of good things to come. The hour is coming, and will soon be here, when the voice of Christ shall call all his people from their graves and gather them together to part no more. Believing husbands shall once more see believing wives. Believing parents shall once more see believing children. Christ shall unite his whole redeemed family in the great home in heaven, and all tears shall be wiped from all eyes. Chapter 9, Luke 9, 1-6 Jesus sends out the twelve apostles. 
And he called the twelve together, and gave them power and authority over all the demons, and to heal diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God, and to perform healing. And he said to them, Take nothing for your journey, neither a staff, nor a bag, nor bread, nor money, and do not even have two tunics apiece. Whatever house you enter, stay there until you leave that city. And as for those who do not receive you, as you go out from that city, shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. Departing, they began going throughout the villages, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. These verses contain our Lord's instructions to his twelve apostles when he sent them forth the first time to preach the gospel. The passage is one which throws much light on the work of Christian ministers in every age. No doubt the miraculous power which the apostles possessed made their position very unlike that of any other body of men in the church. No doubt in many respects they stood alone and had no successors. Yet the words of our Lord in this place must not be confined entirely to the apostles. They contain deep wisdom for Christian teachers and preachers for all time. Let us observe, firstly, that the commission to the apostles contains special reference to the demons and bodily sickness. We read that Jesus gave them power and authority over all the demons and to heal diseases. We see here, as in a looking glass, two of the principal parts of the Christian minister's business. We must not expect him to cast out evil spirits, but we may fairly expect him to resist the devil and all his works, and to keep up a constant warfare against the evil prince of this world. We mustn't expect him to work miraculous cures, but we may expect him to take a special interest in all sick people, to visit them, sympathize with them, and help them, if needful, as far as he can. The minister who neglects the sick members of his flock is no true pastor. He must not be surprised if people say that he cares for the fleece of his sheep more than for their health. Likewise, the minister who allows drunkenness, blasphemy, impurity, reveling, and the like to go on among his congregation unreproved is omitting a plain duty of his office. He is not warring against the devil. He is no true successor of the apostles. Let us observe, secondly, that one of the principal works which the apostles were commissioned to take up was preaching. We read that our Lord sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God, and that they began going throughout the villages preaching the gospel. The importance of preaching as a means of grace might easily be gathered from this passage even if it stood alone. But it is but one instance among many of the high value which the Bible everywhere sets upon preaching. It is, in fact, God's chosen instrument for doing good to souls. By it, sinners are converted, inquirers led on, and saints built up. A sound preaching ministry is absolutely essential to the health and prosperity of a visible church. The pulpit is the place where the chief victories of the gospel have always been won. No church has ever done much for the advancement of true religion in which the pulpit has been neglected. Would we know whether a minister is a truly apostolic man? If he is, then he will give the best of his attention to his sermons. He will labor and pray to make his preaching effective and he will tell his congregation that he looks to preaching for the chief results on souls. The minister who exalts the sacraments or rituals of the church above preaching may be a zealous, earnest, conscientious, and respectable minister, but his zeal is not according to knowledge. He is not a follower of the apostles. Let us observe, thirdly, that our Lord charges his apostles when he sends them forth to study simplicity of habits and contentment with such things as they have. He bids them, Take nothing for your journey, neither a staff, nor a bag, nor bread, nor money, and do not even have two tunics apiece. Whatever house you enter, stay there until you leave that city. In part, these instructions apply only to a peculiar period. 
but in part these instructions contain a lesson for all time. The spirit of these verses is meant to be remembered by all ministers of the gospel. The leading idea which the words convey is a warning against worldliness and luxurious habits. Well would it be for the world and the church if the warning had been more carefully heeded. From no quarter has Christianity received such damage as it has from the hands of its own ministers. On no point have its ministers erred so much and so often as in the matter of personal worldliness and luxury of life. They have often destroyed by their daily lives the whole work of their lips. They have given occasion to the enemies of religion to say that they love ease and money and earthly things far more than souls. From such ministers may we pray daily that the church may be delivered. They are a living stumbling block in the way to heaven. They are helpers to the cause of the devil and not of God. The preacher whose affections are set on money and finery and feasting and pleasure seeking has clearly mistaken his vocation. He has forgotten his master's instructions. He is not an apostolic man. Let us observe, lastly, that our Lord prepares his disciples to meet with unbelief and impenitence in those to whom they preach. He speaks of those who do not receive them as a class which they must expect to see. He tells them how to behave when not received, as if it were a state of things to which they must make up their mind. All ministers of the gospel would do well to read carefully this portion of our Lord's instructions. All missionaries and district visitors and Sunday school teachers would do well to lay it to heart. Let them not be cast down if their work seems in vain and their labor without profit. Let them remember that the very first preachers and teachers whom Jesus employed were sent forth with a distinct warning that not all would believe. Let them work on patiently and sow the good seed without fainting. Duties are theirs, but results are God's. Apostles may plant and water, but the Holy Spirit alone can give spiritual life. The Lord Jesus knows what is in the heart of man. He does not despise his laborers because little of the seed they sow bears fruit. The harvest may be small, but every laborer shall be rewarded according to his labors. Luke 9, 7-11 The Apostles Return Now Herod the Tetrarch heard of all that was happening, and he was greatly perplexed, because it was said by some that John had risen from the dead, and by some that Elijah had appeared, and by others that one of the prophets of old had risen again. Herod said, I myself had John beheaded, but who is this man about whom I hear such things? And he kept trying to see him. When the apostles returned, they gave an account to him of all that they had done. Taking them with him, he withdrew by himself to a city called Bethsaida. But the crowds were aware of this and followed him, and, welcoming them, he began speaking to them about the kingdom of God and curing those who had need of healing. Let us mark in this passage the power of a bad conscience. We are told that Herod the Tetrarch heard of all that was happening, and he was greatly perplexed because it was said by some that John had risen from the dead. He said, I myself had John beheaded, but who is this man about whom I hear such things? As great and powerful as Herod was, the tidings of our Lord's ministry called his sins to remembrance and disturbed him even in his royal palace. Surrounded as he was by everything which is considered to make life enjoyable, the report of another preacher of righteousness filled him with alarm. The recollection of his own wickedness in killing John the Baptist flashed on his mind. He knew he had done wrong. He felt guilty, self-condemned, and self-dissatisfied. Faithful and true is that saying of Solomon's, The way of the treacherous is hard. Proverbs 13, 15. Herod's sin had found him out. 
The prison and the sword had silenced John the Baptist's tongue, but they could not silence the voice of Herod's conscience. God's truth can neither be silenced, nor bound, nor killed. Conscience is a most powerful part of our natural constitution. It cannot save our souls. It never leads a man to Christ. It is often blind and ignorant and misdirected. Yet, conscience often raises a mighty testimony against sin in the sinner's heart, and makes him feel that it is evil and bitter to depart from God. Young people ought especially to remember this, and, remembering it, to take heed to their ways. Let them not flatter themselves that all is right when their sins are past and done and forgotten by the world. Let them know that conscience can bring up each sin before the eyes of their minds and make it bite like a serpent. Millions will testify at the last day that Herod's experience was their own. Conscience called old sins from their graves and made them walk up and down in their minds. In the midst of seeming happiness and prosperity, they were inwardly miserable and distressed. Happy are those who have found the only cure for a bad conscience. Nothing will ever heal it except the blood of Christ. Let us mark, secondly, the importance to Christians of occasional privacy and retirement. We are told that when the apostles returned from their first ministerial work, our Lord, taking them with him, withdrew by himself to a city called Bethsaida. We cannot doubt that this was done with a deep meaning. It was meant to teach the great lesson that those who do public work for the souls of others must be careful to make time for being alone with God. The lesson is one which many Christians would do well to remember. Occasional retirement, self-inquiry, meditation, and secret communion with God are absolutely essential to spiritual health. The man who neglects them is in great danger of a fall. To be always preaching, teaching, speaking, writing, and working public works is unquestionably a sign of zeal, but it is not always a sign of zeal in accordance with knowledge. It often leads to troubling consequences. We must make time occasionally for sitting down and calmly looking within and examining how matters stand between our own selves and Christ. The omission of the practice is the true cause of many a backsliding which shocks the church and gives occasion to the world to blaspheme. Many could say with sorrow, in the words of the Song of Solomon, They made me caretaker of the vineyards, but I have not taken care of my own vineyard. Song of Solomon 1, 6 Let us mark, lastly, in this passage, our Lord Jesus Christ's readiness to receive all who come unto him. We are told that when the multitude followed him into the city where he had retired, welcoming them, he began speaking to them about the kingdom of God and curing those who had need of healing. Ill mannered and uninvited as this intrusion on his privacy seems to have been, it met with no rebuff from our Lord. He was always more ready to give instruction than people were to ask for it, and more willing to teach than people were willing to be taught. But the incident, as trifling as it may seem, exactly tallies with all that we read in the Gospels of the gentleness and compassion of Christ. We never see him dealing with people according to what they deserve. We never find him scrutinizing the motives of his hearers, or refusing to allow them to learn of him because their hearts were not right in the sight of God. His ear was always ready to hear, and his hand ready to work, and his tongue ready to preach. None that came to him were ever cast out. Whatever they might think of his doctrine, they could never say that Jesus of Nazareth was a stern man. Let us remember this in all our dealings with Christ about our own souls. We may draw near to Him with boldness and open our hearts to Him with confidence. He is a Savior of infinite compassion and loving kindness. He will not break the bruised reed nor quench the smoking flax. The secrets of our spiritual life 
may be such as we would not have our dearest friends know. The wounds of our conscience may be deep and sore and require most delicate handling. But we need not fear anything if we commit all to Jesus, the Son of God. We shall find that His kindness is unbounded. His own words shall be found abundantly true. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Matthew 11, 28-29 Let us remember this, finally, in our dealings with other people if we are called upon to give them help with their souls. Let us strive to walk in the steps of Christ's example, and, like Him, to be kind and patient and always willing to aid. The ignorance of young beginners in religion is sometimes very provoking. We are apt to be wearied of their instability and fickleness and halting between two opinions. But let us remember Jesus and not be weary. He received all, spoke to all, and did good to all. Let us go and do likewise. As Christ deals with us, so let us deal one with another. Luke 9, 12-17 Jesus Feeds the Five Thousand Now the day was ending, and the twelve came and said to him, Send the crowd away, that they may go into the surrounding villages and countryside, and find lodging, and get something to eat. For here we are in a desolate place. But he said to them, You give them something to eat. And they said, We have no more than five loaves and two fish, unless perhaps we go and buy food for all these people. For there were about five thousand men. And he said to his disciples, Have them sit down to eat in groups of about fifty each. They did so, and had them all sit down. Then he took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he blessed them and broke them, and kept giving them to the disciples to set before the people. And they all ate and were satisfied, and the broken pieces which they had left over were picked up, twelve baskets full. The miracle described in these verses is more frequently related in the Gospels than any that our Lord wrought. There is no doubt a meaning in this repetition. It is intended to draw our special attention to the things which it contains. We see, for one thing, in these verses, a striking example of our Lord Jesus Christ's divine power. He feeds an assembly of five thousand men with five loaves and two fish. He makes a scanty supply of food which was barely sufficient for the daily needs of himself and his disciples to satisfy the hunger of a company as large as a Roman legion. There could be no mistake about the reality and greatness of this miracle. It was done publicly and before many witnesses. The same power which at the beginning made the world out of nothing caused food to exist which before had not existed. The circumstances of the whole event made deception impossible. Five thousand hungry men would not have agreed that they were all satisfied if they had not received real food. Twelve baskets full of broken pieces would never have been taken up if real material loaves and fish had not been miraculously multiplied. Nothing, in short, can explain the whole transaction but the finger of God. The same hand which sent manna from heaven in the wilderness to feed the nation of Israel was the hand which multiplied five loaves and two fish to supply the needs of five thousand men. The miracle before us is one among many proofs that with Christ nothing is impossible. The Saviour of sinners is almighty. He calls into being that which does not exist. Romans 4, 17. When He wills a thing, it shall be done. When He commands a thing, it shall come to pass. He can create light out of darkness, order out of disorder, strength out of weakness, joy out of sorrow, and food out of nothing at all. Forever let us bless God that it is so. 
We might well despair when we see the corruption of human nature and the desperate hardness and unbelief of man's heart if we did not know the power of Christ. Can these dry bones live? Can any man or woman be saved? Can any child or friend of ours ever become a true Christian? Can we ourselves ever win our way through to heaven? Questions like these could never be answered if Jesus were not Almighty. But, thanks be to God, Jesus has all power in heaven and earth. He lives in heaven for us, able to save to the uttermost, and therefore we may hope. We see, for another thing in these verses, a striking emblem of Christ's ability to supply the spiritual needs of mankind. The whole miracle is a picture. We see in it, as in a mirror, some of the most important truths of Christianity. It is, in fact, a great acted out parable of the glorious gospel. What is that multitude which surrounded our Lord in the wilderness? Poor and helpless and destitute of food? It is a picture of mankind. We are a company of poor sinners in the midst of a wicked world without strength or power to save ourselves and severely in danger of perishing from spiritual famine. Who is that gracious teacher who had compassion on this starving multitude in the wilderness and said to his disciples, You give them something to eat? It is Jesus himself, ever full of pity, ever kind, ever ready to show mercy even to the unthankful and the evil. And he is not altered. He is just the same today as he was then. Exalted high in heaven at the right hand of God, he looks down on the vast multitude of starving sinners who cover the face of the earth. He still pities them, still cares for them, and still feels for their helplessness and need. He still says to his believing followers, Behold this multitude, give them something to eat. What is that wonderful provision which Christ miraculously made for the famishing multitude before him? It is a picture of the gospel. As weak and contemptible as that gospel appears to many, it contains enough and to spare for the souls of all mankind. As poor and despicable as the story of a crucified Savior seems to the wise and prudent, it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. Romans 1 16. What are those disciples who received the loaves and fish from Christ's hand and carried them to the multitude until all were filled? They are a figure of all faithful preachers and teachers of the gospel. Their word is simple and yet deeply important. They are appointed to set before men the provision that Christ has made for their souls. They are not commissioned to give anything of their own invention. All that they convey to men must be from Christ's hands. So long as they faithfully discharge this office, they may confidently expect their Master's blessing. Many, no doubt, will always refuse to eat of the food that Christ has provided. But if ministers offer the bread of life to men faithfully, then the blood of those who are lost will not be required at their hands. What are we doing ourselves? Have we discovered? That this world is a wilderness, and that our souls must be fed with bread from heaven or die eternally? Happy are those who have learned this lesson and have tasted by experience that Christ crucified is the true bread of life. The heart of man can never be satisfied with the things of this world. It is always empty and hungry and thirsty and dissatisfied until it comes to Christ. It is only those who hear Christ's voice and follow Him and feed on Him by faith who are satisfied. Luke 9, 18-22 Peter's Confession of Christ And it happened that while he was praying alone, the disciples were with him, and he questioned them, saying, Who do the people say that I am? They answered and said, John the Baptist and others say Elijah, but others that one of the prophets of old has risen again. And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered and said, The Christ of God. But he warned them and instructed them not to tell this to anyone, 
saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things, and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed and be raised up on the third day. Let us notice in this passage the variety of opinions about our Lord Jesus Christ which prevailed during his earthly ministry. We are told that some said that he was John the Baptist, some that he was Elijah, and some that one of the old prophets had risen again. One common remark applies to all these opinions. All were agreed that our Lord's doctrine was not like that of the scribes and Pharisees. All saw in him a bold witness against the evil that was in the world. Let it never surprise us to find the same variety of opinions about Christ and his gospel in our own times. God's truth disturbs the spiritual laziness of men. It obliges them to think. It makes them begin to talk and reason and speculate and invent theories to account for its spread in some places and its rejection in others. Thousands in every age of the church spend their lives in this way and never come to the point of drawing near to God. They satisfy themselves with a miserable round of gossip about this preacher's sermons or that writer's opinions. They think, this man goes too far, and that man does not go far enough. Some doctrines they approve, and others they disapprove. Some teachers they call sound, and others they call unsound. They cannot quite make up their own minds as to what is true or what is right. Year rolls on after year and finds them in the same state, talking, criticizing, fault finding, speculating, but never getting any further. They are hovering like the moth around the religion, but never settling down like the bee to feed on its treasures. They never boldly lay hold of Christ. They never set themselves heartily to the great business of serving God. They never take up the cross and become thorough Christians. And at last, after all their talking, they die in their sins, unprepared to meet God. Let us not be content with a religion of this kind. It will not save us to talk and speculate and exchange opinions about the gospel. The Christianity that saves is personally grasped, personally experienced, personally felt, and personally possessed. There is not the slightest excuse for stopping short in talk, opinion, and speculation. The Jews of our Lord's time might have found out, if they had been honest inquirers, that Jesus of Nazareth was neither John the Baptist, nor Elijah, nor an old prophet, but the Christ of God. The speculative professor of our own day might easily satisfy himself on every point which is needful to salvation if he would really, candidly, and humbly seek the teaching of the Spirit. The words of our Lord are weighty and solemn. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God. John 7 17. Honest Practical obedience is one of the keys of the gate of knowledge. Let us notice, secondly, in this passage, the singular knowledge and faith displayed by the Apostle Peter. We read that when our Lord said to his disciples, Who do you say that I am? Peter answered, The Christ of God. This was a noble confession, and one of which in these days we can hardly realize the full value. To estimate it aright, we should place ourselves in the position of our Lord's disciples. We should call to mind that the great and wise and learned of their own nation saw no beauty in their master and would not receive him as the Messiah. We should recollect that they saw no royal dignity about our Lord, no crown, no army, no earthly dominion. They saw nothing but a poor man who often had no place to lay his head. And yet, It was at this time and under these circumstances that Peter boldly declares his belief that Jesus is the Christ of God. Truly, this was a great faith. It was mingled, no doubt, with much of ignorance and imperfection, but such as it was, it was a faith that stood alone. He who had it was a remarkable man, 
and far in advance of the age in which he lived. We should pray frequently that God would raise up more Christians of the stamp of the Apostle Peter, erring and unstable and ignorant of his own heart as he sometimes proved to be, that blessed apostle was in some respects one in ten thousand. He had faith and zeal and love for Christ's cause when almost all Israel was unbelieving and cold. We need more men of this sort. We need men who are not afraid to stand alone and to cleave to Christ when the many are against Him. Such men, like Peter, may err sadly at times, but in the long run of life will do more good than any. Knowledge, no doubt, is an excellent thing, but knowledge without zeal and warmth will never do much for the world. Let us notice thirdly in this passage our Lord's prediction of His own coming death. We read that He said, The Son of Man must suffer many things, and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed and be raised up on the third day. These words, as we read or listen to them now, sound simple and plain, but beneath the surface of them lie two truths which ought to be carefully remembered. For one thing, our Lord's prediction shows us that His death upon the cross was the voluntary act of His own free will. He was not delivered up to Pilate and crucified because He could not help it and had no power to crush His enemies. He had undertaken to suffer for man's sin, the just for the unjust, that He might bring us to God. He had engaged to bear our sins as our substitute and surety, and He bore them willingly in His own person on the cruel tree. He saw Calvary and the cross before Him all the days of His ministry. He went up to them willingly, knowingly, and with full consent that He might pay our sin debts in His own blood. His death was not the death of a mere weak man who could not escape, but the death of one who was fully God and had undertaken to be punished in our stead. For another thing, our Lord's prediction shows us the blinding effect of prejudice on men's minds. As clear and plain as His words now seem to us, His disciples did not understand them. They heard as though they heard not. They couldn't understand that Messiah was to be cut off. They couldn't receive the doctrine that their own master must die. And hence, when his death really took place, they were astonished and confounded. As often as he had told them of it, they had never realized it as a fact. Let us watch and pray against prejudice. Many a zealous man has been grievously misled by it and has pierced himself through with many sorrows. Let us beware of allowing traditions, old preconceived notions, unsound interpretations, or baseless theories in religion to find root in our hearts. There is but one test of truth. What does the Scripture say? Before this, let every prejudice go down. Luke 9, 23-27 The Test of Discipleship. And he was saying to them all, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. For what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me, and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory, and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. But I say to you truthfully, there are some of those standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. These words of our Lord Jesus Christ contain three great lessons for all Christians. They apply to all ranks and classes without exception. They are intended for every age and time and for every branch of the visible church. We learn, for one thing, the absolute necessity of daily self denial. Every day we ought to crucify the flesh in order to overcome the world and to resist the devil. 
We ought to keep our bodies under control and bring them into subjection. We ought to be on our guard like soldiers in an enemy's country. We ought to fight a daily battle and war a daily warfare. The command of our master is clear and plain. If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now, what do we know of all this? Surely this is a question which ought to be asked. A little formal church going and a decent attendance at a place of worship can never be the Christianity of which Christ speaks in this place. Where is our self denial? Where is our daily carrying of the cross? Where is our following of Christ? Without a religion of this kind, we shall never be saved. A crucified Saviour will never be content to have a self pleasing, self indulging, worldly minded people. No self denial, no real grace. No cross, no crown. Those who belong to Christ Jesus, says Paul, have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Galatians 5.24. Whoever wishes to save his life, says the Lord Jesus, will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. We learn for another thing from our Lord's words in this passage the unspeakable value of the soul. A question is asked which admits of only one answer. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? The possession of the whole world and all that it contains would never make a man happy. Its pleasures are false and deceptive. Its riches, rank, and honors have no power to satisfy the heart. So long as we pursue them, they glitter and sparkle and seem desirable. The moment we have them, we find that they are empty bubbles and cannot make us content. And worst of all, when we possess this world's good things to the utmost bounds of our desire, we cannot keep them. Death comes in and separates us from all our property forever. Naked we came upon earth, and naked we go forth. Of all our possessions, we can carry nothing with us beyond the grave. Such is the world that occupies the whole attention of thousands. Such is the world for the sake of which millions are every year destroying their souls. The loss of the soul is the heaviest loss that can befall a man. The worst and most painful of diseases, the most distressing bankruptcy of fortune, and the most disastrous shipwrecks are a mere scratch of a pin compared to the loss of a soul. All other losses are bearable or are but for a short time, but the loss of the soul is forevermore. It is to lose God and Christ and heaven and glory and happiness to all eternity. It is to be cast away forever, helpless and hopeless in hell. What are we doing ourselves? Are we losing our souls? Are we, by willful neglect or by open sin, by sheer carelessness and idleness, or by deliberate breach of God's law, securing our own destruction? These questions demand an answer. The plain account of many professing Christians is this, that they are daily sinning against the sixth commandment. They are murdering their own souls. We learn in the last place from our Lord's words the guilt and danger of being ashamed of Christ and His words. We read that He says, For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. There are many ways of being ashamed of Christ. We are guilty of it whenever we are afraid of letting men know that we love his doctrines, his precepts, and his people. We are guilty of it whenever we allow the fear of man to prevail over us and to keep us back from letting others see that we are decided Christians. Whenever we act in this way, we are denying our master and committing a great sin. The wickedness of being ashamed of Christ is very great. It is a proof of unbelief. 
It shows that we care more for the praise of men whom we can see than that of God whom we cannot see. It is a proof of ingratitude. It shows that we fear confessing him before man who was not ashamed to die for us upon the cross. Wretched indeed are those who give way to this sin. Here, in this world, they are always miserable. A bad conscience robs them of peace. In the world to come, they can look for no comfort. If they will not confess Christ for a few years upon earth, then in the day of judgment they must expect to be disowned by Christ for all eternity. Let us resolve never to be ashamed of Christ. Of sin and worldliness we may well be ashamed. Of Christ and his cause we have no right to be ashamed at all. Boldness in Christ's service always brings its own reward. The boldest Christian is always the happiest man. Luke 9:28-36 The Transfiguration Some eight days after these sayings, he took along Peter and John and James, and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face became different, and his clothing became white and gleaming. And behold, two men were talking with him, and they were Moses and Elijah, who, appearing in glory, were speaking of his departure which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions had been overcome with sleep, but when they were fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. And as these were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you, and one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not realizing what he was saying. While he was saying this, a cloud formed and began to overshadow them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. Then a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my Son, my Chosen One, listen to Him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent and reported to no one in those days any of the things which they had seen. The event described in these verses, commonly called the Transfiguration, is one of the most remarkable events in the history of our Lord's earthly ministry. It is one of those passages which we should always read or listen to with particular thankfulness. It lifts a corner of the veil which hangs over the world to come and throws light on some of the deepest truths of our religion. In the first place, this passage shows us something of the glory which Christ will have at his second coming. We read that, while he was praying, the appearance of his face became different, and his clothing became white and gleaming, and that the disciples who were with him saw his glory. We needn't doubt that this marvelous vision was meant to encourage and strengthen our Lord's disciples. They had just been hearing of his cross and death and the self-denial and sufferings to which they must submit themselves if they would be saved. They were now cheered by a glimpse of the glory that would follow and the reward which all faithful servants of their Master would one day receive. They had seen their Master's day of weakness. They now saw for a few minutes a pattern and specimen of His future power and glory. Let us take comfort in the thought that there are good things laid up in store for all true Christians which shall make ample amends for the afflictions of this present time. Now is the season for carrying the cross and sharing in our Saviour's humiliation. The crown, the kingdom, the glory are all yet to come. Christ and His people are now, like David in the cave of Adullam, despised and lightly esteemed by the world. There seems no form or loveliness in him or in his service. But the hour is coming, and will soon be here, when Christ shall take to himself his great power and reign and put down every enemy under his feet. And then the glory which was first seen for a few minutes by three witnesses on the Mount of Transfiguration shall be seen by all the world and never hidden to all eternity. In the second place, this passage shows us the safety of all true believers who have been removed from this world. 
We are told that when our Lord appeared in glory, Moses and Elijah were seen with him, standing and speaking with him. Moses had been dead nearly fifteen hundred years. Elijah had been taken up by a whirlwind from the earth more than nine hundred years before this time. Yet here these holy men were seen once more alive, and not only alive, but also in glory. Let us take comfort in the blessed thought that there is a resurrection and a life to come. All is not over when the last breath is drawn. There is another world beyond the grave. But above all, let us take comfort in the thought that until the day dawns and the resurrection begins, the people of God are safe with Christ. There is much about their present condition, no doubt, which is deeply mysterious. Where is their local habitation? What knowledge have they of things on earth? These are questions we cannot answer. But let it suffice us to know that Jesus is taking care of them and will bring them with him at the last day. He showed Moses and Elijah to his disciples on the Mount of Transfiguration, and he will show us all who have fallen asleep in him at his second coming. Our brothers and sisters in Christ are in good keeping. They are not lost, but have only gone before us. In the third place, this passage shows us that the Old Testament saints in glory take a deep interest in Christ's atoning death. We are told that when Moses and Elijah appeared in glory with our Lord on the Mount of Transfiguration, they were talking with him. And what was the subject of their conversation? We don't have to make conjectures and guesses about this. Luke tells us they were speaking of his departure which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. They knew the meaning of that death. They knew how much depended on it. Therefore, they were speaking about it. It is a grave mistake to suppose that holy men and women under the Old Testament knew nothing about the sacrifice which Christ was to offer up for the sin of the world. Their light, no doubt, was less clear than ours. They saw things afar off and indistinctly, which we see, as it were, close at hand. But there is not the slightest proof that any Old Testament saint ever looked to any other atonement for sin but that which God promised to make by sending the Messiah. From Abel downwards, the whole company of old believers appears to have been ever resting on a promised sacrifice and a blood of almighty efficacy yet to be revealed. From the beginning of the world, there has never been but one foundation of hope and peace for sinners the death of an almighty mediator between God and man. That foundation is the central truth of all revealed religion. It was the subject of which Moses and Elijah were seen speaking when they appeared in glory. They spoke of the atoning death of Christ. Let us take heed that this death of Christ is the ground of all our confidence. Nothing else will give us comfort in the hour of death and the day of judgment. Our own works are all defective and imperfect. Our sins are more in number than the hairs of our heads. Psalm 40, 12. Christ dying for our sins and rising again for our justification must be our only plea if we wish to be saved. Happy is that man who has learned to cease from his own works and to trust in nothing but the cross of Christ. If saints in glory see in Christ's death so much beauty that they must talk of it, then how much more ought sinners on earth to see in it? In the last place, the passage shows us the immense distance between Christ and all other teachers whom God has given to man. We are told that when Peter, not realizing what he was saying, proposed to make three tabernacles on the mount, one for Jesus, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, as if all three deserved equal honor, this proposal was at once rebuked in a remarkable way. This is my Son, my Chosen One. Listen to Him. That voice was the voice of God the Father, conveying both reproof and instruction. That voice proclaimed to Peter's ear that however great Moses and Elijah might be, 
one stood before him far greater than they. They were but servants, he was the king's son. They were but stars, he was the sun. They were but witnesses, he was the truth. Forever let that solemn word of the Father ring in our ears and give the keynote to our religion. Let us honor ministers for their master's sake. Let us follow them only as long as they follow Christ. But let it be our principal aim to hear Christ's voice and follow Him wherever He goes. Let some talk, if they will, of the voice of the church. Let others be content to say, I hear this preacher or that clergyman. Let us never be satisfied unless the Spirit witnesses within us that we hear Christ Himself and are His disciples. Luke 9, 37-45 The Healing of a Boy with an Evil Spirit On the next day, when they came down from the mountain, a large crowd met him, and a man from the crowd shouted, saying, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he is my only boy, and a spirit seizes him, and he suddenly screams, and it throws him into a convulsion with foaming at the mouth and only with difficulty does it leave him, mauling him as it leaves. I begged your disciples to cast it out, and they could not. And Jesus answered and said, You unbelieving and perverted generation, how long shall I be with you and put up with you? Bring your son here. While he was still approaching, the demon slammed him to the ground and threw him into a convulsion. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. And they were all amazed at the greatness of God. But while every one was marveling at all that he was doing, he said to his disciples, Let these words sink into your ears, for the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. But they did not understand this statement, and it was concealed from them so that they would not perceive it, and they were afraid to ask him about this statement. The event described in these verses took place immediately after the Transfiguration. The Lord Jesus, we should remark, did not tarry long on the Mount of Olives. His communion with Moses and Elijah was very short. He soon returned to his usual work of doing good to a sin stricken world. In his life on earth, to receive honor and have visions of glory was the exception. To minister to others, to heal all who were oppressed by the devil, to do acts of mercy to sinners, was the rule. Happy are those Christians who have learned from Jesus to live for others more than for themselves, and who understand that it is more blessed to give than to receive. Acts 20.35 We have first in these verses an example of what a parent should do when he is troubled about his children. We are told of a man in severe distress about his only son. This son was possessed by an evil spirit and grievously tormented by him both in body and soul. In his distress, the father makes supplication to our Lord Jesus Christ for relief. Teacher, he says, I beg you to look at my son. There are many Christian fathers and mothers at this day who are just as miserable about their children as the man of whom we are hearing about. The son who was once the desire of their eyes, and in whom their lives were bound up, turns out to be a thief, a prodigal, and a companion of sinners. The daughter, who was once the flower of the family, and of whom they said, This girl shall be the comfort of our old age, becomes self-willed, worldly-minded, and a lover of pleasure more than a lover of God. Their hearts are well near broken. The iron seems to enter into their souls. The devil appears to triumph over them and rob them of their choicest jewels. They are ready to cry, I shall go sorrowing to the grave, what good shall my life do to me? Now, what should a father or mother do in a case like this? They should do as the man before us did. They should go to Jesus in prayer and cry to him about their child. They should spread before that merciful Saviour the tale of their sorrows and entreat Him to help them. 
Great is the power of prayer and intercession. The child of many prayers shall seldom be cast away. God's time of conversion may not be ours. He may think fit to prove our faith by keeping us long waiting. But so long as a child lives and a parent prays, we have no right to despair about that child's soul. We have, secondly, in these verses, an example of Christ's readiness to show mercy to young people. We are told in the case before us that the prayer of the afflicted parent was graciously granted. He said to him, Bring your son here. And then he rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the boy and gave him back to his father. We have many similar cases in the Gospels. The daughter of Jairus, the nobleman's son at Capernaum, the daughter of the Canaanite woman, the widow's son at Nain, are all instances of our Lord's interest in those who are young. The young are exactly those whom the devil labors to lead captive and make his own. The young seem to have been exactly the people whom our Lord took a special delight in helping. He plucked three out of the very jaws of death. Two, as in the case before us, he rescued from the complete dominion of the devil. There is a meaning in facts like these. They are not recorded without a special purpose. They are meant to encourage all who try to do good to the souls of the young. They are meant to remind us that young men and young women are special objects of interest to Christ. They supply us with an antidote to the common idea that it is useless to press religion on the attention of young people. Such an idea, let us remember, comes from the devil and not from Christ. He who cast out the evil spirit from the child before us still lives and is still mighty to save. Let us then work on and try to do good to the young. Whatever the world may think, Jesus is well pleased. We have lastly in these verses an example of the spiritual ignorance which may be found even in the hearts of good men. We are told that our Lord said to his disciples, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They had heard the same thing from his lips a little more than a week before, but now, as then, the words seemed lost upon them. They heard as though they heard not. They couldn't realize the fact that their master was to die. They couldn't realize the great truth that Christ was to be cut off before he was to reign and that this cutting off was a literal death upon the cross. It is written, But they did not understand this statement, and it was concealed from them so that they would not perceive it. Such slowness of understanding may much surprise us at this period of the world. We are apt to forget the power of early habits of thought and national prejudices in the midst of which the disciples had been trained. The throne of David, says a preacher, did so fill their eyes that they could not see the cross. Above all, we forget the enormous difference between the position we occupy who know the history of the crucifixion and the scriptures which it fulfilled, and the position of a believing Jew who lived before Christ died and before the veil was torn in two. Whatever we may think of it, the ignorance of the disciples should teach us two useful lessons which we shall all do well to learn. For one thing, let us learn that men may understand spiritual things very feebly and yet be true children of God. The head may be very dull when the heart is right. Grace is far better than gifts. Faith is far better than knowledge. If a man has faith and grace enough to give up all for Christ's sake and to take up the cross and follow him, he shall be saved in spite of much ignorance. Christ shall own him at the last day. Finally, let us learn to bear with ignorance in others and to deal patiently with beginners in religion. Let us not make men offenders for a word. Let us not set our brother down as having no grace because he does not exhibit clear knowledge. Has he faith in Christ? Does he love Christ? These are the principal things. If Jesus could endure so much weakness in his disciples, then we may surely do likewise. 
Luke 9, 46-50 Who will be the greatest? An argument started among them as to which of them might be the greatest. But Jesus, knowing what they were thinking in their heart, took a child and stood him by his side, and said to them, Whoever receives this child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For the one who is least among all of you, this is the one who is great. John answered and said, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to prevent him because he does not follow along with us. But Jesus said to him, Do not hinder him, for he who is not against you is for you. The verses we have now heard contain two most important warnings. They are directed against two of the most common evils which are to be found in the church of Christ. He who gave them knew well what was in the heart of man. Well would it have been for the church of Christ if his words in this passage had received more attention. In the first place, the Lord Jesus gives us a warning against pride and self-conceit. We are told that an argument started among them as to which of them might be the greatest. Astonishing as it may seem, this little company of fishermen and publicans was not beyond the plague of a self-seeking and ambitious spirit. Filled with the vain notion that our Lord's kingdom was to appear immediately, they were ready to wrangle about their place and priority in it. Each thought that his own claim was the strongest. Each thought that his own worth and right to honor was most unquestionable. Each thought that whatever place was assigned to his brethren, a principal place ought to be assigned to himself. And all this happened in the company of Christ himself, and under the noontide blaze of his teaching. Such is the heart of man. There is something very instructive in this fact. It ought to sink down deeply into the heart of every Christian reader and listener. Of all sins, there is none against which we have such need to watch and pray as pride. It is a pestilence which walks in darkness, and a sickness which destroys at noonday. No sin is so deeply rooted in our nature as pride. It cleaves to us like our skin. Its roots never entirely die. They are ready at any moment to spring up and exhibit a most pernicious vitality. At the same time, no sin is so senseless and deceitful. It can wear the garb of humility itself. It can lurk in the hearts of the ignorant, the ungifted, and the poor, as well as in the minds of the great, the learned, and the rich. It is a quaint and homely saying, but only too true that no pope has ever received such honor as Pope Self. Let a prayer for humility and the spirit of a little child form part of our daily supplications. Of all creatures, none has so little right to be proud as man, and of all men, none ought to be so humble as the Christian. Is it really true? that we confess ourselves to be miserable sinners and daily debtors to mercy and grace? Are we the followers of Jesus who was gentle and humble in heart and emptied himself for our sakes? Then let that same mind be in us which was in Christ Jesus. Let us lay aside all proud thoughts and self-conceit. In lowliness of mind, let us esteem others as better than ourselves. Let us be ready on all occasions to take the lowest place, and let the words of our Saviour ring in our ears continually, The one who is least among all of you, this is the one who is great. In the second place, our Lord Jesus Christ gives us a warning against a bigoted and narrow-minded spirit. As in the preceding verses, so here, the occasion of the warning is supplied by the conduct of his own disciples. We read that John said to him, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to prevent him because he does not follow along with us. Who this man was and why he did not associate with the disciples, we do not know. 
But we do know that he was doing a good work in casting out devils, and that he was doing what he did in the name of Christ. And yet John says, We tried to prevent him. Very striking is the reply which the Lord at once gave him Do not hinder him, for he who is not against you is for you. The conduct of John and the disciples on this occasion is an illustration of the sameness of human nature in every age. Thousands in every period of church history have spent their lives in copying John's mistake. They have labored to stop every man who will not work for Christ in their way from working for Christ at all. They have imagined in their petty self-conceit that no man can be a soldier of Christ unless he wears their uniform and fights in their regiment. They have been ready to say of every Christian who does not see everything with their eyes, Forbid him, forbid him, for he does not follow with us. The solemn remark of our Lord Jesus Christ on this occasion demands our special notice. He pronounces no opinion upon the conduct of the man of whom John speaks. He neither praises nor blames him for following an independent course and not working with his disciples. He simply declares that he must not be forbidden, and that those who work the same kind of work that we do should be regarded not as enemies but allies. He who is not against us is for us. The principle laid down in this passage is of great importance. A right understanding of it will prove most useful to us in these latter days. The divisions and varieties of opinion which exist among Christians are undeniably very great. These schisms and separations which are continually arising about church government and modes of worship are very perplexing to tender consciences. Shall we approve those divisions? We cannot do so. Union is strength. The divisions of Christians are one cause of the slow progress of vital Christianity. Shall we denounce and hold up to public reprobation all who will not agree to work with us and try to oppose Satan in our own way? It is useless to do so. Harsh words have never yet made men of one mind. Unity was never yet brought about by force. What then ought we to do? We must leave alone those who do not agree with us and wait quietly until God shall think fit to bring us together. Whatever we may think of our divisions, the words of our Lord must never be forgotten. Do not hinder them. The plain truth is that we are all too ready to say, We are the people, and with us wisdom will die. Job 12, 2. We forget that no individual church on earth has an absolute monopoly on all wisdom, and that people may be right in the essential points without agreeing with us. We must learn to be thankful if sin is opposed, and the gospel preached, and the devil's kingdom pulled down, though the work may not be done exactly in the way we like. We must try to believe that men may be true hearted followers of Jesus Christ, and yet for some wise reason may be kept back from seeing all things in religion just as we do. Above all, we must praise God if souls are converted and Christ is magnified no matter who the preacher may be and to what church he may belong. Happy are those who can say with Paul, If Christ is preached, I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice. Philippians 1, 18. And with Moses, Are you jealous for my sake? I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets, and that the Lord would put His Spirit upon them all. Numbers 11, 29. Luke 9, 51-56 Samaritan Opposition When the days were approaching for his ascension, he was determined to go to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers on ahead of him, and they went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make arrangements for him. But they did not receive him, because he was traveling toward Jerusalem. When his disciples James and John saw this, they said, Lord, Do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them, and said, You do not know what kind of spirit you are of, for the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went on to another village. 
Let us notice in these verses the steady determination with which our Lord Jesus Christ regarded his own crucifixion and death. We read that when the days were approaching for his ascension, he was determined to go to Jerusalem. He knew full well what was before him the betrayal, the unjust trial, the mockery, the scourging, the crown of thorns, the spitting, the nails, the spear, the agony on the cross. All were doubtless spread before his mind's eye like a picture. But he never flinched for a moment from the work that he had undertaken. His heart was set on paying the price of our redemption and on going even to the prison of the grave as our surety. He was full of tender love towards sinners. It was the desire of his whole soul to procure salvation for them. And so, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. Hebrews 12, 2. Forever let us bless God that we have such a ready and willing Saviour. Forever let us remember that as he was ready to suffer, so he is always ready to save. The man who comes to Christ by faith should never doubt Christ's willingness to receive him. The mere fact that the Son of God willingly came into the world to die, and willingly suffered, should silence such doubts entirely. All the unwillingness is on the part of man, not of Christ. It consists in the ignorance and pride and unbelief and half heartedness of the sinner himself. But there is nothing lacking in Christ. Let us strive and pray that the same mind may be in us which was in our blessed Master. Like him, let us be willing to go anywhere, do anything, suffer anything, when the path of duty is clear and the voice of God calls. Let us set our faces resolutely to our work when our work is plainly marked out, and drink our bitter cups patiently when they come from the Father's hand. Let us notice, secondly, in these verses, the unusual conduct of two of the apostles, James and John. We are told that a certain Samaritan village refused to show hospitality to our Lord. They did not receive him because he was traveling toward Jerusalem. And then we read of a strange proposal which James and John made. They said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? Here was zeal indeed, and zeal of a most plausible kind, zeal for the honor of Christ. Here was zeal justified and supported by a scriptural example, and the example of no lesser prophet than Elijah but it was not a zeal according to knowledge. The two disciples, in their zeal, forgot that circumstances alter cases, and that the same action which may be right and justifiable at one time may be wrong and unjustifiable at another. They forgot that punishments should always be proportioned to offenses, and that to destroy a whole village of ignorant people for a single act of discourtesy Would have been both unjust and cruel. In short, the proposal of James and John was a wrong and rash one. They meant well, but they greatly erred. Facts like this in the Gospels are carefully recorded for our learning. Let us see to it that we mark them well and treasure them up in our minds. It is possible to have much zeal for Christ and yet to exhibit it in most unholy and unchristian ways. It is possible to mean well and have good intentions and yet to make most grievous mistakes in our actions. It is possible to imagine that we have Scripture on our side and to support our conduct by scriptural quotations and yet to commit serious errors. It is as clear as daylight from this and other cases related in the Bible that it is not enough to be zealous and well meaning. Very grave faults are frequently committed with good intentions. From no quarter, perhaps, has the church received so much injury as from ignorant but well meaning men. We must seek to have knowledge as well as zeal. Zeal without knowledge is an army without a general 
and a ship without a rudder. We must pray that we may understand how to make a right application of the Scripture. The Word is, no doubt, a lamp to our feet and a light to our path, but it must be the Word rightly handled and properly applied. Let us notice, lastly, in these verses, what a solemn rebuke our Lord gives to persecution carried on under the guise of religion. We are told that when James and John made the strange proposal on which we have just been dwelling, Jesus said, You do not know what kind of spirit you are of, for the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Uncourteous as the Samaritan villagers had been, their conduct was not to be repaid by violence. The mission of the Son of Man was to do good when men would receive Him, but never to do harm. His kingdom was to be extended by patient continuance in well-doing and by meekness and gentleness in suffering, but never by violence and severity. No saying of our Lord's, perhaps, has been so totally overlooked by the Church of Christ as that which is now before us. Nothing can be imagined more contrary to the will of Christ than the religious wars and persecutions which disgrace the annals of church history. Thousands and tens of thousands have been put to death for their religion's sake all over the world. Thousands have been burned, or shot, or hanged, or drowned, or beheaded in the name of the gospel, and those who have slain them have actually believed that they were doing God service. Unfortunately, they have only shown their own ignorance of the spirit of the gospel and the mind of Christ. Let it be a settled principle in our minds that whatever men's errors may be in religion, we must never harm or persecute them. Let us, if needful, argue with them, reason with them, and try to show them a more excellent way. But let us never take up worldly weapons to promote the spread of truth. Let us never be tempted, directly or indirectly, to persecute any man under pretense of the glory of Christ and the good of the church. Let us rather remember that the religion which men profess from fear of death or dread of penalties is worth nothing at all, and that if we swell our ranks by fear and threatening, in reality we gain nothing. The weapons of our warfare, says Paul, are not of the flesh. 2 Corinthians 10, 4. The appeals that we make must be to men's consciences and wills. The arguments that we use must not be sword or fire or prison, but doctrines and precepts and texts. It is a quaint and simple saying, but as true in the church as it is in the army, that one volunteer is worth ten men who have been pressed into service. Luke 9.57-62 The Cost of Following Jesus As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And he said to another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, permit me first to go and bury my father. But he said to him, Allow the dead to bury their own dead, but as for you, go and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. Another also said, I will follow you, Lord, but first permit me to say goodbye to those at home. But Jesus said to him, No one, after putting his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. The passage of Scripture we have just heard is a very remarkable one. It contains three short sayings of peculiar solemnity addressed by our Lord Jesus Christ to three different people. We know nothing of the names of those people. We know nothing of the effect which our Lord's words produced upon them. But we need not doubt that each was addressed in the way which his character required, and we may be sure that the passage is especially intended to promote self inquiry. The first of these sayings was addressed to one who offered to be a disciple unconditionally and of his own accord. Lord, said this man, I will follow you wherever you go. That offer sounded good. It was a step in advance of many. 
Thousands of people heard our Lord's sermons who never thought of saying what this man said. Yet he who made this offer was evidently speaking without thought. He had never considered what discipleship meant. He had never counted the cost, and hence he needed the grave reply from Jesus which his offer called forth. The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. He must weigh well what he was taking in hand. He must not suppose that Christ's service was all pleasure and smooth sailing. Was he prepared for this? Was he ready to suffer hardship as a good soldier of Christ Jesus? 2 Timothy 2 3. If not, he had better withdraw his application to be a disciple. Let us learn from our Lord's words on this occasion that he would have all who profess and call themselves Christians be reminded that they must carry the cross. They must count on being despised and afflicted and tried like their master. Jesus would have no man enlisted on false pretenses. He would have it distinctly understood that there is a battle to be fought and a race to be run and a work to be done, and many hard things to be endured if we propose to follow him. Salvation he is ready to bestow without money and without price. Grace along the way and glory in the end shall be given to every sinner who comes to him. But he would not have us be ignorant that we shall have deadly enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil, and that many will hate us, slander us, and persecute us if we become his disciples. He doesn't wish to discourage us, but he does wish us to know the truth. Well would it have been for the church if our Lord's warning had been more frequently pondered. Many a man begins a religious life full of warmth and zeal, but by and by loses all his first love and turns back again to the world. He liked the new uniform and the bounty money and the name of a Christian soldier, but he never considered the watching and warring and wounds and conflicts which Christian soldiers must endure. Let us never forget this lesson. It need not make us afraid to begin serving Christ, but it ought to make us begin carefully, humbly, and with much prayer for grace. If we are not ready to take part in the afflictions of Christ, then we must never expect to share His glory. The second of our Lord's sayings is addressed to one whom Jesus invited to follow Him. The answer he received was a very remarkable one. Lord, said the man, permit me first to go and bury my father. The thing he requested was in itself harmless, but the time at which the request was made was unseasonable. Affairs of far greater importance than even a father's funeral demanded the man's immediate attention. There would always be plenty of people ready and fit to take care of a funeral. But there was at that moment a pressing need of laborers to do Christ's work in the world. And hence the man's request drew from our Lord the solemn reply Allow the dead to bury their own dead, but as for you, go and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. Let us learn from this saying to beware of allowing family and social duties to interfere with our duty to Christ. Funerals and marriages and visits of courtesy and the like unquestionably are not in themselves sinful. But when they are allowed to absorb a believer's time and keep him back from any plain Christian duty, they become a snare to his soul. That the unconverted people of the world should allow these kinds of things to occupy all their time and thoughts is not astonishing. They know nothing higher and better, and more important. Allow the dead to bury their own dead. But the heirs of glory and children of the King of Kings should be men of a different stamp. They should declare plainly by their conduct that the world to come is the great reality which fills their thoughts. They shouldn't be ashamed to let men see that they have no time either to rejoice or to sorrow, like others who have no hope. Their master's work waits for them and their master's work must have the chief place in their hearts. They are God's priests in the world, 
and, like the priests of old, their mourning must be kept carefully within bounds. Leviticus 21, 1. Weeping, says an old preacher, must not hinder working, and mourning must not be allowed to run into excess. The third of our Lord's sayings in this passage was addressed to one who volunteered to follow him, but marred the grace of his offer by interposing a request. He said, I will follow you, Lord, but first permit me to say goodbye to those at home. The answer he received shows plainly that the man's heart was not yet thoroughly engaged in Christ's service, and that he was therefore unfit to be a disciple. But Jesus said to him, No one, after putting his hand to the plough and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. We learn from this saying that it is impossible to serve Christ with a divided heart. If we are looking back at anything in this world, then we are not fit to be disciples. Those who look back, like Lot's wife, want to go back. Jesus will not share his throne with anyone. No. Not with our dearest relatives. He must have all our heart or none of it. No doubt we are to honor father and mother and love all those around us, but when love for Christ and love for relatives come in collision, Christ must have the preference. We must be ready, like Abraham, if needs be, to leave our kindred for Christ's sake. We must be prepared in case of necessity, like Moses to turn our backs even on those who have brought us up, if God calls us and the path of duty is plain. Such decided conduct may entail great trials on our affections. It may crush our hearts to go contrary to the opinions of those we love, but such conduct may sometimes be positively necessary to our salvation, and without it, when it becomes necessary, we are unfit for the kingdom of God. The good soldier will not allow his heart to be entangled too much with his home. If he daily gives way to unmanly whimperings about those he has left behind him, then he will never be fit for a battle. His present duties, the watching, the marching, the fighting, must have the principal place in his thoughts. So must it be with all who would serve Christ. They must beware of softness spoiling their characters as Christians. They must endure hardness as good soldiers of Jesus Christ. Let us leave the whole passage with many searchings of heart. The times are undoubtedly much changed since our Lord spoke these words. Not many are called to make such real sacrifices for Christ's sake as when Christ was upon earth. But the heart of man never changes. The difficulties of salvation are still very great. The atmosphere of the world is still very unfavorable to spiritual religion. There is still need for thorough, unflinching, wholehearted decision if we want to reach heaven. Let us aim at nothing less than this firmness of decision. Let us be willing to do anything and suffer anything and give up everything for Christ's sake. It may cost us something for a few years, but great will be our reward in eternity. Chapter 10 Luke 10, 1-7 Jesus sends out the seventy. Now after this the Lord appointed seventy others and sent them in pairs ahead of him to every city and place where he himself was going to come. And he was saying to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go, behold, I send you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Carry no money belt, no bag, no shoes, and greet no one on the way. Whatever house you enter, first say, Peace be to this house. If a man of peace is there, your peace will rest on him, but if not, it will return to you. Stay in that house, eating and drinking what they give you, for the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not keep moving from house to house. 
The verses before us relate a circumstance which is not recorded by any gospel writer except Luke. That circumstance is our Lord's appointment of seventy disciples to go before Him in addition to the twelve apostles. We don't know the names of any of these disciples. Their subsequent history has not been revealed to us. But the instructions with which they are sent forth are deeply interesting and deserve the close attention of all ministers and teachers of the gospel. The first point in our Lord's charge to the seventy disciples is the importance of prayer and intercession. This is the leading thought with which our Lord opens his address. Before he tells his ambassadors what to do, he first bids them to pray. Beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Prayer is one of the best and most powerful means of helping forward the cause of Christ in the world. It is a means within the reach of all who have the spirit of adoption. Not all believers have money to give to missions. Very few have great intellectual gifts or extensive influence among men. But all believers can pray for the success of the gospel, and they ought to pray for it daily. Many and marvelous are the answers to prayer which are recorded for our learning in the Bible. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. James 5.16 Prayer is one of the principal weapons which the minister of the gospel ought to use. To be a true successor of the apostles, he must give himself to prayer as well as to the ministry of the word. Acts 6.4 He must not only use the sword of the Spirit, but also pray always with all prayer and supplication. Ephesians 6, 17-18. This is the way to win a blessing on his own ministry. This, above all, is the way to procure helpers to carry on Christ's work. Colleges may educate men. Bishops may ordain them. Patrons may give them wages. But God alone can raise up and send forth laborers who will do work among souls. For a constant supply of such laborers, let us daily pray. The second point in our Lord's charge to the seventy disciples is the perilous nature of the work in which they were about to be engaged. He doesn't keep back from them the dangers and trials which are before them. He doesn't enlist them under false pretenses, or prophesy smooth things, or promise them unvarying success. He tells them plainly what they must expect. Behold, he says, I send you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. These words, no doubt, had a special reference to the lifetime of those to whom they were spoken. We see their fulfillment in the many persecutions described in the Acts of the Apostles. But we mustn't conceal from ourselves that the words describe a state of things which may be seen at this very day. So long as the church stands, Believers must expect to be like lambs in the midst of wolves. They must make up their minds to be hated and persecuted and ill treated by those who have no real religion. They must look for no favor from unconverted people, for they will find none. It was a strong but a true saying of Martin Luther that Cain will murder Abel, if he can, to the very end of the world. Do not be surprised, says John, if the world hates you. All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus, says Paul, will be persecuted. 1 John 3.13, 2 Timothy 3.12 The third point in our Lord's charge to the seventy disciples is the thorough devotion to their work which he enjoined upon them. They were to abstain even from the appearance of covetousness, or love of money, or luxury. Carry no money belt, no bag, no shoes. They were to behave like men who had no time to waste on the empty compliments and conventional courtesies of the world. Greet no one on the way. These remarkable words must doubtless be interpreted with some qualification. The time came when our Lord Himself, at the end of His ministry, said to the disciples, Whoever has a money belt is to take it along, likewise also a bag. Luke 22, 36. 
the Apostle Paul was not ashamed to use greetings. The Apostle Peter expressly commands us to be sympathetic, brotherly, kind hearted, and humble in spirit. 1 Peter 3 8. But still, after every qualification, there remains a deep lesson beneath these words of our Lord which ought not to be overlooked. They teach us that ministers and teachers of the gospel should beware of allowing the world to eat up their time and thoughts and to hinder them in their spiritual work. They teach us that care about money and excessive attention to what are called the courtesies of life are mighty snares in the way of Christ's laborers, and snares into which they must take heed lest they fall. Let us consider these things. They concern ministers especially, but they concern all Christians more or less. Let us strive to show the men of the world that we have no time for their mode of living. Let us show them that we find life too precious to be spent in perpetual feasting, leisure, and pleasure, as if there were no death or judgment or life to come. By all means, let us be courteous, but let us not make the courtesies of life into an idol before which everything else must bow down. Let us declare plainly that we seek a country beyond the grave, and that we have no time for that incessant round of eating and drinking and dressing and civility and exchange of compliments in which so many try to find their happiness, but evidently try in vain. Let our principle be that of Nehemiah. I am doing a great work, and I cannot come down. Nehemiah 6 3. The fourth point in our Lord's charge to the seventy disciples is the simple minded and contented spirit which he bade them to exhibit. Wherever they tarried in travelling about upon their master's business, they were to avoid the appearance of being fickle, changeable, delicate livers, or hard to please about food and lodging. They were to eat and drink such things as were given them. They were not to keep moving from house to house. Instructions like these, no doubt, have a primary and special reference to the ministers of the gospel. They are the men, above all, who, in their style of living, ought to be careful to avoid the spirit of the world. Simplicity in food and household arrangements, and readiness to put up with any accommodation, so long as health can be preserved uninjured, should always be the mark of the man of God. Once let a preacher get the reputation of being fond of eating and drinking and worldly comforts, and his ministerial usefulness is at an end. The sermon about unseen realities will produce little effect when the life preaches the importance of the things which are visible. But we ought not to confine our Lord's instructions to ministers alone. They ought to speak loudly to the consciences of all believers, of all who are called by the Holy Spirit, and made priests unto God. They ought to remind us of the necessity of simplicity and unworldliness in our daily life. We must beware of thinking too much about our meals and our furniture and our houses and all those many things which concern the life of the body. We must strive to live like men whose first thoughts are about the immortal soul. We must endeavor to pass through the world like men who are not yet at home, and are not overly troubled about the food they meet with on the road and at the inn. Blessed are those who feel like pilgrims and strangers in this life, and whose best things are all to come. Luke 10, 8-16 Further instructions of Christ to the disciples. Whatever city you enter and they receive you, eat what is set before you, and heal those in it who are sick, and say to them, The kingdom of God has come near to you. But whatever city you enter and they do not receive you, go out into its streets and say, Even the dust of your city which clings to our feet we wipe off in protest against you. Yet be sure of this, that the kingdom of God has come near. I say to you, it will be more tolerable in that day for Sodom than for that city. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the miracles had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, which occurred in you, 
they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will not be exalted to heaven, will you? You will be brought down to Hades. The one who listens to you listens to me, and the one who rejects you rejects me, and he who rejects me rejects the one who sent me. These verses comprise the second part of our Lord Jesus Christ's charge to the seventy disciples. Its lessons, like those of the first part, have a special reference to ministers and teachers of the gospel, but they contain truths which deserve the serious attention of all members of the Church of Christ. The first point we should notice in these verses is the simplicity of the tidings which our Lord commanded some of His first messengers to proclaim. We read that they were commissioned to say, The kingdom of God has come near to you. These words we should probably regard as the keynote to all that the seventy disciples said. We can hardly suppose that they said nothing else but this single sentence. The words, no doubt, implied far more to a Jewish hearer at the time when they were spoken than they convey to our minds at the present day. To a well instructed Israelite, they would sound like an announcement that the times of Messiah had come, that the long-promised Saviour was about to be revealed, and that the wealth of all nations was about to appear. Haggai 2.7 All this is unquestionably true. Such an announcement, suddenly made by seventy men, evidently convinced of the truth of what they said, traveling over a thickly populated country, could hardly fail to draw attention and excite inquiry. But still, the message is particularly and strikingly simple. It may be doubted whether the modern way of teaching Christianity as a general rule is sufficiently simple. It is a certain fact that deep reasoning and elaborate arguments are not the weapons by which God is generally pleased to convert souls. Simple, plain statements boldly and solemnly made, and made in such a manner that they are evidently felt and believed by him who makes them, seem to have the most effect on hearts and consciences. Parents and teachers of the young, ministers and missionaries, scripture readers and district visitors, would all do well to remember this. We need not be so anxious as we often are about shielding and proving and demonstrating and reasoning out the doctrines of the gospel. Not one soul in a hundred was ever brought to Christ in this fashion. We need more simple, plain, solemn, earnest, affectionate statements of simple gospel truths. We may safely leave such statements to work and take care of themselves. They are arrows from God's own quiver, and will often pierce hearts which have not been touched by the most eloquent sermon. The second point we should notice in these verses is the great sinfulness of those who reject the offers of Christ's gospel. Our Lord declares that it will be more tolerable in that day for Sodom than for those who do not receive the message of his disciples. And he proceeds to say that the guilt of Chorazin and Bethsaida, cities in Galilee where he had often preached and worked miracles, but where the people had nevertheless not repented, was greater than the guilt of Tyre and Sidon. Declarations like these are particularly solemn. They throw light on some truths which men are very apt to forget. They teach us that all will be judged according to their spiritual light, and that from those who have enjoyed most religious privileges, most will be required. They teach us the exceeding hardness and unbelief of the human heart, It was possible to hear Christ preach and to see Christ's miracles and yet to remain unconverted. More importantly, they teach us that man is responsible for the state of his own soul. Those who reject the gospel and remain impenitent and unbelieving are not merely objects of pity and compassion, but are also deeply guilty and blameworthy in God's sight. God called, but they refused. God spoke to them, but they would not regard him. The condemnation of the unbelieving will be strictly just. Their blood will be upon their own heads. 
the judge of all the earth, will do right. Let us lay these things to heart and beware of unbelief. It is not open sin and flagrant debauchery alone which ruin souls. We have only to sit still and do nothing when the gospel is pressed on our acceptance, and we shall find ourselves one day in the bottomless pit. We need not run into any excess of heinous sin. We need not openly oppose true religion. We have only to remain cold, careless, indifferent, unmoved, and unaffected, and our end will be in eternal hell. This was the ruin of Chorazin and Bethsaida, and this, it may be feared, will be the ruin of thousands as long as the world stands. No sin makes less noise, but none so surely damns the soul as unbelief. The last point that we should notice in these verses is the honor which the Lord Jesus is pleased to put upon his faithful ministers. We see this brought out in the words with which he concludes his charge to the seventy disciples. He says to them, The one who listens to you listens to me, and the one who rejects you rejects me, and he who rejects me rejects the one who sent me. The language here used by our Lord is very remarkable, and the more so when we remember that it was addressed to the seventy disciples and not to the twelve apostles. The lesson it is intended to convey is clear and unmistakable. It teaches us that ministers are to be regarded as Christ's messengers and ambassadors to a sinful world. So long as they do their work faithfully, they are worthy of honor and respect for their master's sake. Those who despise them are not despising them so much as their master. Those who reject the terms of salvation which they are commissioned to proclaim are doing an injury not so much to them as to their king. Let us remember these things in order that we may form a right estimate of the position of a minister of the gospel. The subject is one on which error abounds. On the one side, the minister's office is regarded with idolatrous and superstitious reverence. On the other side, it is often regarded with ignorant contempt. Both extremes are wrong. Both errors arise from forgetfulness of the plain teaching of Scripture. The minister who does not do Christ's work faithfully or deliver Christ's message correctly has no right to look for the respect of the people. But the minister who declares all the counsel of God and keeps back nothing that is profitable is one whose words cannot be disregarded without great sin. He is on the king's business. He is a herald. He is an ambassador. He is the bearer of a flag of truce. He brings the glad tidings of terms of peace. To such a man, the words of our Lord will prove strictly applicable. The rich may trample on him. The wicked may hate him. The pleasure lover may be annoyed at him. The covetous may be vexed by him. But he may take comfort daily in his master's words. The one who rejects you rejects me. The last day will prove that these words were not spoken in vain. Luke 10, 17-20 The Return of the Disciples The seventy returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will injure you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. We learn from this passage how ready Christians are to be puffed up with success. It is written that the seventy returned from their first mission with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. There was much false fire in that joy. There was evidently self-satisfaction in that report of achievements. The whole tenor of the passage leads us to this conclusion. The remarkable expression which our Lord uses about Satan's fall from heaven was most probably meant to be a caution. 
He read the hearts of the young and inexperienced soldiers before him. He saw how much they were puffed up by their first victory. He wisely checks them in their undue exultation. He warns them against pride. The lesson is one which all who work for Christ should mark and remember. Success is what all faithful laborers in the gospel field desire. The minister at home and the missionary abroad, the district visitor and the city missionary, the tract distributor and the Sunday school teacher, all alike long for success. All long to see Satan's kingdom pulled down and souls converted to God. We cannot wonder at this. The desire is right and good. Let it, however, never be forgotten that the time of success is a time of danger to the Christian's soul. The very hearts that are depressed when all things seem against them are often unduly exalted in the day of prosperity. Few men are like Samson and can kill a lion without telling others of it. Judges 14.6 No wonder that Paul says of an elder that he must not be a new convert so that he will not become conceited and fall into the condemnation incurred by the devil. 1 Timothy 3.6 Most of Christ's laborers probably have as much success as their souls can bear. Let us pray much for humility and especially for humility in our days of peace and success. When everything around us seems to prosper, and all our plans work well, when family trials and sicknesses are kept from us, and the course of our worldly affairs runs smooth, when our daily crosses are light, and all within and without are like a morning without clouds, then, then is the time when our souls are in danger. Then is the time when we have need to be doubly watchful over our own hearts. Then is the time when seeds of evil are sown within us by the devil, which may one day astound us by their growth and strength. There are few Christians who can carry a full cup with a steady hand. There are few whose souls prosper in their days of uninterrupted success. We are ready to think that our own might and our own wisdom have procured the victory for us. The caution of the passage before us ought never to be forgotten. In the midst of our triumphs, let us cry earnestly, Lord, clothe us with humility. We learn for another thing from these verses that gifts and power of working miracles are very inferior to saving grace. It is written that our Lord said to the seventy disciples, Do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. It was doubtless an honor and a privilege to be allowed to cast out demons. The disciples were right to be thankful, but it was a far higher privilege to be converted and pardoned men and to have their names written in the register of saved souls. The distinction here drawn between grace and gifts is one of deep importance, and often and sadly overlooked in the present day. Gifts such as mental vigor, vast memory, striking eloquence, ability in argument, power in reasoning, are often unduly overvalued by those who possess them and unduly admired by those who do not possess them. These things ought not to be so. Men forget that gifts without grace save no one's soul and are the characteristics of Satan himself. Grace, on the contrary, is an everlasting inheritance. As lowly and despised as its possessor may be, grace will land him safely in glory. He who has gifts without grace is dead in sins, however splendid his gifts may be. But he who has grace without gifts is alive to God however unlearned and ignorant he may appear to man. Let the religion which we aim to possess be a religion in which grace is the main thing. Let it not content us to be able to speak eloquently, or preach powerfully or reasonably, or argue cleverly, or profess loudly, or talk fluently. Let it not satisfy us to know the whole system of Christian doctrines 
and to have texts and words at our command. These things are all well in their way. They are not to be undervalued. They have their use. But these things are not the grace of God, and they will not deliver us from eternal hell. Let us never rest until we have the witness of the Spirit within us that we are washed, sanctified, justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of our God. 1 Corinthians 6.11 Let us seek to know that our names are written in heaven and that we are really one with Christ and that Christ is in us. Let us strive to be letters of Christ known and read by all men, and to show by our humility and charity and faith and spiritual mindedness that we are the children of God. This is true religion. These are the real marks of saving Christianity. Without such marks, a man may have abundance of gifts and turn out to be nothing better than a follower of Judas Iscariot, the false apostle, and go at last to eternal hell. With such marks, a man may be like Lazarus, poor and despised upon earth, and have no gifts at all. But his name is written in heaven, and Christ shall own him as one of his people at the last day. Luke 10, 21-24 The Sovereignty of God in Saving Sinners At that very time he rejoiced greatly in the Holy Spirit, and said, I praise you, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for this way was well pleasing in your sight. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, and who the Father is except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Turning to the disciples, he said privately, Blessed are the eyes which see the things you see. For I say to you, that many prophets and kings wished to see the things which you see, and did not see them, and to hear the things which you hear, and did not hear them. There are five remarkable points in these verses which deserve the attention of all who wish to be well instructed Christians. Let us take each of the five in order. We should observe in the first place the one instance on record of our Lord Jesus Christ rejoicing. We read that, at that very time he rejoiced greatly in the Holy Spirit. Three times we are told in the Gospels that our Lord Jesus Christ wept. Once only we are told that he rejoiced. And what was the cause of our Lord's joy? It was the conversion of souls. It was the reception of the gospel by the weak and lowly among the Jews, when the wise and intelligent on every side were rejecting it. Our blessed Lord, no doubt, saw much in this world to grieve him. He saw the obstinate blindness and unbelief of the vast majority of those among whom he ministered. But when he saw a few poor men and women receiving the glad tidings of salvation, even his heart was refreshed. He saw it and was glad. Let all Christians mark our Lord's conduct in this matter and follow His example. They find little in the world to cheer them. They see around them a vast multitude walking in the broad way that leads to destruction, careless, hardened, and unbelieving. They see a few here and there, and only a few, who believe to the saving of their souls. Let this sight make them thankful. Let them bless God that any at all are converted, and that any at all believe. We do not sufficiently realize the sinfulness of man. We do not reflect that the conversion of any soul is a miracle, a miracle as great as the raising of Lazarus from the dead. Let us learn from our blessed Lord to be more thankful. There is always some blue sky as well as black clouds if we will only look for it. Though only a few are saved, we should find reason for rejoicing. It is only through free grace and undeserved mercy that any are saved at all. We should observe, secondly, 
the sovereignty of God in saving sinners. We read that our Lord says to his Father, You have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent, and have revealed them to infants. The meaning of these words is clear and plain. There are some from whom salvation is hidden. There are others to whom salvation is revealed. The truth here laid down is deep and mysterious. It is as high as heaven. What can we do? It is as deep as hell. What do we know? Why some around us are converted and others remain dead in sins, we cannot possibly explain. Why England is a Christian country and China is buried in idolatry is a problem we cannot solve. We only know that it is so. We can only acknowledge that the words of our Lord Jesus Christ supply the only answer that mortal man ought to give. Yes, Father, for this way was well pleasing in your sight. Let us, however, never forget that God's sovereignty does not destroy man's responsibility. That same God who does all things according to the counsel of his own will always addresses us as accountable creatures as beings whose blood will be on our own heads if we are lost. We cannot understand all his dealings. We see in part and know in part. Let us rest in the conviction that the judgment day will clear up all and that the judge of all will not fail to do right. In the meantime, let us remember that God's offers of salvation are free, wide, broad, and unlimited, and that in our doings, that will of God is to be followed which we have expressly declared unto us in the word of God. If truth is hidden from some and revealed to others, then we may be sure that there is a cause. We should observe, thirdly, the character of those from whom truth is hidden and of those to whom truth is revealed. We read that our Lord says, you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and have revealed them to infants. We must not gather a wrong lesson from these words. We must not infer that any people on earth are naturally more deserving of God's grace and salvation than others. All alike are sinners, and all alike merit nothing but wrath and condemnation. We must simply regard the words as stating a fact. The wisdom of this world often makes people proud and increases their natural enmity to Christ's gospel. The man who has no pride of knowledge or imagined morality to trust in has often fewest difficulties to get over in coming to the knowledge of the truth. The publicans and sinners are often the first to enter the kingdom of God, while the scribes and Pharisees stand outside. Let us learn from these words to beware of self righteousness. Nothing so blinds the eyes of our souls to the beauty of the gospel as the vain, delusive idea that we are not so ignorant and wicked as some, and that we have got a good character which will bear inspection. Happy is that man who has learned to feel that he is wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Revelation 3:17. To see that we are bad is the first step towards being really good. To feel that we are ignorant is the first beginning of all saving knowledge. We should observe in the fourth place the majesty and dignity of our Lord Jesus Christ. We read that he said, All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, and who the Father is except the Son and any one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. These are the words of one who was fully God and no mere man. We read of no patriarch or prophet or apostle or saint of any age who ever used words like these. They reveal to our wondering eyes a little of the mighty majesty of our Lord's nature and person. They show him to us as the head over all things and the King of kings. All things have been handed over to me by my Father. They show him as one distinct from the Father and yet entirely one with him, 
and knowing him in an unspeakable manner. No one knows who the Son is except the Father, and who the Father is except the Son. They show him not least as the mighty revealer of the Father to men, as the God who pardons iniquity and loves sinners for his Son's sake. No one knows who the Son is except the Father, and who the Father is except the Son and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal Him. Let us rest our souls confidently on our Lord Jesus Christ. He is one who is mighty to save. As many and as weighty as our sins are, Christ can bear them all. As difficult as the work of our salvation is, Christ is able to accomplish it. If Christ was not God as well as man, then we might indeed despair. But with such a Saviour as this, we may begin boldly and press on hopefully and await death and judgment without fear. Our help is laid on one who is mighty. Psalm 89, 19 Christ over all, God blessed forever, will not fail any who trust in Him. Let us observe finally, the peculiar privileges of those who hear the gospel of Christ. We read that our Lord said to His disciples, Blessed are the eyes which see the things you see. For I say to you, that many prophets and kings wished to see the things which you see, and did not see them, and to hear the things which you hear, and did not hear them. The full significance of these words will probably never be understood by Christians until the last day. We have probably, at most, a faint idea of the enormous advantages enjoyed by believers who have lived since Christ came into the world compared to those of believers who died before Christ was born. The difference between the knowledge of an Old Testament saint and a saint in the Apostles' days is far greater than we conceive. It is the difference between midnight and noonday, between winter and summer between the mind of a child and the mind of a full-grown man. No doubt the Old Testament saints looked to a coming Saviour by faith and believed in a resurrection and a life to come, but the coming and death of Christ unlocked a hundred scriptures which before were closed, and cleared up scores of doubtful points which before had never been solved. In short, the way into the holy place has not yet been disclosed, while the outer tabernacle is still standing. Hebrews 9, 8 The humblest Christian believer understands things which David and Isaiah could never explain. Let us leave the passage with a deep sense of our own debt to God and of our great responsibility for the full light of the gospel. Let us see that we make a good use of our many privileges. Having a full gospel, let us beware that we do not neglect it. It is a weighty saying, From every one who has been given much, much will be required. Luke 12, 48 Luke 10, 25-28 The Rule of Faith, the Summary of Duty And a lawyer stood up and put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? How does it read to you? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. We should notice in this passage the solemn question which was addressed to our Lord Jesus Christ. We are told that a certain lawyer asked him, What shall I do to inherit eternal life? The motive of this man was evidently not right. He only asked this question to test our Lord and to provoke him to say something which his enemies might lay hold of. Yet the question he propounded was undoubtedly one of the deepest importance. It is a question which deserves the principal attention of every man, woman, and child on earth. We are all sinners, dying sinners, and sinners going to be judged after death. How shall our sins be pardoned? With what shall we come before God? How shall we escape the damnation of hell? 
Where shall we flee from the wrath to come? What must we do to be saved? These are questions which people of every rank ought to put to themselves and never rest until they find an answer. It is a question which, unfortunately, few care to consider. Thousands are constantly inquiring, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? With what shall we be clothed? How can we get money? How can we enjoy ourselves? How can we prosper in the world? Few, very few, will ever give a moment's thought to the salvation of their souls. They hate the subject. It makes them uncomfortable. They turn from it and put it away. Faithful and true is that saying of our Lord's, The gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Matthew 7, 13-14 Let us not be ashamed of putting the lawyer's question to our own souls. Let us rather ponder it and never be content until it fills the first place in our minds. Let us seek to have the witness of the Spirit within us that we repent truly of sin, that we have a living faith in God's mercy through Christ, and that we are really walking with God. This is the character of the heirs of eternal life. These are those who shall one day receive the kingdom prepared for the children of God. We should notice, secondly, in this passage, the high honor which our Lord Jesus Christ places on the Bible. He refers the lawyer at once to the Scriptures as the only rule of faith and practice. He doesn't say in reply to his question, What does the Jewish church say about eternal life? What do the scribes and Pharisees and priests think? What is taught on the subject in the traditions of the elders? He takes a far simpler and more direct course. He sends his questioner at once to the writings of the Old Testament. What is written in the law? How does it read to you? Let the principle contained in these words be one of the foundational principles of our Christianity. Let the Bible, the whole Bible, and nothing but the Bible, be the rule of our faith and practice. Holding this principle, we travel upon the King's highway. The road may sometimes seem narrow, and our faith may be severely tried, but we shall not be allowed greatly to err. Departing from this principle, we enter on a pathless wilderness. There is no telling what we may be led to believe or do. Forever let us bear this in mind. Here let us cast anchor. Here let us abide. It matters nothing. Who says a thing in religion, whether an ancient father or a modern bishop or a learned theologian? Is it in the Bible? Can it be proved by the Bible? If not, then it is not to be believed. It matters nothing how beautiful and clever sermons or religious books may appear. Are they in the smallest degree contrary to Scripture? If they are, they are rubbish and poison and guides of no value. What does the Scripture say? This is the only rule and measure and gauge of religious truth. To the law and to the testimony, says Isaiah, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because they have no dawn. Isaiah 8.20 We should notice, lastly, in this passage, the clear knowledge of duty to God and man which the Jews in our Lord's time possessed. We read that the lawyer said, in reply to our Lord's question, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. That was well spoken. A clearer description of daily practical duty could not be given by the most thoroughly instructed Christian in the present day. Let not this be forgotten. The words of the lawyer are very instructive in two points of view. They throw a strong light on two subjects about which many mistakes abound. For one thing, they show us how great were the privileges of religious knowledge which the Jews enjoyed under the Old Testament compared to the heathen world. 
a nation which possessed such principles of duty as those now before us was immeasurably in advance of Greece and Rome. For another thing, the lawyer's words show us how much clear head knowledge a person may possess while his heart is full of wickedness. Here is a man who talks of loving God with all his soul and loving his neighbor as himself, while he is actually tempting Christ and trying to do him harm, and anxious to justify himself and make himself out to be a charitable man. Let us ever beware of this kind of religion. Clear knowledge of the head, when accompanied by determined impenitence of the heart, is a most dangerous state of soul. If you know these things, says Jesus, you are blessed if you do them. John 13, 17. Let us not forget, in leaving this passage, to apply the highest standard of duty which it contains to our own hearts and to prove our own selves. Do we love God with all our heart and soul and strength and mind? Do we love our neighbor as ourselves? Where is the person that could say with perfect truth, I do? Where is the man that ought not to lay his hand on his mouth when he hears these questions? Truly, we are all guilty in this matter. The best of us, however holy we may be, come far short of perfection. Passages like this should teach us our need of Christ's blood and righteousness. To Him we must go if we would ever stand with boldness at the bar of God. From Him we must seek grace so that the love of God and man may become ruling principles of our lives. In Him we must abide so that we may not forget our principles and so that we may show the world that by them we desire to live. Luke 10, 29-37 The Parable of the Good Samaritan But wishing to justify himself, he said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied and said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among robbers, and they stripped him and beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. And by chance a priest was going down on that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite also, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, who was on a journey, came upon him, and when he saw him, he felt compassion, and came to him and bandaged up his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them. And he put him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day he took out two denarii, and gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I return I will repay you. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? And he said, The one who showed mercy toward him. Then Jesus said to him, Go and do the same. These words contain the well-known parable of the Good Samaritan. In order to understand the drift of this parable, we must carefully remember the occasion on which it was spoken. It was spoken in reply to the question of a certain lawyer who asked, Who is my neighbor? Our Lord Jesus Christ answers that question by telling the story we have just heard, and winds up the narrative by an appeal to the lawyer's conscience. Let these things not be forgotten. The object of the parable is to show the nature of true charity and brotherly love. To lose sight of this object and search for deep allegories in the parable is to trifle with Scripture and deprive our souls of most valuable lessons. We are taught first in this parable how rare and uncommon true brotherly love is. This is a lesson which stands out prominently on the face of the narrative before our eyes and ears. Our Lord tells us of a traveller who fell among thieves and was left naked, wounded, and half dead on the road. He then tells us of a priest and a Levite who, one after the other, came travelling that way and saw the poor wounded man but gave him no help. Both were men who, from their religious office and profession, 
ought to have been ready and willing to do good to one in distress. But both, in succession, were too selfish or too unfeeling to offer the slightest assistance. They doubtless reasoned with themselves that they knew nothing of the wounded traveller, that he had perhaps gotten into trouble by his own misconduct, that they had no time to stop and help him, and that they had enough to do to mind their own business without troubling themselves with strangers. And the result was that one after the other they both passed by on the other side. We have in this striking description an exact picture of what is continually going on in the world. Selfishness is the leading characteristic of the great majority of mankind. That cheap charity, which costs nothing more than a trifling contribution, is common enough, but that self sacrificing kindness of heart, which cares not what trouble is entailed so long as good can be done, is a grace which is rarely met with. There are still thousands in trouble who can find no friend or helper, and there are still hundreds of priests and Levites who see them but pass by on the other side. Let us beware of expecting much from the kindness of man. If we do, then we shall certainly be disappointed. The longer we live, the more clearly we shall see that few people care for others except from self serving motives, and that unselfish, pure, brotherly love is as scarce as diamonds and rubies. How thankful we ought to be that the Lord Jesus Christ is not like man. His kindness and love are unfailing. He never disappoints any of his friends. Happy are those who have learned to say, My soul, wait in silence for God only, for my hope is from Him. Psalm 62, 5. We are taught, secondly, in this parable, who they are to whom we should show kindness, and whom we are to love as neighbors. We are told that the only person who helped the wounded traveler of whom we are reading and hearing was a certain Samaritan. This man was one of a nation who had no dealings with the Jews. John 4 9. He might have excused himself by saying that the road from Jerusalem to Jericho was through the Jewish territory, and that cases of distress ought to be cared for by the Jews. But he does nothing of the sort. He sees a man stripped of his clothing and lying half dead. He asks no questions, but at once has compassion on him. He makes no difficulties or excuses, but at once gives aid. And our Lord says to us, Go and do the same. Now, if these words mean anything, a Christian ought to be ready to show kindness and brotherly love to everyone who is in need. Our kindness must not merely extend to our families and friends and relations. We must love all men and be kind to all whenever occasion requires. We must beware of an excessive strictness in scrutinizing the past lives of those who need our aid. Are they in real trouble? Are they in real distress? Do they really need help? Then, according to the teaching of this parable, we ought to be ready to assist them. We should regard the whole world as our parish, and the whole race of mankind as our neighbors. We should seek to be the friend of everyone who is oppressed or neglected or afflicted or sick or in prison or poor or an orphan or a heathen or a slave or starving or dying. We should exhibit such worldwide friendship, no doubt wisely, discreetly, and with good sense, but of such friendship we never need be ashamed. The ungodly may sneer at it as foolish and fanaticism, but we needn't mind that. To be friendly to all men in this way is to show something of the mind that was in Christ. We are taught, lastly, in this parable, after what manner and to what extent we are to show kindness and love to others. We are told that the Samaritan's compassion towards the wounded traveller was not confined to feelings and passive impressions. He took much trouble to give him help. He acted as well as felt. He spared no pains or expense in befriending him. The man was a stranger to him. Nevertheless, he went to him, bound up his wounds, set him on his own donkey, 
brought him to an inn, and took care of him. Nor was this all. On the next day he gave the host of the inn money, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I return I will repay you. And our Lord says to each of us, Go and do the same. The lesson of this part of the parable is plain and unmistakable. The kindness of a Christian towards others should not be in word and in tongue only, but also in deed and in truth. His love should be a practical love, a love which entails on him both self-sacrifice and self-denial in money and time and trouble. His charity should be seen not merely in his talking, but also in his acting, and not merely in his profession, but also in his practice. He should think it no misspent time to work as hard in doing good to those who need help as others work in trying to get money for themselves. He shouldn't be ashamed to toil as much to make the misery of this world smaller as those toil who hunt or fish all day long. He should have a ready ear for every tale of sorrow, and a ready hand to help everyone in affliction, so long as he has the power. The world may not understand such brotherly love. The returns of gratitude which such love meets with may be few and small. But to show such brotherly love is to walk in the steps of Christ and to reduce the parable of the Good Samaritan to practice. And now let us leave the parable with grave thoughts and deep searchings of heart. How few Christians seem to remember that such a parable was ever written! What an enormous amount of stinginess and selfishness and suspicion there is to be seen in the church even among people who believe the gospel and go to the Lord's table! How seldom do we see a man who is really kind and feeling and generous, and liberal, and good-natured, except to himself and his family. Yet the Lord Jesus Christ spoke the parable of the Good Samaritan, and meant it to be remembered. What are we ourselves? Let's not forget to put that question to our hearts. What are we doing, each in our own station, to prove that this mighty parable is one of the rules of our daily life? What are we doing for the heathen at home and abroad? What are we doing to help those who are troubled in mind, body, or state? There are many such in this world. There are always some near our own door. What are we doing for them? Anything or nothing at all? May God help us to answer these questions. The world would be a happier world if there was more practical Christianity. Luke 10, 38-42, Martha and Mary Now as they were travelling along, he entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister called Mary, who was seated at the Lord's feet, listening to his word. But Martha was distracted with all her preparations, and she came up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? Then tell her to help me. But the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things, but only one thing is necessary, for Mary has chosen the good part which shall not be taken away from her. The little history which these verses contain is only recorded in the Gospel of Luke. So long as the world stands, the story of Mary and Martha will furnish the church with lessons of wisdom which ought never to be forgotten. Taken together with the eleventh chapter of John's Gospel, it throws a most instructive light on the inner life of the family whom Jesus loved. Let us observe, for one thing, how different the characters and personalities of true Christians may be. The two sisters of whom we hear about in this passage were faithful disciples. Both had believed. Both had been converted. Both had honoured Christ when few gave him honour. Both loved Jesus, and Jesus loved both of them. Yet they were evidently women of very different turn of mind. Martha was active, stirring, and impulsive, feeling strongly and speaking out all she felt. 
Mary was quiet, still, and contemplative, feeling deeply, but saying less than she felt. Martha, when Jesus came to her house, rejoiced to see him, and busied herself with preparing a suitable refreshment. Mary also rejoiced to see him, but her first thought was to sit at his feet and hear his word. Grace reigned in both hearts, but each showed the effects of grace at different times and in different ways. We shall find it very useful to ourselves to remember this lesson. We mustn't expect all believers in Christ to be exactly like one another. We mustn't set down others as having no grace because their experience does not entirely tally with our own. The sheep in the Lord's flock each have their own peculiarities. The trees in the Lord's garden are not all precisely alike. All true servants of God agree in the principal things of religion. All are led by one Spirit. All feel their sins and all trust in Christ. All repent, all believe, and all are holy. But in minor matters they often differ widely. Let not one despise another on this account. There will be Marthas and there will be Marys in the church until the Lord comes again. Let us observe, for another thing, what a snare to our souls the cares of this world may be if allowed to take up too much attention. It is plain from the tone of the passage before us that Martha allowed her anxiety to provide a suitable entertainment for the Lord to carry her away. Her excessive zeal for temporal provisions made her forget, for a time, the things of her soul. She was distracted with all her preparations. By and by her conscience pierced her when she found herself alone serving tables and saw her sister sitting at Jesus' feet and hearing his word. Under the pressure of a conscience ill at ease, her temper became ruffled, and the old Adam within broke out into open complaint. Lord, she said, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? Then tell her to help me. In so saying, this holy woman sadly forgot what she was and to whom she was speaking. She brought down on herself a solemn rebuke and had to learn a lesson which probably made a lasting impression. Alas, how great a matter a little spark kindles! The beginning of all this was a little over-anxiety about the innocent household affairs of this world. The fault of Martha should be a perpetual warning to all Christians. If we desire to grow in grace and to enjoy soul prosperity, then we must beware of the cares of this world. Unless we watch and pray, they will insensibly eat up our spirituality and bring leanness on our souls. It is not open sin or flagrant breaches of God's commandments alone which lead men to eternal ruin. It is far more frequently an excessive attention to things in themselves lawful and the being distracted with all the preparations. It seems so right to provide for our own. It seems so proper to attend to the duties of our station. It is just here that our danger lies. Our families, our business, our daily callings, our household affairs, our interaction with society, all may become snares to our hearts and may draw us away from God. We may go down to the pit of hell from the very midst of lawful things. Let us take heed to ourselves in this matter. Let us watch our habits of mind jealously, lest we fall into sin unawares. If we love life, then we must hold the things of this world with a very loose hand and beware of allowing anything to have the first place in our hearts except God. Let us mentally write poison on all temporal good things. Used in moderation, they are blessings for which we ought to be thankful. Permitted to fill our minds and trample upon holy things, they become an inevitable curse. Profits and pleasures are dearly purchased if in order to obtain them we thrust aside eternity from our thoughts, abridge our Bible reading, become careless hearers of the gospel, and shorten our prayers. 
A little earth upon the fire within us will soon make that fire burn low. Let us observe for another thing what a solemn rebuke our Lord Jesus Christ gave to his servant Martha. Like a wise physician, he saw the disease which was preying upon her and at once supplied the remedy. Like a tender parent, he exposed the fault into which his erring child had fallen and did not spare the chastening which was required. Martha, Martha, he said, you are worried and bothered about so many things, but only one thing is necessary. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. That little sentence was a precious balm indeed. It contained a volume of practical divinity in a few words. Only one thing is necessary. How true that saying! The longer we live in the world, the more true it will appear. The nearer we come to the grave, the more thoroughly we shall assent to it. Health and money, and lands, and rank, and honours, and prosperity are all well in their way, but they cannot be called necessary. Without them, thousands are happy in this world and reach glory in the world to come. The many things which men and women are continually struggling for are not really necessities. The grace of God which brings salvation is the one thing necessary. Let this little sentence be continually before the eyes of our minds. Let it check us when we are ready to murmur at earthly trials. Let it strengthen us when we are tempted to deny our Master on account of persecution. Let it caution us when we begin to think too much of the things of this world. Let it quicken us when we are disposed to look back like Lot's wife. In all such seasons, let the words of our Lord ring in our ears like a trumpet and bring us to a right mind. Only one thing is necessary. If Christ is ours, then we have all, and we abound. We should observe, lastly, what high commendation our Lord Jesus Christ pronounced on Mary's choice. We read that he said, Mary has chosen the good part which shall not be taken away from her. There was a deep meaning in these words. They were spoken not only for Mary's sake, but also for the sake of all Christ's believing people in every part of the world. They were meant to encourage all true Christians to be single-eyed and whole-hearted, to follow the Lord fully, and to walk closely with God, to make sole business immeasurably their first business, and to think comparatively little of the things of this world. The true Christian's portion is the grace of God. This is the good part which he has chosen, and it is the only portion which really deserves the name of good. It is the only good thing which is substantial, satisfying, real, and lasting. It is good in sickness and good in health, good in youth and good in age, good in adversity and good in prosperity, good in life and good in death good in time and good in eternity. No circumstance and no position can be imagined in which it is not good for man to have the grace of God. The true Christian's possession shall never be taken from him. He alone of all mankind shall never be stripped of his inheritance. Kings must one day leave their palaces. Rich men must one day leave their money and lands. They only hold them until they die. But the poorest saint on earth has a treasure of which he will never be deprived. The grace of God and the favor of Christ are riches which no man can take from him. They will go with him to the grave when he dies. They will rise with him in the resurrection morning and be his to all eternity. What do we know of this good part which Mary chose? Have we chosen it for ourselves? Can we say with truth that it is ours? Let us never rest until we can. Let us choose life while Christ offers it to us without money and without price. Let us seek treasure in heaven, lest we awake to find that we are paupers forevermore.
This has been Expository Thoughts on the Gospel of Luke, a commentary, updated edition, written by J. C. Ryle, narrated by Scython Williams, copyright 2020 by Aneco Press, production copyright 2020 by Aneco Press.